think we should go ahead and start. It's already 9.15 and we have a full schedule. Uh, and I'll, I'll let Sarah, you are the host. You are actually just, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the moderator just, of the station. So just, just want to welcome everyone. We have 57 participants so far. I'm sure that we, we're going to get more people involved. We keep adding it to 58 mm -hmm. now. So uh, welcome everyone. Without any actually just further ado, we want to jump into uh, presentations. And Sarah, you are the, you have the floor. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the first uh, COVID-19 session of the BTR conference. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Mohammadian for putting together and kind of organizing the two-day series of COVID-19 presentations uh, related to transportation and travel behavior. As soon as the pandemic hit uh, the world, um, many research groups has been formed and they started collecting data using surveys on travel behavior, transportation, and all the related impacts. So on this session, we have five of uh, very important um, surveys that have been going on around the world on COVID-19, uh, uh, looking at the results. And I would like to also invite you to uh, related presentations to these surveys that will be presented in other sessions of COVID-19. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't want to take the time. But, uh, the presenters are all well known to us, to all of us. Uh, we have K. Aksasam from um, VT. We, uh, we have Giovanni Tercella from UC Davis. We have Jose. We have Laura Mirich uh, from the Salon Group uh, from Arizona State University, and we have Dr. Mohammedian uh, from UIC. And at, we will leave uh, all the Q and A's for the end of the session. Um, and um, we have a panel discussion at the end uh, that will be formed based off the Q and A and any other question that we raise up. With that, I would like to hand it to Kay, uh, and um, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining this session. So, uh, I hope you see my screen. Yes. Good, fine. Okay, I will talk about my worries about the fall of this year. Uh, and in the aftermath of COVID and the restriction period in Switzerland, I guess by extension elsewhere, because I don't think the world is all that much different. Let's first thank all the other colleagues and students who have been working on this project, um, which is called Mobis COVID at this point. There is Joe Molloy, Christopher Cherenkov, and Thomas Schatzmann from uh, IVT and Alice de Loder, a prior student who is now with SVB. And in Basel, there at the Department of Economics, Beat Hintermann and his PhD student, Bomo Schumann. Now, what have we been doing? What's the setup? I think we all know that the COVID pandemic is one of a pattern of pandemics over the last years. And while probably nobody of us really noted, we had major influenza epidemics in Switzerland in 15 and 17. And you can see that the excess death in those years was quite substantial. But in the COVID case, we stopped the development short through the lockdown, through the disruption of the spread of the disease. And I guess in most other countries, the pattern looks similar. Now, what are we worried about? What I'm worried about, and I think one should, is that the impact of the restrictions was to massively reduce car travel and therefore speed it up. But what is now happening is as drivers and previous non-drivers are returning in the fall after the summer holidays, things might get tight on our roads. Just to remind ourselves of that process. This is out of 
Alistair Loder's PhD thesis, where he looked together with uh, Lucas Ambu at the macroscopic fundamental diagram in 40 cities around the world. But here's an example from Zurich. And you can look at the speed of the passengers and travelers as a function of the share of public transport use. And, and that's most important, in the total number of travelers. And you can see that if it's only a thousand passengers, the thick black line, then actually adding people to public transport slows them down because public transport is systematically slower than car travel. But if you have 5,000 passengers to transport, then you have to put them into big vehicles because otherwise the cars are in each other's way. And it's that situation which I think might happen this, this fall. As we return to full business, this situation might happen because people will not join the big vehicles. Now, what is the database we have? We had a study last fall, which was on mobility pricing, and it implemented the virtual mobility pricing and nudging policy in, with about 3,700 uh, respondents, participants, in the French and German-speaking part of Switzerland. What we saw was that some respondents, actually quite a few, didn't stop tracking after their eight weeks of participation was over. And we didn't stop it, we just let it run. But when COVID raised its ugly head, we invited all 3,700 to start the app again. And a fair number did, nearly a third of the sample did. And as it happened, it was pretty much equal out of the three treatment groups in the original study. We had a control group, we had a nudging group, and we had a virtual mobility pricing group. But in contrast to previously, we couldn't pay them an incentive because nobody was willing to give us that much money at that short notice. So we are talking only about volunteers. The app we are using is called Catch a Day, and it's an implementation of motion tags uh, technology, which is a well-known provider of tracking apps. So how does, does the pattern look like? So you have the period about 400 kept tracking, and then we invited people to participate again. And you can see that the number of people who registered for the study was large, but you also see that the people who track uh, went up as well. And then since then has been decreasing slowly to now we are back at 600 people. And there's a good reason that people stop. They might change their, their smartphone, they might change uh, their settings. So we are losing them. And unfortunately, we get very little we can do about it. So we are still talking about a, a tracking study at this point involving 600 people uh, continuously. So it's still a very large sample for given the small size of Switzerland. Now, what are the main tracks, the main things we see? The first thing is how many people are actually leaving the home? How many people are mobile? And you can see that after the lockdown, the numbers went down. People just didn't leave home anymore, but not completely. 50% left their home still to go shopping, to go hiking, to go cycling, to do whatever. But you can see that the share of people who are out of home is kind of stabilizing around on average 75, 80% on every day. This still is a low number because in principle, I would expect 90% of people to leave their home on any one day. So there's still 10% of the sample which is not leaving the home. There's still potential for them to resurface. Now, if you measure their travel, their number of trips and their activity spaces, what are the patterns we see? The first thing is passenger miles traveled. Uh, and here it's divided by gender. And you can see that that dropped substantially uh, after the lockdown and has been increasing ever since and is now 
probably back to normal, maybe even above that uh, before. And there is a substantial difference between males and females. Just talking here, we can't see really big differences by income. We see differences by the work situation. I'll come back to that in a second. And this is kind of the first slide on the work situation. And in the German speaking countries, and Switzerland belongs to them, one of the favorite instruments to buffer the impact of a major recession, or in this case, this pandemic, is to send people into short term work. So they are being paid for not working for some of their work period. So they are 60% Kurzarbeit, that means 60% is paid by the insurance and the remaining 40% is paid by the employer. And you can see, as you would expect, that time is to some extent actually used for other travel. And you can see that they are uh, traveling more than the people who are not on Kurzarbeit. And that's something which has been well known ever since uh, uh, Kostas Gulias and Rampendiala did their PhD with Pat Monterian in the 80s. The other question is what happens to people who work from home, which is kind of one of the major things which we did to buffer the impact of the crisis. You can see the drop is dramatic after lockdown. 60% of people worked from home. And then you can see that there is a difference whether they work from home, whether they work outside home, the essential workers or people who believe they are essential, and people who are a mix who do go both to the workplace as well as working from home. And you can see that the work from home group still is only back to minus 20% of their original travel. But the people who work outside, they're nearly exactly where they were in the before period. Now, if we look at the numbers of trips made, you can see that that's the blue line. You can see that there was a massive drop from four and a half trips to a bit less than two trips a day. And that has recovered and now is nearly back to normal. Uh, obviously different between work days and weekends, but it's nearly back to normal. Where it's not as much back to normal is in the terms of what I call activity space, which is a measure of the range of places people visit. It's essentially dummied by the confidence ellipse covering all the places people visit. And you can see that drop massively, nearly 80% reduction in space. So people kept local. And since then, that has increased and is now essentially back to normal again. But it has taken longer to retain to normal than the number of trip made. Now, one of the big questions is what happens to mode use? Uh, because in many countries around the world, we see that people don't join the big vehicles, the buses, the trams, the trains, whatever you have, the ferries. What happened in Switzerland? In Switzerland, you can see the pattern overall on this graph. So what we are doing here is we're looking at passenger kilometers traveled by period. The circles are pre-lockdown, the triangles are lockdown, Post-lockdown is kind of between now and the period when the mask requirement came in in Switzerland for public transport. And you can see, for example, for the first group, which are, which are people who have an annual national season ticket, they were clearly using public transport massively. Nearly 65% of their mileage was with public transport, about but more than 30% with cars and about whatever, four or 5% with slow modes. And you can see very nicely how that collapsed. But as the crisis was lifting, it went back up. But now even with the mask requirement, it hasn't really gone up that much. They're still only using 40% for their mileage is still using public transport. And you can see for all the other groups which have different combinations of uh, 
season tickets and cars, that you have similar structures. So public transport has a problem because the mileage its customers haven't returned yet. Now, what is the problem which we are likely to fix? Remember, we have limited capacities, which is affected by the joint use of big vehicles and cars. And we do know that cars use a disproportionate share of that capacity if they arrive in big numbers. So what will we see? Now, one thing which we are seeing is obviously changes in speed. So we use the GPS data we have, classified the trips by distance, and looked at the door-to-door -door speeds, which the travelers can currently experience in Switzerland. And we have three distance ranges, more than 50 kilometers, 20 to 50, and below 50. And you can see that for car drivers, the lockdown period was a marvel. Everybody has disappeared. Speeds went up massively in the peak hours. And certainly for long distance, medium distances, and even for short distances, that effect was visible. Now, the effect is gone. We already see that the speeds are essentially in the back in the range they were before. And that still means that there is more to come because we have still a substantial share of people working from home. We have still people not in the buses. And this is what that you can see here. What I show here is the suppressed demand in passenger kilometers from the baseline. You can see the public transport, which are the lines at the bottom here, there is still minus 40%. So 40% of the original uh, mileage still hasn't been recovered. Car travel is essentially back to be where it was before. And cycling had a good crisis because cyclists and cycling was identified as an option to use to train and to, for fitness purposes. And they respond very clearly to the weather patterns in those weeks. Those were kind of bad weather weeks. And otherwise, cycling had a massive increase, mostly, we believe, for private purposes. So what will happen in the fall when those 10% of people have to, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. When people return to the office, will they return to the office in what form? Let me just talk about the next steps. We do know that productivity is proportional to accessibility, i.e. our abilities to travel and meet other people for whatever purpose. And that is proportional to the speeds and the lift densities at the time. And as you probably, as you all know, people left the cities, people didn't travel. So the lift density went down. And if the speeds don't come back uh, or even fall, the, that relationship will weaken. So we have to ask ourselves, what will happen with the work from home? Will we see the end of the office? But then who will pay for the workplace at home? Will it be just your job to pay for a decent computer, a decent Wi-Fi, a decent uh, uh, chair? Or is it something the employer has to pay for? And then the question becomes, if we are kind of moving in that way to a generalized gig economy, because employers might think, OK, if they're at home, I might not really want to have them on my books. How resilient is such an economy? And I think the US colleagues know that much better than the Europeans ones, because they might be affected having lost their health insurance because they were precarious workers and the health insurance isn't there anymore. We do know that we need the use of the large pool of vehicles to keep urban and suburban speeds high. But if people don't return, if those 40% of mileage isn't realized, we have a massive problem. Then inside the cities, the question arises, how do we allocate the road space? 
are we happy with all the cars using it? Or do we want to give more space to pedestrians because they would need to be able to do physical distancing for the cyclists? I haven't really heard those policies being thought out. And then we have to ask ourselves, what speed levels do we want to achieve? Uh, do we want to use uh, constraining measures to keep the cars off the road so those that remain can travel at speed? Parking is then a sideshow of that thing. And then finally, we have that issue of how we controlling crowds in the city to avoid a rebound in the number of cases and therefore all the problems we have with that. And with that, I'll just show you a website where the weekly reports on our GPS study is available and the website of the Institute where all the relevant papers will be available. Good. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, so again, we keep the Q&A for the end. You can type in your questions in the chat box. Um, the presenters can even type your the responses for you in the chat box to save time. And with that, we will go to our next presenter, Giovanni uh, Cercello from UC Davis. Can Thank you, you very much. Yes. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, yes we can, can see, see your screen. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So, thank you very much for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be in this great conference with so, great co so many great colleagues uh, discussing the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on transportation. In this short presentation, I will present some early findings from a large behavioral study we are conducting with several colleagues uh, at uh, the University of California, Davis, uh, and in which really we are investigating the uh, impact uh, that the pandemic is bringing on activity participation and mobility, try also to discern what are the temporary versus the long-lasting impacts that the pandemic has brought. And I really want to acknowledge all the great uh, uh, co-authors, uh, including all the great uh, graduate students working with us at UC Davis, uh, as well as several other colleagues that I will have later in the slide with the acknowledgement. So the pandemic uh, has certainly brought some big disruptions uh, uh, to our society. And this not only has caused uh, uh, the need for social distancing, big impact on the employment and travel, but also the adoption of new technology, like for instance, remote working or shopping, but it's also changing transportation in a more structural way. Uh, one of these changes is also associated with the change of the supply side. So, for instance, in the U.S., we already experienced uh, the merger of the activities between Jump and Lime, which potentially uh, can uh, really affect the availability of scooters in the future, the pricing structure, and it's just one of the simple examples of how the industry is also reacting to a demand that has uh, quickly changed, but also to revenue factors that are affecting not only the uh, uh, shared mobility industry, but also public transportation, the airline industry, and a lot of other sectors. And all of these will have somehow consequences. So UC Davis will launch a large study to really study how all of this is impacting the way we travel and also what are the conclusions we can draw also to uh, help plan the future communities and develop policy. And in this study, we're doing a combination of a quantitative approach with online surveys we have administering, but also with qualitative interviews. So we are having in-depth phone interviews to really get into the details of how the pandemic has affected the house organization. We initially started to, with a plan to resample respondents that were coming from two previous studies we administered in 2018 and 2019. And this would create a longitudinal study to investigate the impact of the pandemic, having data at different times. But also, uh, we really wanted to focus on what are the changes that were happening on the temporary basis versus the long -term, longer term impact. And that was one of the reasons for which we will also continue to survey respondents in the future. During this stage of the uh, data collection, we also recruited additional participants, also expanding the regions beyond what were the ones that were originally included in the two studies. 
So reaching a much larger study that we are currently conducting. So under the current structure of this mobility study, we have previous data from 2018 and 2019, only for the uh, respondents that were already participating in previous data collections. We have done a large 2020 COVID-19 data collection between the month of May and July in the United States and Canada primarily. And then we will also continue to survey respondents in fall 2020 and or in spring 2021 to see the evolution of the pandemic in the future. Among the three major data sets we've collected so far, we have the longitudinal data set. It's on the left of our screen. We have about uh, uh, 1,300 respondents. These are respondents that were coming from previous studies. We have very good information from 2018 and 2019. We resample all of them now. We were able to keep about 40% of them in our study. And so now we have a longitudinal information for all of them. But also we expanded the data collection to 17 regions in the US and Canada, collecting a very large sample, more than 8,000 participants as of July that uh, were recruited with uh, a convenient sample using online opinion panel. I want to uh, mention these because sometimes mistakenly uh, we think opinion panels are truly representative samples. In reality, it's still a convenient sampling method. But we did efforts to, to try to target social demographic characteristics of the population and replicate more or less the distribution in the population. And then we also have a data set C, which was a convenient sample that was collected, uh, uh, distributing the link from various channels, including professional listservs, online social media, and doing Facebook and Instagram ads. And we got another 1,200 respondents. So right now we have about 11,000 participants in this study. For all of them, we collected a lot of information. So all surveys that were uh, used in the three major uh, group of data collection, they included all survey versions, the nine main sections, in which we collected information about attitudes and preferences, how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted their use of technology, lifestyles, and so on, detailed information about employment status, work and study activities, but also household organization, shopping patterns, both online and in person, as well as travel choices, use of cars, the use of public transportation, shared mobility, and many other features of the household. Very briefly, some of the social demographics of the three data sets. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I want to call the attention that the method that we use for the data collection deeply affects the type of respondents we collect. And in particular, for example, the data that see our convenience sample that was recruited sharing the link either on social media or through a professional network as a much higher percentage of respondents that are high income and highly educated. And this is something that somehow we need to consider because even if we use weight, the responses from this and the behaviors from these respondents might be very different because uh, the price sensitivity or the uh, impact that the pandemic had on their households might be substantially and structurally different so that even weighting might not be enough uh, to uh, correct. So I want to mention this because this is something I think that in many studies is important to consider. So let's dive into some of the impacts that our study is uh, helping to uncover. So I will start saying that the one thing that we need to consider is that households are changing. At least in the US society, uh, we have been experiencing a, a change in the household structure in which many individuals uh, struggling with the financial situation or because of lockdown measures, they really decided to move back with their family of origin. This is about a one person over 20 in our data that really did this. And we had somebody like, you know, some power that changed the organization of the household. And it's something to consider because inevitably will affect vehicle accessibility in the household, but also travel patterns and activity interaction with other household members. And on average, the household sizes are going up a little bit, a little bit as a combined effect of all of these things. Also, households are making changes in, in the technological, technological devices and services they have. Uh, many of them, especially in the urban areas of the red bars we see in this slide, because of the pandemic, they actually started uh, purchasing new computers or upgrading their Wi-Fi at home or setting up a home office. And all these things are things that, that need to be considered because somehow they might actually uh, change the likelihood that people will engage long term in activities like remote working if it is easier to do that from their home. Also, if we look at some of the travel patterns, 
Uh, it's interesting to see that, uh, as Kai mentioned before, uh, public transportation has in particular declined a lot. And we have about, like, you know, uh, in our data, 36.7% uh, of uh, respondents said that when we look at the longitudinal data, they are actually using buses and public transportation less than last year. But one thing that is interesting to see is also to see whether this has led to some mode substitution. And some worrisome pattern is that we see that among the people that actually have reduced the use of transit, we see that a substantial portion of them are actually driving a car more frequently. Uh, not surprisingly, the reverse is not true. So among the people that have reduced their use of uh, uh, driving, very, very few increase the use of bus. And many of them might be actually for reasons that have nothing to do with the COVID-19 pandemic, but might be a new job or changes in the household structure and so on. So somehow this could pose actually issues as we reopen the economy moving forward with more driving, more congestion, more issues for society. Even more uh, scaring, I would say that the U.S. is already a very car-dependent society, and our data are showing that individuals in this time of the pandemic are even less willing to live without a car if they can access one through mobility as a service or car share rideling options. And somehow we are seeing like you know, less uh, opportunities, less interest in car life and multimodal lifestyles. And this is a substantial reduction compared to our data from 2018 and 2019, showing that somehow we have a reversal of some of the uh, more multimodal trends we were seeing in many American cities. In our data collection, we have collected also information about what respondents expected to do by October 2020. And not surprisingly, many of them actually expect to travel more by car as a way to avoid trouble with the pandemic. Very few of them expect to return to using ride hailing services, Uber and Lyft, as they used to do before the pandemic. Some of them seem to be inclined to use bicycling more often if they are measures to keep them protected from car traffic, but also we still see that a lot of people are uncomfortable using a lot of share modes, including micromobility, which technically, if we wipe the handlebar, I think would be a rather safe option. So we are diving a lot of other results, but now we don't have the time to discuss them today, but I want to leave really some major conclusions. One of these is like, you know, let's think about the future. We will go back to previous life. And previous research has shown that individuals really tend to go back to the previous behavior uh, after some disruption. However, the longer the disruption, the more likely that longer term might arise. Also, there are several things that might seem to be more permanent. This is the increasing shopping that seems to be a feature in our society. Digital space is also changing forever. So many shops are closing. And economic activities will need a lot of time to recover, so this might lead to a longer transition. At the same time, some things to, to be worried about is that we see clear signs that travelers are very hesitant about using share mode. Many of them are switching from transit to driving a car when they have an option. Uh, transportation supply might be a big, big struggle. Uh, this is in particular funding issues for public transportation. Many agencies in the U.S. are already having problems with declining revenues to fund the service. And we might have, like, you know, the need really to have new policies to promote active travel and avoid the resurgence of car travel because otherwise the future might be scary. We also have many equity impacts uh, to be consider. Uh, the next uh, uh, session today, we, I will talk more about uh, those uh, aspects. And I also would like to, to say one thing that it's probably too early now to assess whether there will be more permanent uh, long-term changes uh, with people wanting more low-density suburban housing, for instance. Uh, this is something that there's been some speculation in the media. Uh, we have data about that, but I also believe that the future aspirations about long-term decisions uh, might be not very reliable, in particular where they are affected by very strong emotional issues, like a pandemic that might scare. So many people might say today, yes, I will move out of the city, but in reality, many of them might not do that just because uh, it will be, uh, uh, from the attitudes to the behavior, there will not be that big step. I want to acknowledge the research team that is contributing to this wonderful research and all the funding agencies and other colleagues that are contributing to our work. And also, if you want more information, I invite you to check our website. We have several papers we are working on and a lot of results we are posting on this website, postcovid19mobility.ucdavid.eu. And thank you so much. And I think we have time for our questions later. Thank you, Giovanni. Thanks a lot. And uh, quickly switching to the next presentation, Jose Veras from Rensa in Polytechnic Institute. 
um, and uh, yeah, please uh, write your question in chat box so that uh, we have time for more um, efficient discussion at the end. Uh, and also please uh, manage the time. I ask the presenters to manage the time. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. It was a very good presentation. Uh, and Joseph, we are all listening to your presentation. Thank you. Play now again. Sure. Okay, what about now? I think it's, yeah, yes. Fantastic. Well, it really gave me a great pleasure to have the opportunity to tell you a bit about the research that we are conducting, uh, basically on the impacts of um, of COVID-19 on the uh, on transportation activities. As you know, the COVID pandemic has basically upset the traditional relations between um, a, a transportation supply and demand. It used to be that uh, basically it was only the competition of modes, new technologies, and e-commerce were the only players. But now we have to uh, to account for the impacts of the of the COVID uh, pandemic. Now, in reaction to the COVID pandemic, there have been tremendous changes in purchasing patterns, basically, uh, in anticipation of shortages and other concerns, basically people try to get supplies, the supplies that they perceive they would need, and then basically they react in different ways. Basically, in some cases, uh, changing uh, retail outlets, moving to e-commerce, increasing the amount of supplies they buy, or frequency, et cetera, et cetera. And what I'm going to tell you is basically what we found regarding this. Now, a, a key factor here is that, uh, that we need to, to take into account that this is basically a disaster environment in which there are multiple, uh, multiple effects that are really unique to disasters. We have been studying disaster for close to 20 years. And in fact, we have studied the largest, the largest disaster have taken place in, in the world since, two, since basically 2001. And, and we have basically uh, noticed that in disasters, there are behaviors that are very unique, very unique that simply do not have any parallel in normal conditions. And we need to account for those. Now, we're using data from two different surveys an international survey that we conducted in collaboration with some of our partners, and, and a survey focused on the U.S. If that focused on the impact of COVID-19 on travel activities and e-commerce. In both cases, we, uh, we waited them to ensure that they represented the, uh, the, uh, the population. And let me tell you what we found pertaining to changes in disaster in, in buying behaviors. Now, to start, basically, we need to take into account that uh, in, if, you know, in a case like this, there is a tremendous level of complexity. It's not that simply as people might think that for tactile activities are going to be replacing or substituting for transportation, the reality is more, more complex. There is induction, complementation, and also substitution. And we need to account for that. Now, it is important to account for that because in reality, the research that we have done already in the case of the trade-off between um, e-commerce purchases and shopping trips, that was led by Professor Caraguan that will, she will speak later today, it clearly shows that in the case of, uh, of these daily activities, there are very complex patterns involving substitution, induction, and complementation. And basically, the net effect could be negative because of the induction of trips. Induction, people tend to uh, reduce shopping trips, but they might increase internet purchases and the VNT associated with this, you see. And that's important to be taken into account. In demo results, uh, basically what you have in this slide is a breakdown of the responses to this, uh, to the U.S. portion of the, of, the, of the survey that we conducted on buying behaviors. Basically, a lot of people bought more supplies than before. Others switched to online stores or others, and others basically indicated they purchased more frequently. Now, there were changes 
uh, in because because of the combination of the lockdown the uh, and also the fear of travel there was a switch between the before and the during covid uh, which is expected interestingly enough what we asked them is they will return to the traditional uh, retail outlets 95 percent said we're going to return because again we that is not surprising because the the changes that took place uh, because of the COVID pandemic were not the result of the natural competition in the markets. I mean, basically, it's an external force that, that led to behavior changes, and at some point, some of that is going to go back. Uh, an important element of this is basically the changes in the the inventory days of basic supplies. What you have here is the before condition uh, to the left, the during condition to the right. In essence, what you see here that uh, about before, about one third of respondents had basically more than 10 days of supply. But that proportion kind of more, almost double uh, during the COVID pandemic. And that is what uh, is an expression of what people refer to as panic buying. Is the, uh, in this something that uh, I'm going to dwell, I'm going to dig deeper into that in a moment. Now, uh, when we ask them about the reasons, basically uh, this is kind of a complete mapping of all the answers that were provided to us. What you see here, I mean, there are a wide range of, uh, of reasons. Some of them, uh, to start, I want to say that in reality, uh, people are kind of rational. I mean, some of these, uh, uh, all these decisions are rational in, the, in their own way. Now, you might dispute the rationality, but in any case, I mean, th there is a reason for people to buy things. All of them are related to the lack of, uh, the lack of trust on the ability of both the public sector and private sector to deliver the critical supplies they feel they needed. Now, but here on top, you have basically what basically might be uh, a valid reasons to uh, valid because they are, they are going to be um, impacting people in the short term and then precautionary in the, uh, in the middle. And at the bottom, you have opportunistic reasons. People who bought stuff in order to profit from the pandemic. Now, and these numbers seem small, the opportunistic behaviors, but it, they have a tremendous impact on the availability of supplies, as I'm going to discuss later on. Now, just to give you a hint about the, uh, the international results, there is tremendous consistency in the, in the breakdown of the reasons. As you can see, the, um, I was kind of stunned by the similarities because in the, taking into account the large differences between the uh, cultures, behavior, uh, income level, etc., cetera, uh, I was not expecting for all these, um, uh, for the international results to be so consistent with each other. Now, just to give you a sense about the impact of these opportunistic purchases, what you have here is in this diagram, what we have is basically in the vertical axis, you have the average number of masks that opportunistic buyers bought during the pandemic. And on the axis, on the horizontal axis, you have the average number of masks for precautionary buyers. And what you have here in these circles are basically the, uh, the diameter represent the, um, the, the number of users. The, the, the number of face masks that will need it if for a given combination of the average mask for opportunistic and the average for precautionary bias. Now, if everybody buy only one mask, I mean, basically, we will need 237 million face masks. So, so. Now, if we moved, if the precautionary bias buy 15 face masks and the opportunistic bias 5,000, then we get 11 billion. And basically, and as you can see, these numbers escalate and they are heavily driven by the opportunistic buyers. Why? Because the typical user is going to buy 10 to 20 masks 
for the opportunity buyers, they buy in the thousands. Some of you might believe that this is basically um, an exaggeration, but uh, this thing is a very serious problem because opportunity buyers typically buy supplies from disadvantaged areas, uh, and I'm going to have a specific example later on, and then basically sell it to the one that have good faith, that could pay for it. In essence, there is a tremendous inequity that's being introduced for that. Uh, this is basically, this uh, was reported by New York Times. I mean, this fellow and his brother, uh, basically from Tennessee, they drove all over the rural areas in, in, Ken in Tennessee and Kentucky, but they went to the rural areas to buy supplies. And at the end, basically, they accumulated almost 18,000 bottles of hand sanitizers Basically, they sold, in some cases, $8 a bottle. And at the end, they have to, when the authorities kind of uh, put pressure on them, they have to somehow, I mean, donate it. It's basically what happens. And recently, uh, the New York Times reported this, uh, this, this uh, fellow who purchased 200,000 face masks. You see? And that explains some of the shortages that, uh, that we experienced during the pandemic. Impacts on, on trips? Oh, just a reminder, you have two more minutes. Okay. Basically, impacts here, what you have is the, uh, the uh, breakdown before and after the, uh, the, COVID, the COVID crisis. And then what you have here is the mapping of all the different, uh, all different groups. In essence, what you see here for prepared food, this is basically changes after the pandemic what they declare they will do after the pandemic is over and changes during the pandemic here in, in the horizontal axis. What you see here is like three, three major clusters of behaviors depending on the level of growth, of, of potential growth of this um, OGE group. Now we could also represent this here with the aid of this, this is a traditional market penetration uh, model. And you can see here the, uh, the different group have different levels, potential of growth. Uh, starting in the bottom, groceries, uh, prepared food, and household goods have basically tremendous growth potential. That means increase in VNT. That is basically the case. In terms of the uh, relation between daily activities and vehicle trips, I'm going to present only one. This is basically related to grocery delivery shopping. As you can see here, the uh, between the before and after, we expect a decrease in the number of shopping trips. Now, for the average user, here we also see that for the average user, like an increase in grocery, grocery delivery frequency of about 0.4. In essence, in the average term, there is uh, a substitution of shopping trips versus delivery trips. Now, if we take a look now at the actual users of grocery delivery services, that is basically the, the purchasing patterns give us an idea about what will happen in the future when penetration growth. These fellows uh, reduce a trip to supermarket, but also increase the number of purchases in a significant way. In essence, if we assume that these, uh, the, the GDS users represent what will happen in the future as the level of penetration of grocery delivery service increases, in essence, there is a, in essence, substitution and a great deal of induction of delivery trips. Key takeaway from this, uh, the uh, COVID pandemic is that is a tremendous multifaceted impacts. Now, uh, all signs point at a new normal, but this new normal might be different than stated by the service because of the co-evolution between supply and demand. There are reasons for concern and optimism because some of these benefits are, some of these effects are beneficial. There are others that need to be controlled by policymaking, essentially. And then just to close, I want to acknowledge the work of, uh, of the center that funded this, uh, this effort with a special thanks to our collaborators and our international partners. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jose. It was a very good presentation. And so quickly switching to the next presenter, Dr. Deborah Sano from Arizona State University. 
my colleague. Um, Deborah, can you please share your screen? Definitely. Can you hear me? And if, yeah, and if I, I want to ask Deborah and Kuros to keep time at 12 minutes so that at least we have 15 minutes at the end for the panel and Q&A. Yeah, Thank I you. hope so. Can no, you you're see the, you're only limiting me on that. I know, right? Can you see? Can you see my full screen, or did it? Yeah, we see that. Okay, so um, so I'll be presenting today on behalf of myself and my co-authors, and actually uh, a larger team, including Kuros, who was just speaking, and Sarah, and a few other people, uh, on some work that we've been doing related to COVID-19. And like many others who've just presented, we have been conducting a survey. So the title of our presentation is, How Will the COVID-19 Pandemic Affect the Future of Transport? So in a little bit of a contrast with some of my colleagues who've just been speaking, we are really focusing on actually what people say they're gonna do post-pandemic compared to what they did pre-pandemic. And we'll talk a little bit about what they say they're doing now. Um, so, as everybody knows, uh, the pandemic has required most of us to make large changes to our daily lives. And here's just some examples. People used to commute, now they work from home, some people. Uh, many people have moved to online shopping and delivery, as Jose was just discussing. And another piece that we've investigated is the, how people used to go do a bunch of traveling on airplanes and now they they don't do nearly as much and a lot of people are meeting via video conference like we are right now. So the big question is, will some of these new behaviors stick? And um, so that's what we're trying to begin to get an answer to. I know Giovanni said earlier, you can't know. Well, you can't really know, but these kinds of data give us some idea, uh, which is why we're collecting them. Another point I wanna make clear is that We've actually, we actually had planned and hoped to share our data before this, but we actually will be sharing our raw data with anyone who wants it uh, to help plan for the future. And that data sharing link, I'll, I'll give the web, our website information um, well, right here and, and later on as well. So um, what did we do? So our survey uh, included uh, seven main sections, similar to what Giovanni and other, others have, have done. So we look at employment, how people are working and studying during the pandemic and before the pandemic and post pandemic, um, shopping and dining behaviors, transportation, both everyday and commuting, um, you know, and everyday non-commuting, and then also those long distance travel trips specifically by air. We have an attitudinal section that I won't really be talking about today, but we're gonna be delving into in our research. And then demographics. And we also have a question that looks into you know, how people's social networks are changing. And we, I won't be talking about that today, but I am looking forward to delving into that later in the next few months. Um, survey was implemented online in Qualtrics. It took folks between 15 and 30 minutes to complete, depending on who they were. We had a lot of skip logic in there. Um, and how did we recruit people? We recruited people in a bunch of different ways. Uh, originally, we began with direct email, just a convenient sample of anyone we could possibly think of to invite to take our survey because we didn't have uh, external funding. We did a little bit of Facebook um, ad, ad buying and Twitter. Um, we were lucky enough to get our study covered by the news media in a couple of places, and that was helpful. And then when we did get NSF um, funding, we were able to expand our recruitment channel to include an address-based, you know, sort of randomized email invitation as well as using an online survey panel. This is just a screenshot of what our, our Twitter post looked like. Um, here's a couple of the places where we've been covered in the, in the news. Um, it's an example of what our email invitation looked like. So the period, time period that we are talking about, we began collecting data April 14th, uh, and the survey is ongoing, but the data I'm going to be, the results I'm going to be talking about today are through August 4th. Our sample size is through August 4th was 6,784, and we are planning to do 
to more waves of data collection. So we're going to be recontacting the people who have responded to our survey and asking them uh, in shorter surveys um, at four months and eight months out, you know, how, how things are going for them now. If their current behaviors changing, changed and if their plans for the future have changed. The spatial distribution of our respondents, this is a US only survey. Um, as you can see, that's, it's mostly kind of indicative of where people live in the United States, except for the obvious uh, uh, oversample in Arizona, which is where um, a lot of the research team is located. Um, but other than that, we have a lot of the more heavily populated states, more heavily represented, and et cetera. So I feel pretty good about this. Um, the data, the, the results I'll be telling you about today are weighted to match the national distributions of age category, gender, and whether folks have um, a bachelor's degree or not. Um, the survey link and more information about the project is available at covidfuture.org. And so now I'll get into just a few results. So as one part of our survey, we did ask people about what the effect of the actual pandemic was on them directly in terms of illness and also in terms of econo the you know, economic impacts. So I know that's not transport, but I think it's important and interesting. So this shows just, we asked them if they had been tested and whether they tested positive or negative. And then we also asked them whether or not they'd been tested, did they believe they had COVID-19? This shows all the different combinations of that. But the next slide shows kind of the take home results, which is that 17% of our sample has been tested, nearly 11% believe they have had COVID-19, but only 1.4% have actually tested positive for COVID-19. And it turns out these numbers are actually quite close to the national um, numbers that I looked up just the other day. So our sample is quite representative in this particular way. And it was something I was a bit worried about because you think, well, if it's a little bit of a volunteer activity to take a survey, maybe people who are more impacted by the pandemic would be more likely to take it, but it doesn't seem like that's really the case here. Um, now looking at the economic impacts, uh, as one might expect, the gone down income areas are larger than the gone up income areas in the pandemic um, scenario. And we see that about a third of our respondents have reported some or a lot of income drop. Uh, this is somewhat worse for lower income respondents, but pretty bad for higher income respondents as well. See, so we see that there's somewhat of a drop in income that is across the income spectrum in our sample. We also asked if people had, if there's anything about the current kind of pandemic life that people were actually enjoying. And this came out as somewhat of a, a maybe not a total surprise, but kind of interesting that 75% of our respondents said yes or maybe to the types to whether they'd want to continue some of the ways of living that they're doing now. Um, and this is just a, a word cloud that I actually made with an earlier you know, sort of subset of this data, but I just really like it because it summarizes nicely. If you look at the big words here, you know, less work, more home time is kind of what people are feeling. Uh, a lot of people talked about how they really are enjoying a slower pace of life and enjoying working from home, enjoying spending time with their families. Um, so what did we find regarding kind of three big things when we're talking about work from home, long distance travel and daily travel. So in working from home, this Sankey chart uh, shows kind of what happened, uh, our respondents, what the respondents were doing pre-pandemic, what they're doing now and what they're expecting to be doing post-pandemic. And it shows both whether they're actually working from home and also whether they're able to work from home. So pre-pandemic, we had a lot of respondents not able to work from home um, and even some who said they were able to work from home, they chose not to. Uh, and in the current situation, obviously, a lot more people are able to work from home and working from home, although also this not employed uh, piece of the bar got a lot bigger. And in the post-pandemic situation, though, we do see that a lot more people are going to be working from home. And this next chart just summarizes, I think, the big take home from that complicated chart, which is that if we believe what people are saying, and I, I, I tend to believe them at least somewhat, 
we see that working from home in the long-term situation, so once the pandemic is no, COVID-19 is no longer a threat, people are planning to be, work, be working from home a lot more than they did pre-pandemic. And that has big impacts on, obviously, you know, office districts, commuting, commercial real estate, et cetera. One of the reasons that I kind of believe these results is that more than two thirds of those respondents that we have in our sample that were working from home report stable or increased productivity. Um, so, but I just want to point out also that the ability to work from home is highly unequal. 45% uh, of those without a bachelor's degree who were employed during the pandemic reported they were able to work from home, but the statistic is over 80% for people with a bachelor's degree. And so we really see a large difference in, in those two groups. Talking about air travel very briefly, um, my colleague Denise Capasso da Silva will be speaking in more depth about this part of our survey later. But we see, just as a quick snapshot, a lot of people, both people who used to fly for business and people who used to fly for pleasure at least once a year, expect less flying overall by a large margin. So this may have large impacts on the airline industry. Maybe people will actually go back to it and that's just uh, you know, a pandemic kind of panic answer. But I think, there may, I think it's likely that there is, especially on the business side, there is some reality to that expectation because of the new habit of substituting online meetings for business travel. So finally, what are we finding on daily travel? We asked people, you know, their, what their, whether they were, but well, we asked people how often they used different modes in the pre-pandemic um, situation. We asked them currently during the pandemic, which I'm not reporting here. And this is the, and then we asked them after the pandemic, you know, would you, would you use the modes more than you used to or less? And so that's what this is showing based on whether people were regular users of a mode or not and how much they expect their um, mode use to change. For each of them, there are gonna be five modes in the second slide here. These are the individual modes. And so you see that car use is sort of more or less slightly on the more side, but more or less even, more or less, um, and mostly staying the same. But biking and walking have huge numbers of people saying that they would want to do it more, especially among those who used to bike and walk somewhat regularly before the pandemic. So people are really excited about biking and walking. And then when we talk about the, the collective modes where you're in a, uh, a vehicle with other people who you may not know outside your family, predictably we see a large share of the formerly regular users saying they don't wanna do that as much. But interestingly, we see that green bar on top that they will do it more. And I need, we need to dig into our data a bit to figure that out because I really expected the green part of that bar to be smaller and the maroon part of that bar to be bigger, to be honest. Um, but in any case, even uh, if this is really the case, it still looks like that's probably a, a drop, a net drop for uh, collective modes. And so we have this question about how can transit agencies plan in this kind of uh, projected future um, demand scenario. And kind of, I think maybe the more interesting question and that is really kind of asked by our data, which is, do we really want to think carefully about allocating more street space, especially for pedestrians and somewhat for cyclists? Because so many people are planning to do that more. So just the big question that underlies all of this research, will these expectations of change become actual change? Um, time will tell, we don't really know, but I feel like these data or data like these are the best indicators we have right now and we should use them to try to you know, plan for what may be coming. So as I mentioned earlier, we are having a date, we're gonna be sharing our data and the link will be coming soon, hopefully by early September at covidfuture.org. Um, my next slide is a thank you slide. Before I put that in though, I wanna just say to everyone on this um, Zoom meeting, 
I may be trying to organize a special issue of a journal to talk about COVID-19 and transport. So if you're interested, feel free to contact me and um, let me know if you'd like to contribute. So with that, I say thank you and look forward to the rest of the session and the rest of the conference. Thank you, Deborah, and uh, great presentation. And also thanks for timing, great timing. And I wanna uh, quickly move to next and the final presentation by Dr. Mohammed. Well, thank, thanks, Sarah. Just uh, as a reminder, when we scheduled this uh, four sessions per day, uh, we left 15 minutes time between the sessions and obviously uh, this, this whole conference being online uh, for other tracks uh, of the conference, there is no time between sessions. So we have this 15 minutes so we can extend our session all the way till 11 o'clock because the next session starts at 11 o'clock. So, and obviously being online, people can you know, log in, log out anytime they want. They want to actually take a bathroom break anytime they want. So it's just, uh, we, we have till 11 o'clock. So that's just when I actually just, we don't need to rush. <laughs> so, Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So let me actually just go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can you see that now? Yes, yes. Okay, good. So, uh, well, I don't know where you are, so I just where I'm here. So actually, it's morning, so good morning, good afternoon, good time, wherever you guys are. Uh, so I'll be uh, also presenting yet another survey, uh, and uh, just quickly actually just uh, uh, acknowledging my colleagues, Raman Shavampur, Ali uh, Shamshiripur, and Ahsan Rahimi. Uh, they're going to be presenting uh, other papers that we have uh, that are models they have developed on uh, telecommuting and uh, risk perception, as well as uh, uh, e-shopping and e-commerce uh, throughout the conference actually the next two days. So you're going to be listening to them uh, in, in other sessions. Uh, but uh, where we started actually just obviously just like everybody else, the first uh, thing we noticed was uh, the changes in uh, traffic volume that I uh, I monitor actually just uh, in, our, in, in our lab. Uh, so we noticed that in Chicago, in some of the highways, we have uh, seen actually up to almost 50% drop in traffic volume and travel time, um, you know, uh, and speed actually just uh, uh, improved significantly just, you know, on the highway that I drive myself, the crawling speed of the morning actually from 20, 22 miles per per hour, just all of a sudden actually just increased to 60 miles per hour. So uh, these were basic changes, but then uh, later we realized that, well, okay, so the changes is not the impacts of this COVID is not just on our mobility and just the volume on the network. So there are, this, this is basically impacting every aspects of our lives or just basically the livability of our cities, the safeties, the public health equity, and just, you know, all sorts of, uh, uh, the health of our communities and cities. So we needed actually to have a more comprehensive survey that can look into different aspects of uh, the impacts of COVID-19 on our society. So we designed the survey. So I'm going to be very quickly go over the, uh, the survey, different aspects of that, and some insights into future impacts of uh, the, the, the COVID-19. So we, we, we started the survey uh, as a uh, small practice actually just in, in campus. I, uh, we designed it, we ran it actually just uh, through a faculty and staff list. We collected 200 something uh, responses from the faculty. We revised the survey and then uh, a colleague ha helped us to distribute it to disabled community because we want to see the impacts of them on disability community. And then we decided to actually run a general public actually survey in Chicago, which I'm, re uh, I'm now presenting the results of the survey that we ran on uh, basic general public in Chicago, uh, excluding the, the, the data that collected in the, at UIC and disability faculty. So this is general public. We, we, we got almost 1,250 responses. And after, you know, Validating them, we had 915 valid responses from the city of Chicago. Uh, the survey uh, 
was collected, uh, you know, earlier through the pandemic when the lockdown was still in place. Uh, before we, you know, the, the, we, we open up actually just the economy and the city uh, from April 25th till June 2nd. Uh, so the first step was just to uh, check how people were really impacted by in terms of whether their, their exposure to uh, the, the, the virus. Uh, we, we, at, we, we, at that time, we got actually just got 1% of uh, our responses, uh, respondents actually actually got the virus. They were positive, tested positive, and that was pretty much in line with the positivity late rate at that time. Now that has been increased actually just uh, around 2% now, but just 1% was pretty much accurate at that time. And then uh, also 5% of people uh, they, 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 they told us that uh, they have the symptoms, even though they were not tested. Uh, we also collected all sorts of information about uh, whether they were in, uh, in contact with anyone who had virus uh, within the 14 days or before that, and whether they have any pre-existing condition that can actually put them at risk. And we needed this information because we wanna know the risk perception. Uh, so we looked at different aspects of risk perceptions and whether people are uh, risk averse or you know, uh, risk takers. Uh, we, we looked at, for example, their risk perception with respect to uh, the mode they are traveling and obviously, uh, you know, public transit and, uh, you know, uh, ride hailing, pool ride hailing, like Uber pool, uh, were considered as higher uh, risk or just, you know, uh, compared to private cars or non-motorized, uh, private non-motorized, like, you know, uh, private bicycle and walking. Uh, we also ask about uh, people's risk perception in, in, in terms of the locations uh, they're visiting, they're participating in activities in those locations, and obviously the indoor locations, uh, particularly hospitals or just gyms were considered uh, riskier than uh, outdoors like parks and just, you know, uh, locations like that. Uh, we, we looked at different modes of transportation. I, I've seen 12 minute presentation, I cannot go over everything. So, but just uh, the air travel is one big uh, elements of this. That's uh, if we had the air travel actually just not uh, affected, probably we could have had a you know, few conferences uh, after TRB. So I haven't attended any conference since TRB. This is my second conference this year after TRB. Uh, so uh, obviously it's, 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 it's has affected large portion of the population. And then we ask people, how do they expect uh, their, about their air travel after uh, the pandemic is over? Uh, a, a large portion of uh, them actually, yes, they think that it's going to be, uh, they're going to be traveling less. And 43% uh, they say the same, and there's only a few percent, actually just 14%, uh, they, they think they're going to be traveling more to catch up with all the missed uh, travel. But then when we ask them about the reasons they, they're making those changes, uh, it's uh, the safety was the bigger factor, biggest factor. And then, uh, Obviously, other factors are just, you know, financial uh, circumstances and the issues that, uh, you know, the changes that happens to uh, the people's uh, uh, businesses and expected actually just uh, uh, need for travel has been other factors. We looked at the actually just uh, shopping uh, behavior and uh, in different actually just types of shopping. Here I'm just uh, presenting two types of shopping, grocery and uh, ordering food uh, from uh, a vendor from a restaurant outside. Uh, it's just uh, uh, why uh, large portion of population, 55% of people who responded to the survey had prior experience with ordering food. Uh, online, uh, smaller portion, 33% had the experience of actually just doing uh, grocery shopping before. But then uh, as we uh, checked whether uh, as they go through this, you know, um, the um, uh, experience of ordering, uh, you know, grocery and food online, the rate of growth for the uh, online grocery shopping was 
way higher than the rate of growth that uh, we observe for uh, ordering food online. Uh, in terms of economic impacts, uh, we uh, looked at both full-time and part-time uh, employers. Uh, the, the biggest hit was on part-time workers, almost half of them lost their job, 35% uh, temporarily, and just 17% of them totally lost their job. And uh, this was almost 25% of actually just the full-time workers. Uh, but then if you look at the different industries, uh, the, the art, entertainment, recreation, and uh, uh, restaurant and food services were actually just the, the impacted uh, higher with uh, in terms of the number of actually jobs lost there uh, and uh, even actually just in areas like healthcare because m many of the uh, doctor offices and hospitals were uh, uh, basically just when hospitals were uh, uh, designating their uh, staff to patients of COVID other non-essential medical services were actually just went on hold so there's even some Healthcare uh, personnel lost their job. Uh, in terms of the uh, economic impact on income, the biggest hit again was with uh, lower income population, uh, those who are uh, or making less than 30K, 44% uh, of them lost job, lost their income. And that's the, uh, that's, that's, it's, that's a very large population. And now we're talking about actually just uh, you know, uh, people uh, uh, loading or just, just you know, uh, going and stealing from stores and just all the unrest, everything. So obviously that could be a result of this group of population who have uh, lost their job and income. Uh, in terms of uh, working uh, from home, why 37% of, uh, uh, 71% of people before pandemic never worked from home. That dropped to 37%. So a large portion of people, who, those who were, uh, whoever was able to work from home, they managed to do that. So that's uh, only 15% of people uh, were uh, working from home before pandemic that jumped to 48%. So that's uh, uh, technically those who were not uh, laid off and were able to work from home, uh, they benefited from that opportunity. But then that we ask them that how they uh, perceive, how do they actually just feel about the uh, productivity of working from home versus working in the office, there was a difference between uh, those who had prior experience of working from home and those actually who just um, had to go through this experience through the pandemic. Uh, so those who had the prior experience, they were more satisfied actually just uh, from working from home, basically uh, mainly because they already have the uh, necessary uh, resources to help them to be productive while they're working from home. They, they are less distracted or just they have the comfortable work environment from home. Uh, while others who were forced to do this, they didn't have those resources available. But in general, people were happy that they were not uh, doing commuting, they're saving that time, and also they have more casual environments, uh, work environments while they're at home. So uh, very quickly, actually, just we think that this is going to be a, having a uh, huge impact on the future uh, mobility, especially when you look at actually just the uh, potential of continuation of the telework. Uh, that that's uh, now people get used to that and it's going to be changing the whole uh, landscape of uh, uh, work activity that's now just uh, we're going to see that uh, higher uh, percentage of uh, teleworking uh, in we're going to see actually just uh, more uh, impact on micro mobility biking uh, scooters and uh, and then the other uh, aspects of travel related to the shift of the mode and uh, we're going to see some impact on housing and real estate industry. People are going to be looking for uh, houses that have uh, a comfortable work environment that they can actually just uh, uh, easily telework. Uh, this was not a big factor maybe for many people just to, you know distance, commute distance, the pricing and uh, school quality were the key factors we used to consider for just residential relocation. Now that just whether that uh, unit has the potential for the telework is probably another big factor to be considered. The impact on 
air travel is uh, it's 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 going to be still actually just there. We are not going to see the quick recovery that we see in other parts of industry probably as fast as we expect because of the long term impact is had. And as uh, Dev mentioned, actually just uh, people now get used to uh, you know uh, communicating. Uh, uh, online, so that's that's going to be actually special, and business travel is going to be impacting uh, the air travel. Uh, it's, we're still going to be actually just further growing uh, e-shopping, and uh, uh, probably just um, uh, that's going to be helping uh, further growth in the, uh, online businesses, and that's that 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 can has an impact also on vehicle ownership now. Just uh, if you don't actually just need grocery, just you live in actually just central business district, which is crowded, uh, you don't have parking, you just have to pay hefty parking. And the, now you don't need to actually just uh, have a car just for, that you used to use it only for just grocery shopping. You can, you can basically just uh, avoid having that car. So that can have impact on car ownership, but just probably gonna have a positive impact on AVs, we used to, before we get into COVID, we, many of us were doing lots of research on AVs and just markets uh, for the uh, autonomous vehicles. Probably this is gonna be actually just accelerating the demand for AVs. Uh, we are starting implementing uh, the models that we are developing. As I said, we, we have uh, several models developed on that. We're just gonna be presenting them throughout the conference. Uh, we have already started implementing them in ADAPTS as well as Polaris model. So we're gonna see them uh, these, these actually just changes in our uh, digital twin uh, uh, models. Uh, as Deb mentioned, uh, the next phase of the survey, the survey that I presented was only in Chicago. We, we, we were lucky to get that NSF funding in collaboration with ASU. And uh, it's, it's just the survey is underway. As Deb mentioned, uh, we have uh, almost 6,800 uh, responses there. That, that survey results are gonna be actually publicly available. So for anyone to download and use it, so soon you're gonna have that result out. Uh, and for the Chicago data, just this is our website, my lab website. So we have information about our Chicago survey that I presented here on this website. With that, I can stop here and we can move on to, we have 20 minutes too for the discussion and questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Mohammedian, And thanks to all of our great presenters and uh, nice and timely work in the era of COVID-19. I have summarized um, a few points, but kind of if I want to uh, go through them, it's kind of repeating what Dr. Mohammedian slides at the end summarized on the in potential future in, uh, impacts of COVID-19. Uh, one thing that I really uh, want to highlight here and needs uh, attention more from policymakers is the huge um, unproportionate impact of COVID-19 on low income groups and disadvantaged groups. This is, and this is kind of obvious from all the presentations and um, it's very unfortunate, um, needs attention. Um, then the hard impact on transit, air, and um, shared uh, mobility services that we are expecting to be out there, not for short term. And, um, but the good thing is that, that we, will, we are seeing, and hopefully we will see increasing bike and walk modes. Um, so, uh, so my question is, uh, based on all the survey, to start the discussion, is that based on um, all the surveys, we are seeing that um, people are expecting to change um, in terms of um, working from home, e-shopping, uh, and so on. So, and the rate of the change is somewhere between before pandemic and during the pandemic. So we are seeing that these changes are going to be there at the, we don't know exactly how much, but it should be somewhere based on even our also be surveyed at the rate between the current during pandemic and before pandemic, like the rate of e-shopping, the rate of working from home. Um, but my question is that uh, 
especially with case presentation, who really showed us the activity and mobility, we are seeing that mobility and traffic is going back to normal, right? In terms of the VMP and everything. But people are still at home mainly. There are people are still working from home. People, students are not going to school. And student, kids are not going anywhere to play. Um, but why VMT is back to normal? You know, what are those VMT um, representative of? I can think of um, delivery trips uh, and e-shopping trips. Um, like people are ordering food from restaurant rather than going to restaurant or people are e-shopping and there are frequent deliveries. Like Amazon is doing one day, two day delivery. So there is a trip for each delivery. But I don't, I cannot think of, I, I, there should be other dynamics in travel behavior out there to justify this, you, this normal amount of travel with no commuting, with no school trips and so on. I think it's a, it's a mixture of things. Uh, a, yes, people are still working from home, but as you saw in Switzerland, 40% less mileage on public transport. So I, I would guess some of those people working from home are actually the people who normally would fill up the commuting trains. Mm -hmm. The additional tr car travel <clears throat> is most likely uh, people working, but also people traveling for leisure. And we haven't done, we are currently doing computing the trip purposes, so we'll be offering the results next week. Uh, so it's a mixture of that. And in that mixture, there is the problem, which I've tried to outline, is that if there is no permanent change in terms of working from home, if that pattern persists, the speeds will go down, as Kuros has already said as well, and as we have demonstrated in our data. Now, yes, there is an aspect of delivery services because delivery the amounts of delivery have gone up. Uh, maybe in Switzerland, not as dramatic as Jose showed for the US, but there are substantial amounts of, of extra delivery services. Mm -hmm. But they are normally not as have a heavy impact as others because they are actually well organized. These are tour plans and, and optimal routes they're taking. So they shouldn't have as much of an impact on travel as individual shopping trips. So it's that mixture and then we will have to ask the question, are those permanent changes? And if I think of any, I would guess uh, we will have permanent changes as firms will continue their pre-COVID trend of reducing the presence at work, shared offices, pushing people out. I think that will be the major change. Uh, th thanks. Let me actually add uh, to what Kai mentioned that the volumes that we are actually just seeing and uh, we are hearing that is coming back and I'm, I'm monitoring that we are just in uh, many places that I have checked, we are down only 6% of before COVID and that's uh, ADT. That's the average daily traffic. It's not peak spreading actually is not there yet. So that's, these are uh, the total volume might be actually getting close, but uh, it's not the same type of commute trips that we used to see in the past that people go in the morning to office and coming, to, uh, coming back in the afternoon. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the other factor is just in our study, we saw that even throughout the actually just the uh, worst time of the pandemic, when everything was locked down, almost 40% of people still were going to work. So some of these are just considered essential uh, jobs. And now it's just even actually just more than that. So the, uh, it's, I'm, I'm pretty much sure that if you look at actually just people who are, many of us who are basically doing research or just doing having an office job, uh, probably just be still working from home. I, I go two days a week myself to office, but uh, that's, uh, uh, still actually just large portion of people have to go to, to work. That's another thing. Uh, the other issue is just, as Kai mentioned, actually just that shift in the mode. People are not trusting, they are not actually just using transit anymore. Uh, transit uh, ridership is not 
anywhere close to what it used to be. And I don't think that it's going to be recovering anytime soon. So, you know, transit agencies are going to, they're going to have really hard time trying to actually just make these services uh, safe and just attractive to travelers. <clears throat> and many of people who used to tr use transit and they have to go to work, they have, now there's their drive. And that's an, actually another reason, another additional uh, traffic on the actually on the north on the, on, 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 in network and also the deliveries extra additional all these deliveries that are happening right now all the e-shopping need to be actually delivered so those are another extra traffic so combination of all these have been actually just adding to the volumes that we see in the network but as uh, let me go back to what i said these are not the same type of traffic that we used to see commuters they are distributed differently throughout the day I will add to what uh, Kai and uh, uh, Corus mentioned, uh, all great points. Uh, and uh, there's also a lot of uh, variability by region. So in California, we actually seen many regions that uh, VNT is still substantially below than uh, it was before. In other states, actually, has gone up and back to more similar levels to the pre-pandemic level. So somehow that depends also a lot about the local uh, patterns. And as Corus mentioned, in many parts of the U.S., uh, a true lockdown like has happened in Europe has never really happened. Uh, and so a lot of like a substantial portion of uh, uh, individuals has kept commuting to work or doing other travel uh, to much higher percentage than what somebody would expect for a true definition of uh, only uh, 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 essential workers. Uh, I would also cite a uh, past was uh, mentioning in the chat box, uh, uh, another important uh, uh, aspect uh, that also for the long distance travel, there might be uh, a substantial portion of people that are substituting air travel with car travel because it's considered more safe. And this is something actually we have been uh, uh, looking in our data and not only the, uh, the finding I was mentioning in my presentation before with some people that are a relevant portion of the people that are reducing the use of transit that are using more uh, uh, their, their, their private car, but also for long distance travel we observed a, a sharp reduction in air travel overall across the sample, but uh, car travel didn't reduce uh, for long distance travel that much. And actually for many users increased as a way to compensate for substitution of air travel. And so that uh, accounts for not a lot of number of trips, but because they are long distance trips, uh, quite a bit of vehicle mass travel. Yeah. I'd like to add to the discussion of between the trade-off between shopping trips uh, and deliveries. I have a number of data points I want to share with you guys. Uh, first, the number of deliveries to households in the US and typically in the big metropolitan areas in the world is larger than the number of deliveries to commercial establishments, which is astonishing. In fact, this is the, in fact the number of deliveries have more than doubled in the last 10 years. And within three years or so, it's going to triple the origin that what it was 10 years ago. The, uh, the trade-off in terms of VNT between shopping trips and deliveries depends on a number of things. One, the size of the city. In the smaller cities, they, it will, it's going to be less problematic. In bigger cities, like New York, for instance, uh, the statistic, that we, the estimate that we have is that one delivery requires five miles of travel, you see. Why is that? Well, the origins of the deliveries are not Manhattan. The origins are basically Northern New Jersey, Pennsylvania, upstate New York. We're talking about big, big numbers. That means even if they preposition supplies, if the number of deliveries is very high, and if we are producing three times the number of orders, because the number of orders were Manhattan before we used to go to the to the mall, to the commercial center, to the shopping, to the shopping to the shopping streets, to buy multiple things. But if we're buying different items one at a time, coming from different parts of the world, not only the city, basically the effect on VNT is tremendous. And in large metropolitan areas, in spite of the density of deliveries the access to global supplies basically is, in, my, in our opinion, is increasing VNT. The, the induction of deliveries is basically, in terms of VNT, 
is high, larger than the decrease in VMT associated with shopping trips. That's basically what we, this is basically the, the, the guess that we have. So, so, so you are saying you are saying that, Jose, on your point, you are saying that the increase in the VMT for for deliveries is more than the decrease in VMT for shop, for actual going to school. Absolutely, absolutely. And now with the on-demand economy, by which basically, if I need soap or I need uh, detergent or whatever, and to be delivered within half an hour, an hour, that's going to increase. That is very interesting point because even before the pandemic, I was kind of thinking about uh, e-shopping as a green way of shopping, because if you because if you order online and do not order like one day or two day, all the deliveries are adding together and it's just less cheap for you and for for the delivery service. But as you are saying, it's not the case. Of course, the longer the delivery time, the more sustainable it is because they allow the uh, carriers to consolidate more mm -hmm. because the speed goes against efficiency. This is the same. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, but the problem is the numbers. Yeah. It is, it's also the numbers. How many separate deliveries people make? It's a tremendous factor. It's, it's I have not, a question for Jose. I have a question for Jose. I wonder where the critical mass uh, that there are so many deliveries uh, might actually somehow compensate that uh, because right now there is uh, an Amazon truck going to deliver one package here, one package there. But if the volume becomes so big, every address they stop, there will be uh, multiple deliveries and multiple, at least for the last mile. But probably for the entire logistic, there will be still a problem. At least for the last mile, probably the critical mass can partially compensate that. Well, only if we have an oligopoly, if we have an oligopoly that sees <laughs> what may be happening in terms of the, it basically, basically there, there will be efficiency. But then they, they are going to jack the prices in a tremendous ways. Basically, the, uh, and, and that is an issue. I don't think the the problem is the the is the the problem is the changes in demand. If we have multiple orders, if we move to the on-demand economy, ordering soap or whatever, even if they bring with a bike, that produces congestion that affect basically entire traffic streams. You see, uh, basically mul multiplying deliveries like we are doing, and this is the trend, uh, basically there is no way that we could cope with this. I want to repeat the number I said. The number of deliveries in Syria more than double. And the core size space is exactly the same. For the most congested zip code in, in Manhattan, we computed the density of deliveries per linear feet of the street. For every four feet, there is a parcel being delivered every four feet. And this is basically the challenge, the traffic generated with us. Because the consolidation will not help if the demand keep basically being atomized. Yeah, and then I want to acknowledge what Dr. Hani Mahmasani He's saying that why are we surprised for VMT to be back to normal because of the fundamental kind of human nature desire for mobility, and that is true. Yeah, can I? I'll, I'll add to that. I, I I totally agree, honey. I think we're not that. I mean, I guess I'm not that surprised at VMT going back uh, <laughs> to more or less normal. Yep. But I do think. But I do think there may be some real. I mean, based on our survey results, and I think based on somewhat like kind of our intuition about how people are changing, you know, trying on some, trying some really new behaviors during this time, that there may actually be some changes in habits that continue past the pandemic. And that's what I think is really interesting to try to figure out what those are and then what effect that would be. Now, will it be a huge change in VMT? I don't think so, <laughs> right? But they might be significant and important to understand and plan for. 
talking about expectation for the future, Deborah, because you mentioned like, you know, my comment about the long term expectations for the future. Uh, let me uh, clarify that what I said at the end of my presentation was specifically about the residential location preferences. I think that in general, expectations about the future are very important to collect in this survey, but I'm actually uh, skeptical that uh, what people say today about uh, uh, moving their home and leaving the town and the city to move to a uh, more suburban location on the uh, height of the pandemic uh, might really translate in behavior simply because they are long-term choices. And so a residential location that will happen in five years from now might not really be affected by the, the changes in attitudes, but right now everybody's scared and say, yeah, I want to move out of the city. So that's the reason for which I think there is a big inflation. So maybe if 20 people, 20% 20 of the people say, yes, I will move to a more suburban location, maybe those that really translate in behavior will be only a very tiny portion of that. So those that are more mobile and they are planning a relocation anyway this year, perhaps. Well, that, that has supported you, Wani. Just uh, I, I live in actually just suburb, 37 miles from the city, and my neighborhood is just you know real estate is booming because every house that's put in the market actually just in two days is being sold, and people moving from the city actually just to come to suburb. And I talked to a couple of actual realtor agents. They're they're just saying that you know just people selling their houses in the cities and moving to suburb, and it's, it's not waiting for five years. It's happening. Yeah, but the numbers are still small because not that many houses are becoming available. Yeah. Uh, and as the prices will increase in a, in a market driven by, what is it now, 15, 12% unemployment in the US mm -hmm. and many more to come, I would be surprised if we see a real estate boom in the suburbs because people just can't afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think on the VMT question, I think the key issue is to what extent the working from home continues, and if working from home, certainly in an urban, in a very urban context like Switzerland, is predominantly people who are traveling by train and taking the VMT out there, but then having liberated themselves from traveling, they pick up travel elsewhere in the local area, as we saw with the people who are on short-term work, which are already work traveling more than before. And honey, I agree, there's no surprises there. It's just the amounts which are interesting. Okay, we have to, we have to actually switch to the next session. So <laughs> we just, we, we don't want to, we're going to have, we're going to have a panel discussion tomorrow morning. So we have uh, 115 people now logged in, and I'm sure that they're going to be more actually just tomorrow. You know, honey are going to, he's going to be there. Kai is going to be there. Eric Miller is going to be there. And just, we're going to have actually this very, uh, interesting discussion tomorrow morning for that panel. So let's move on to the next session. Thanks, everyone. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, all. thank you, all the presenters and the uh, audience. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. I think we're going to just start the next session. It's about time. And so for Kai and the speakers in the first session, that means we're going to go nonstop. <laughs> Hope it's okay for you. Yeah. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good night to everyone here, depending on where you are. I'm Kara Wong, and it's my pleasure to serve as moderator for the session two of track one. In this session, we are going to talk more about behavior changes during and after pandemic. And that will include uh, the changes in telework, e-shopping, e-commerce, and purchasing behavior. And we are going to have five speakers in this session. So we're going to use the same format as session one. Each speaker will have 12 minutes to give their presentation. And then we're going to hold all the questions uh, to the end of the session. Um, and we're going to have about 30 minutes for the overall Q&A and the discussion session. So for the audience, if you have any questions, please uh, send your questions through the chat box. And I'm going to collect all the questions and deliver that to our speakers at the Q&A session. Um, and then uh, for all the speakers, uh, so please try to monitor your time. Uh, when you have about 30 seconds left, I'm also going to send you a short message through the chat box just to remind you. Um, so 
uh, we'll start, we're going to start uh, from our first speaker, uh, Dr. Kai Oxhausen. Uh, he is the professor and chair of uh, the transportation planning at ETH Zurich. Uh, professor Oxhausen is an editor in chief of transportation and service, also serves on the editor's advisory board uh, of transportation research part A and travel behavior and society. Now, without further ado, I'm going to give the microphone to uh, Kai. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I, because of various confusions, I didn't prepare quite as much uh, slides, so I will keep, certainly will keep to my 15 minutes. Uh, now, let me get this up. No, that's the wrong slide. There we go. Okay. So I was, I will talk a bit about a related study which we undertook to look at e-shopping because that's clearly one of the other main changes which is going on at this point in time. Uh, we had, I have to acknowledge uh, the students which have been working with me, uh, Caroline Winkler, Adrian Meister, Basil Schmidt, and Thomas Schatzmann who developed and implemented the survey, uh, which I will report, talk about. Now, uh, this sample is a different sample from the GPS tracking study, which we have un we undertook and I reported about in the previous session. This study is based on an online access panel because we wanted to get this study done quickly. We all know, somebody said it's convenient sample and it is, even if the uh, providers of the panels do their utmost to remain representative. We had in total uh, about a thousand representative respondents from the German part, German speaking part of Switzerland, which covers about 60% of the population. And we did the survey in April and May. We included both RP and SP questions, and I will report briefly on both types of questions. The spirit of the SP was comparable to the survey which uh, Basil Schmidt had done as part of his PhD, uh, looking at uh, preferences for online shopping. Now, what were the trends which we were able to observe? The first thing was that we asked the people a retrospective question, which isn't good, but that's the one we could ask about shopping in terms of relative frequencies. And you can see if we divide it up by age, this is the upper panel, that the online shopping went up by a factor of two. Uh, and this is true across all age groups. There is an outlier for people in the 70s, which increased their online shopping even more uh, than before. If you look at income, uh, you can see that income has an impact on online shopping, uh, but it's not very pronounced, but it's there. And again, you see the doubling uh, of the total numbers. So Switzerland is in line with the rest of the world, but it's catching up because online shopping hadn't been as popular here as it is elsewhere, let's say in the US or the UK. So we, we are catching up and the providers are starting to think about how to cope with this because during the pandemic period, during the lockdown, there was major bottlenecks in the deliveries, both at the warehouses as well as with the delivery services. Now, so this is the trend. So we are seeing this and generally speaking, we expect that this will continue uh, in particular as some stores will go out of business anyway as part of the pandemic, they will essentially push more people uh, into uh, online shopping as some stores might be able to survive uh, by going just strictly online. Now, the question we had, and that's really the main result I want to show, is the valuations of delivery time. So the survey allowed us to look at uh, the valuations, values of travel time savings for going to the stores, but we also looked at how much value do people put on the time it takes the store to deliver. And 
the numbers are comparable to what uh, Basil found before, a bit higher, but not much. And one thing which you can see here in this, start, in this table is that when we divide it up by before and after and during the pandemic, you can see that before the pandemic, people were really concerned about delivery time because speed was everything. During the pandemic, they weren't as willing to pay for speed because there they were more concerned about getting the goods at all. So there is a new factor which comes into the reasoning of the consumers, uh, which dampens the impatience. And it will be interesting to see whether that will stay this way or after the pandemic has ended, whenever that might be, uh, they will go back to their impatient self. Now, we also asked the respondents to tell us whether they had prior experience, yes or no. And here you can see a massive difference. So people with prior experience didn't really want to pay for delivery. And that's in line with uh, what Mr. Schmidt, Dr. Schmidt had found out in his study that for the store, it's best if they hide the delivery costs in their purchase price. People don't want to remind it that there is a separate service in the delivery and they definitely don't want to pay for it. And those without were willing to pay for speed as before. Now, if we take all of this together, the question becomes, what are the next steps? Clearly, we know that the productivity of our society is to some extent proportional to the level of accessibility which society is offering, i.e. the density of other people and activities, locations, and the speeds by which we can reach them. And so as a society, we are concerned about the lived density with which we are congregating in cities in particular, and the speeds by which we can travel between them. Now, the question becomes, if e-shopping is really taking over, what happens to the lived density of an urban area? Because if the small stores where they exist, and even some of the bigger ones go the way of the dodo, what happens in those spaces? Will they just be rental apartments? Will they just be for residents? And this obviously then has an interaction with any increase in working from home, because if you work from home, you do like, generally speaking, to have a lively environment around you so that you can dash out for your coffee, you can dash out uh, for your croissant close by. But will there be enough lived density around those places to sustain those businesses? You don't want your coffee delivered by Starbucks arriving lukewarm or your croissant arriving uh, unedible after a two day journey. So we have an issue and we have to see how that works out and how the incentives will be set. Now, the other question which arises is what do we do with this time? Now, the first question is, is online shopping really faster than going to the store? And in many places, many cases, I would say, no, it's not faster than going to the store, but for certain uses, yes. So what will we do with that? In the prior talk, I showed that people working sh shorter hours actually travel more already than those who work normal hours. So where do they travel to? Where will they meet? And where can they meet if there is not enough lived density? That raises the issue, will there be massive crowding at those few remaining places which have any livable environment? And then obviously the question arises, what do we do with all that real estate? What will happen with all those stores, offices, restaurants, and malls? Some of them cannot be repurposed. A mall is a mall, there's nothing much you can do. So there will be a massive task for architects and developers to think about what to do with the unusable and unused real estate. And finally, will that all be used for local leisure activities or, or what? We don't know yet. And I think 
we are on an interesting new path for a new equilibrium of the transport system, the shopping system, and the built environment. And with that, I've said enough. And here is the links to uh, the websites at which the weekly reports on our GPS tracking study is, as well as all the other work. All right. Thank you, Kai, for the wonderful presentation. And then our next speaker will be Professor Hani Mamasani. Uh, professor Mamasani is the professor of civil and environmental engineering at Northwestern University. He is the William A. Patterson Distinguished Chair in Transportation and also the, the director of Northwestern University Transportation Center or NUTC. So Hani, all yours. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to continue with this theme of e-commerce, um, except I'm going to rather than, we're going to look at the demand side really but, but by, by looking at the supply side essentially and articulate a framework for understanding e-commerce developments from an omni-channel perspective. So the motivation, uh, of course, is that, as we've heard from our previous speakers, um, the, cri the health crisis has uh, led to a dramatic increase in e-commerce and home delivery of all sorts of products, initially essentials, and then virtually everything as people were on lockdown, various degrees of lockdown. Of course, the key question that all of us are discussing and are looking at is how much of that new demand will stick and what does it mean for brick and mortar uh, stores as Professor Axhausen uh, just um, articulated. And the basic premise for um, our approach is that to understand the demand for e-commerce and associated in-store experiences eventually, it's really essential to understand developments in retailing, especially omni-channel retailing. And these developments really predate uh, COVID-19 uh, and, uh, and what COVID-19 has done here is to accelerate these trends. And the question is, are we approaching some new equilibrium or is this gonna continue on sort of a systematic uh, kind of uh, a structural relation that we've seen previously? Um, this is more of a conceptual discussion uh, supported with uh, third party data uh, rather than uh, a survey that we have um, con uh, conducted. Uh, we had been looking, we being at Northwestern uh, with my colleagues, particularly in the, in the Kellogg School, been looking at the issue of omni-channel retailing more from a uh, sort of a supply chain logistics uh, standpoint, but that clearly interacts very strongly with the demand and the behavioral side, okay? So um, if you look at, uh, so this is a graph from, from, from Nielsen, uh, kind of tracking uh, over time, week one being, you know, the first week in January, that big spike there is the uh, sort of the, the whole, the initial lockdown in, 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 in March. Uh, this is looking at, um, the percent value growth by market of fast moving consumer goods. These include sanitizers, food staples, um, paper products, essentially the items that were hoarded by people as they found themselves at home. And you could see that big spike uh, in terms of that growth. And uh, a lot of it, of course, has, has subsided, but it's still uh, kind of 10 to 20% above what it was previously, except in Chile, surprisingly, that lower blue one uh, that's uh, hovering right about the negative 10% are, um, these are Chilean numbers, okay? Um, if you look at the, um, and this is, an, uh, again, data from uh, another entity called um, uh, Numerator, uh, and uh, they have been conducting a tracking survey, uh, a weekly one, uh, asking how COVID-19 has impacted the shopping behavior of their respondents uh, over the past week. And what is interesting is that this is now the, the end of July. The percent who are making online purchases when they usually would shop in store is still increasing. And I, you know, you, I expected that to go down, but, but it's not. And uh, what's also interesting is that the reason before was that the stores they may go to might be closed. Well, this is not a valid reason. Most stores are opening, but still you have more people making uh, online purchases. And that tells you something about the stickiness of that behavior. Um, this is a comparison, again, from that same entity, Numerator Labs, of uh, 
sort of pre versus post, uh, that is post the onset of COVID by uh, channel. This is looking at a household level. And uh, in teal, uh, the, you know, in the post part is what e-commerce has been contributing to a variety of, you know, of different uh, categories. And you could see that while the in-store spending has decreased, not hugely, there's been that increase uh, in uh, sort of what people are ordering um, via e-commerce. And these are items and categories that typically people were going to the store with, but, but during this sort of post this crisis are now ordering online. And you could, again, see, uh, you know, these, the, these items there. Um, frozen food is one that, that stands out in terms of increased value. Uh, sodas and sports and energy drinks. Bas basically, everything you guys have been ordering online uh, is listed here. Your behavior is no different than the majority of everybody else. So they've come up with this, uh, uh, that, that same entity with this interesting index. They call it an acceleration index. Uh, which is looking at the rate of a, a sort of a household's purchasing category online versus the pre-COVID baseline. It's a multi-year pre-COVID baseline. Unchanged would be 100. And so if you look at hand sanitizer, because the base was so low, it has effectively gone up. Um, you know, more than 18 times. Uh, you look at ice cream and novelties, nine times. Bathroom, dish, toilet paper, we all heard about that, more than eight times, and so on. And essentially, their conclusion is that COVID-19 has sort of moved uh, this, uh, you know, this conversion to online buying ahead um, sort of by, by more than a year for many, uh, for many categories. Um, this is another example, and you could pick many, many others, but, and this is looking at increase, um, again, during sort of the initial lockdown period um, of, on, you know, in-store versus online, in this case for alcoholic beverages. Uh, and you could see these are weekly sales growth versus a year ago. We know what people have been doing at home, but you could see the increase for this category, which is difficult to have delivered typically. Uh, and you could see the, uh, again, the, the increase there. And in this case, this is from, um, from, uh, from, 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 from Nielsen, again, increase of, uh, that seem to have leveled off at about 450% in terms of the increase via previous year. Again, this is one that was starting from a low base. Uh, typically, people were not ordering you know, alcohol online unless it's like a wine club or something. And so that, that's in part why some of these percentages are so high. So some observations at this point is that the trend towards digitalization of freight and shift from brick and mortar online was well underway pre-COVID. Uh, the symbiotic and evolving relationship between in-store and online uh, with essentially digital driving traffic to stores has in a sense been appended. Um, so pre-COVID for instance, uh, 80% of sales were taking place in stores, but then 60% of retail sales were digitally influenced. So while only while e-commerce was only 20%, 60% of retail sales were in some way digitally influenced, and this has to do with uh, getting information online. Um, COVID-19 served as accelerator of online conversion, uh, though a new, you know, a new relationship will emerge between physical and virtual, as Professor Axhausen, Axhausen uh, um, alluded to in terms of a new equilibrium. But mostly retailers that failed to understand the omnichannel rea reality of retail were effectively losers during COVID. Winners were those that had completed the transformation and adapted their supply chains for an effective online strategy. So a lot of what we're going to continue to see in e-commerce is going to be driven by ultimately what these retailers are doing, what the supply side is doing in terms of in, in, a, in a very you know, competitive environment. So here is uh, a, a framework, uh, probably the most important uh, uh, kind of slide here of my, present, my presentation that Professor Sunil Chopra uh, in our Kellogg School of Management has come up with. And essentially it sees two dimension here to explain alternative channels in omni-channel retailing. Um, one dimension is where you get the information about the product that you're purchasing. The other is where you actually get the product. And in terms of 
the information, you can get it face to face uh, or you can get it remotely online. Uh, as I said, this goes back to the uh, sort of digitally influenced retail sales. And in terms of the product itself, you can pick it up there or you can have it uh, delivered. Uh, so uh, traditional retail, of course, is one where you have, you get the information face to face and you pick it up at the store, whereas kind of conventional um, uh, e-commerce is one where you get the information remotely and then you have it delivered. Okay, so that's the other, uh, um, you know, the, the other quadrant. But what's interesting is what's happening with, with, the, with the other two quadrants, namely kind of a showroom with then home delivery and possibly pick up. Both modes are possible. And the other one is online information with pickup. And we've seen this a lot, say, with restaurants, with prepared foods, but we're also seeing it with, the, uh, with many other retailers with curbside pickup and so on, especially if they already had a physical presence. But even entities like Amazon, which did not have that presence, have been uh, also uh, building it by, by acquiring possibly some of these uh, previous uh, retail locations. Okay? Uh, and so if you look at the sort of relative cost of, of these different uh, um, uh, channels, um, you take traditional retail, high inventory costs, high facility costs, but low transportation costs for the retailer and high labor costs. You take the online information plus home delivery, the Amazon model, low inventory, low facilities, high transportation, low labor, then online information with pickup kind of goes from low to medium in some of those, reduces the transport costs, showrooms with home delivery, high transport costs, but relatively uh, lower costs of, uh, of uh, um, inventory and so on. So that's another useful uh, chart for characterizing uh, the supply side of these, um, 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 of these channels. Um, another aspect looking more at the behavior um, is kind of how these channels will compete for products with different uncertainty and demand, where demand is predictable or unpredictable. And then, you know, we don't have much time, so I'm gonna go very quickly over those. You look again at competition for products with different value to weight ratio. Mostly wanna articulate here the factors that affect how these entities will compete, again, in terms of uncertainty and demand of the of the for the product value to weight ratios uh, and information complexity. Uh, the more information complexity, uh, again, you, you then stores can compete on on, on service, uh, but uh, for products that have uh, uncertain or predictable demand. Now, continuing the sort of what the implications might be for behavior. Um, looking, this is an interesting. Um, um, uh, graph here, also from numerator, but if you look at the click and collect part of it on the right, you could see that um, there's an increase, you know, a fairly large number here, 16% who have used click and collect for uh, the first time in the last six months, uh, whereas only 7% did that for online uh, orders. Uh, and so that click and collect um, element is, is um, is, again, it's been an important um, element. All right, so um, this is looking, this is kind of, uh, our, uh, you know, looking at the uh, similar factor that Professor Axhausen looked at in terms of who are uh, the, these um, online shoppers. And you could see that in this post sort of COVID era, 43% were first time buyers. So let me go to uh, my conclusions here. Um, COVID-19, so I'm about to stick in this. COVID-19 crisis introduced many new customers to e-commerce and its convenience. The majority of those will continue using both convenience and price argue in that direction. More important, it reinforces a structural trend already underway where physical retail was losing to online as, and was actively reinventing itself. But nevertheless, experiential elements of the shopping experience are important and will help brick and mortar regain a significant role in overall retailing. But that, again, a trend that was existing previously, they now have to work even harder at it.
Okay. Uh, those of you who are interested in this topic, uh, the Nielsen Company has an interesting white paper uh, looking at what they call the behavioral reset, how people are going to then go from here, um, uh, looking at what happens after this COVID-19 impact in terms of e-commerce, what they call the basket reset, what customers will buy, what they call the home body reset, where consumption will happen, what they call the rationale reset, that is, people who are not uh, traveling, for instance, maybe are seeking luxury items that otherwise they may not acquire. The affordability reset, again, how much consumers will spend. And this is where those, this is where income effects are going to be very significant in terms of how customers will be uh, re uh, responding. And I will, I recommend that you access that through Nielsen because it's a very interesting again, framework for discussing these issues. My final slide is that the, um, there are methodological issues here that are important for us as uh, travel behavior, I, I guess, researchers. Um, the e um, commerce realm is highly dynamic. New players are emerging alongside the giants, and the latter are frequently changing the game Amazon Prime, same day, etc., to stay ahead. Any preferences that we elicit from consumer surveys done at a given time will likely not be stationary under the influence of supply options and changing environment. It is essential to track actual behavior, reveal preferences over time, and there's essentially really limited value for conventional SP in this context, and I know I will get flack over this. Um, the main measure uh, in terms of act actual behavior here is expenditures. That's really the primary measure that's translating actual behavior that's revealed preferences. Um, be uh, in terms of choice dimensions, channel choice is a critical choice dimension that has significant logistics implication and it is essential to jointly understand online information search process, the impact of messaging and channels on e-commerce engagement and behavior. And that needs to be done jointly as we study what people are doing. We, and, and to get that information is not necessarily by asking people, but really getting information directly from the search engines. And this is where the likes of Google uh, have, have a leg up uh, in, in that process. So with that, I conclude, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Hani, for the very informative presentation. Uh, for our audience, if you have any comments or questions, please submit your um, uh, comments or questions through the chat box. Uh, our third speaker today will be Dr. Giovanni uh, Ciotella. He is the Honda Distinguished Scholar for New Mobility Studies and the director of the Three Revolutions Future Mobility Program at the University of California, Davis, and a senior research engineer in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Georgia Institution of Technology. Giovanni is the chair of the TRB Committee on ICT and Travel Choices and a member of the executive board of the International Association for Travel Behavior Research. Okay, so Giovanni, all yours. Thank you very much, Tara. So uh, in this second presentation I'm giving today, I will dive a little bit more into some of our survey findings from our study. Uh, in particular, focusing on uh, uh, some of the implications uh, that uh, our results uh, and our research uh, are having uh, on equity issues. So, uh, as I mentioned in the previous presentation, we have, uh, in, uh, in our study, we have collected a pretty large data, uh, uh, amount of data that was collected with this longitudinal approach. So, we had the data from 2018 and 2019 data, for some of the respondents at least, for those who can build a longitudinal data set. We have done a massive data collection in 2020. We will continue to collect data in the post-COVID-19 world as how things evolve over time. So uh, the three major data sets that we are available, in this presentation, I will mainly focus on the data set L, the longitudinal data on the left, for which we have uh, information for the same respondents from 2018 and 2019 before the pandemic and during the pandemic in 2020, as well as for data set O, which is the large data set we're collecting in the 17 regions in the US and Canada that uh, uh, provide a lot of information about the current behavior now, but also in retrospect, some information from the past. 
So uh, let me dive into some of the issues that are really uh, important to consider when we think about the impact of the pandemic uh, on uh, users, and which is that the pandemic uh, is certainly affecting some users more than others. So some individuals are more affected, and I'm not talking only by health conditions of the uh, potential risk that some groups of the population are exposed, but it also, uh, I'm talking about also uh, economic conditions. So there are certain groups and certain segments of the population that are actually much more exposed uh, to the uh, uh, the impact, the financial impact on the household finances of the pandemic than others. And this the first slide really shows uh, like a summary in the entire sample of how respondents reported that they are concerned about um, <clears throat> They're paying their bills, uh, whether like, you know, really in this time of paying bills is a major struggle all the way to the other extreme, which they're not really worried that much about my monthly bills. And this is something really we need to consider. Sometimes I also get a little bit disappointed when I see things, so for instance, uh, as the stimulus package in the United States that have distributed a check to everybody in the population, uh, not really distinguishing whether somebody lost a job or not. Uh, in my opinion, actually, that check would be much better used in increasing the check for those that are really struggling, while other people that are comfortably working from home, like many of us today that are having this conference call, probably we don't need additional money from the stimulus check because pretty much we're continuing our regular activities just remotely. Just to dive in a little bit more, uh, this slide shows uh, the distribution the, the, the five groups that we saw before from like, you know, major struggle, it's tough to pay bills, it's affordable, but still there is some issues and I'm not worried at all versus income categories. And what we observed is that really the more financial struggle is usually among individuals that live in lower income households. And so towards the top of the, the slide, we can see like, you know, those that live in households with uh, household income, which is uh, uh, below uh, 15,000 or between 15 to 30,000, are much more likely to be in this situation. While actually like, you know, a lot of people in higher uh, income households, they are less worried uh, about paying the bills. Uh, and it's really something that the financial situation is not being affected that much by the COVID-19, either because there was no impact financially or because they have more margin in terms of savings and robustness of their finances that they can actually even deal with temporary unemployment or with the reducing revenues. Um, if we go more into the, uh, the, the, the way the pandemic is affecting uh, individuals, in this slide I want to point attention on our large data so with more than 8,800 respondents, the distribution by household income that we have of all our respondents in our sample. However, when we start sliding about the individuals, they have been reporting that they are currently uh, followed with pay from their previous job. We have some individuals in this category more or less distributed of all, all income groups. But we start moving into those that have been followed without pay. So this is a much more uh, dangerous position, a much more uh, tough condition. We see the individuals in the lower income categories are actually more likely to be in this situation. And when we get into those that actually have been uh, let go by their uh, previous job, we see that predominantly these are people in the lower household income categories. And if you see uh, companies that actually have completely run out of business, and so they pretty much don't work anymore because the company doesn't exist anymore, the restaurant, shop, whatever it was, we see that this group is predominantly people in the lower income categories. So clearly there is an impact that the pandemic is having on lower income households, which is already building on existing inequality because the users in the individuals in these lower income households are more likely to be already subject to more precarious financial condition or have lower amounts of savings and living month to month uh, relying on their salary to pay their bills without having a cash. <clears throat> um, Let's get a little bit more into telecommuting. So in this slide, I'm uh, reporting information about uh, the uh, number of days that somebody was actually uh, physically traveling to work on the left side before the pandemic, and on the right side, 
during the pandemic. As we can see, a lot of people are shifting from a traditional schedule of uh, uh, traveling to work five days or more. Most people, they do it five days, a few do it six days, uh, to pretty much uh, uh, about half of the sample uh, working remotely right now. So physically traveling from work zero days per week. And only a few uh, maintain like you know, their uh, full-time schedule traveling to work five days or more a week. I want to mention this is uh, actually uh, only restricted to the data set of those that still have a job. So we have already removed those that are unemployed or that have lost their job during the pandemic. If we look into like you know, the occupation type and the lower income, the categories of, of income categories of the households, actually we see that some of them are much more likely to be correlated with these things because a lot of these uh, uh, individuals in certain jobs and certain uh, income uh, levels do not have access to the community. So let's dive a little bit more. So in our survey data, we ask whether the nature of the job of somebody really requires them to physically go to work even during the pandemic. And the distribution in the entire sample is somehow like, you know, uh, divided with uh, equal proportion of those that uh, need to go to work or not uh, even during the pandemic. But when we look at the distribution by high, medium, and low income, we see that low income uh, individuals are much more likely to be uh, forced really to go to physically go to work during the pandemic. So second finding, not only people in lower income categories are more likely to have lost their job, which builds already on more precarious situations, but also they have the likelihood of being considered more likely to be considered essential workers and having to work and physically commit to work also during the pandemic. And this slide shows uh, uh, the switch from the previous 2018-2019 data uh, to today during the pandemic using our longitudinal data. Set. So these are actual data from last year versus this year of uh, uh, individuals that are only in the high income categories. And we can see there is a massive shift of people that were not really working entirely from home last year in the past few years to now working from home uh, Many of them, like, you know, five or more days a week and some others only part-time, but really there's been a pretty substantial increase in the number of people that do it. Of course, like, you know, there are some people also that go in the other direction that might do it for other reasons, change a job uh, or other household situation, etc. When we look at the lower income categories, a lot of these individuals actually are in the very opposite situation because they cannot work from home. They are actually like, you know, forced to really commute to work and they, that, uh, that option of teleworking is not really possible for them. So we're looking at a lot of other, uh, uh, other um, uh, characteristics of these respondents and we're developing some other analysis, but I really want to summarize here because I don't have a lot of time some of the findings, because uh, our data, uh, consistently with what others are showing, uh, we are noticing that the pandemic is clearly contributing to further increase equity gaps. Those that were already struggling in the past and now are more likely to have either lost their job or to be uh, actually considered essential workers and having to physical commute even during the pandemic. Not to mention, like, you know, when we look at the mode choice, uh, uh, low income uh, individuals are also less likely many times uh, to be able to switch it to safer modes like commuting by car, for instance. Uh, it's important to mention, like, you know, in our analysis, we have been looking at uh, the number of days that people uh, physically travel to work, and we could not find any statistically significant differences in 2018 and 2019 between high income, low income workers, there was no statistically significant difference in the number of days that commuted to work every week. Now, during the pandemic, there is a statistically significant difference in the number of commuting days between these two income categories. This comes up to the number of other issues that we are observing. So in a couple of papers that with our students at UC Davis we are developing, um, we have been looking at models for e-shopping, and we see that e-shopping is clearly favoring the younger and the more tech-savvy segments of the population with the risk that senior citizens, less educated individuals, and minor members of the minorities not only can be less equipped today to deal with this situation and they have to physically travel to the stores during the pandemic, but also they might be more exposed to suffer the changes in the retail organization if shops shut down and there is more reliance to shopping in the future. In another paper, we're actually modeling changes in long distance travel. And when we look at work business purposes, uh, uh, trips, uh, long distance trips for work business purposes, we notice that actually those in higher paying jobs are more likely to make more trips, for sure, but they also have more discretionary power to limit the number of trips and reduce the number of trips during the pandemic. 
However, lower income workers are more likely to continue to travel. So as a baseline, they travel less long distance, but those that have to do long distance travel for work business reasons are more likely to continue to do it during the pandemic. And let me mention in terms of mode choice, in many cases, this means a lot of car travel, not a lot of high, um, not a lot of uh, uh, flying for lower income workers that need to do long distance travel. So this could be like many different categories of workers. So I will pause here, uh, but I want also to acknowledge all the other members of the research team that make a great contribution as well as our funding agencies and other colleagues contributed to this research. And again, check our website for more information on this study and everything that will come up from the papers we're working on. And I will okay. pause here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, for the wonderful presentation. And our next speaker is uh, Mr. Ali Shamshiripour. He is a PhD candidate at University of Illinois at Chicago. So, Ali, all yours. Um, hello, everyone. Um, let me share my screen first. So, um, um, I'm very pleased to uh, have the opportunity to present the latest status of our research on the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the future of our cities. Uh, this particular study uh, is focused on investigating the effects of the convenience and the distractibility on, of the work environment on the intentions to work from home after the COVID-19 pandemic. Ali, we cannot see your screen. You haven't shared it yet. Oh, really? It's... Um... Is there it shared now? Yeah, it is. So. Okay. Um, a little bit of uh, outline here. Uh, I'll present a brief introduction first, then going over the design of our survey, I'll present the final estimation sample used in this study. After that, I'll present the method and the model structure of, uh, and the results of uh, the model. And in the end, I'll conclude by discussing some of the insights provided by, by our uh, results. Well, um, this viral outbreak is not just a pandemic, as we all know. It's, uh, it, it is very serious, and the uh, current situations may last in the, long, uh, in the long term. So several uh, productive measures have been implemented to contain and slow down the spread of the virus. Um, such preventive actions combined with the sense of personal fear and social responsibility uh, have made remarkable changes in different aspects of people's lifestyles, uh, including uh, working from home, including working as a critical element of our daily life. Recent evidence shows that working from home skyrocketed during the pandemic as many workers have been compelled to stay at home. This should also be backed up uh, with the current uh, countless instances of uh, businesses and companies that have allowed their employees to work from home, even permanently in some cases. Uh, for instance, we can refer to Twitter. Um, this is uh, just one side of the equation, the employers. Uh, but what about the workers' preferences? How they perceive this situation? Are they willing to continue working from home after the pandemic or even those who, have, who were working from home before the pandemic are now willing to reduce the, fr uh, the frequency of uh, working from home? These are the kind of questions that triggered our research here. Uh, the uh, present uh, study that I'm presenting uh, now is set out to investigate the interrelationships between individuals' intentions to work from home in the future, productivity of working from home during the pandemic, and latent factors underlying uh, individual, individual's preferences uh, towards working from home. Um, 
More specifically, we hypothesize that the productivity of working from home during the pandemic, um, it, uh, it uh, mediates the uh, relationship between the latent factors and uh, the preferences for uh, working from home in the future. Uh, towards the goals of this research, we use the data from uh, a recently collected activity travel uh, survey in the Chicago metropolitan area. Uh, this figure is showing uh, the distribution, the spatial distribution of the observations in our sample. Um, well, details of uh, this survey was presented by Professor Mohammadian in the previous session. So for the sake of uh, time limitations. I'll go fast forward to the estimation sample we prepared based on uh, this survey. Um, the original survey has uh, 915 uh, valid observations. Um, in this figure to the right, um, I'm presenting the frequency of working from home before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and during the pandemic in our sample. As can be seen, around 71% of our respondents had not experienced working from home before the pandemic, while 15% uh, were already working from home five days a week or more. Also, around 48% of the respondents reported to be working from home for uh, five days or more during the pandemic. So uh, keeping the data from those who have been working from home during the pandemic and whose frequency of working from home has not decreased, the final estimation sample that we used for our, our model it contains the information of uh, 213 uh, uh, observations. So uh, with regards to the outcome variables of interest, um, we asked those respondents who were telecommuting at the time that, they that the survey was implemented to consider the experience of working from home during the past 14 days and indicate how they compare their productivity while working from home to their productivity of working in their workspace before. The respondents expressed uh, their options, uh, their opinions uh, by choosing among among the categories of a five-point Likert scale question, as, I, as uh, shown here, they could uh, indicate to us that their productivity is significantly lower, lower, similar, higher, or significantly higher. In another question, we also asked respondents to indicate how they prefer to continue working from home if they have the option to do so. While uh, they while uh, and we ask them to assume that the COVID-19 pandemic is no longer a threat. So um, uh, this question was also uh, collected as a five um, point Likert scale. As uh, shown here, in addition to these uh, two components, uh, in order to be able to assess the latent constraint, constructs all underlying the productivity of working from home, we also provided a list of its potential negative and positive aspects and asked the respondents to select the options which apply to them. The items uh, in the list were included based on comprehensive literature reviews, qualitative interviews before finalizing the survey instrument and the results of, the pilot, of uh, several pilots that we ran uh, towards finalizing the survey. So um, moving forward to the hypothesized model, um, it, it has um, three major components, as I mentioned, uh, working from home preferences for the future, productivity of working from home during the pandemic, and uh, two uh, specific latent factors, distractibility and convenience. Um, the convenience of working from home and the underlying distractibility, distractibility drivers, if I want to mention, if I want to be more accurate. And um, we used the generalized structural equation model to um, analyze this 
structure that uh, we hypothesized here. The estimation model is shown here. The boxes on the top and bottom, um, they show the measurement var variables. The overall, the ovals um, show the latent factors. The boxes in yellow show the outcome variables and the boxes to the left show the uh, observed exogenous variables included in the model. So um, let's for now uh, first focus on the validity of the hypothesized model structure. So um, as shown, the null, null hypothesis could be rejected at 95 and 99 percent confidence uh, levels. So uh, the estimated model confirms the hypothesized structure. And according to the results, higher convenience levels are associated with higher levels of productivity while working from home. Higher uh, levels of distractibility are associated with lower levels of productivity while working from home. And higher levels of productivity while working from home is associated with higher levels of um, intentions towards working from home in the future. So uh, moving to the results, um, the results indicate that those who live alone are more expected to perceive working from home as a convenience activity, presumably because they can create a uh, convenient workspace at home more easily as compared to those who live with others. Um, also, we found that those who reported that they had never worked from home before the pandemic, uh, what we call uh, new telecommuters here, are more expected to perceive working from home as a convenient experience. This is, this is um, intuitive given the fact that the, um, traveling to the workspace involves spending time on the sometimes stressful task of driving waiting on the transit stations or other aspects of travel which could potentially link it to a, a negative utility. Um, we also found that those who are the new telecommuters are observed to have lower productivity uh, when working from home as compared to their workspace. Um, this is uh, also understandable given the fact that those who have been always commuting to their workspace and have no working from home experience may find it challenging to uh, break their long term habits, uh, which are uh, generally more resistant to change. Um, yeah, and um, Furthermore, we also found that frequent telecommuters who have been working from home since before the pandemic started uh, before the pandemic are more likely to perceive their homes as being convenient for uh, working from home. This, is, this also makes sense given that uh, the home environment of such individuals is more likely to be uh, prepared for the working from uh, home situations as compared to those who recently started uh, working at their homes. Moving to the results uh, of the distractibility uh, factor, uh, per the results, members of extremely low income households are more prone to uh, elevated levels of distractibility. Previous research provides concrete evidence on the significant role of anxiety in the levels of distractibility. The effect of household income found in our study, therefore, could be attributed to the economic uh, concerns of such extremely low income families uh, as uh, presented by uh, Dr. Mohammedian um, in uh, his uh, presentation. But um, moving forward, to the um, to those who live alone in their families, as expected, 
um, they are uh, expected to have lower distractibility levels, which could be attributed to lower distractions at home since they are uh, the only person who lives in the household uh, and no one else is around. Um, more on the note of uh, household composition and the uh, uh, workability of the home environment. Having enough bedrooms in home is associated with lower distractibility levels, probably due to the fact that such homes facilitate avoiding uh, attentional disruptions. So, um, as a, in order to conclude uh, my presentation, uh, based on the results, we can suggest home workability as a key factor to be considered in future research concerning the productivity of working from home. According to the results, telecom users are significantly more productive if their home office provides them with comfortable, energetic, and dedicated workspaces, which could help them avoid unwanted attentional disruptions. Based on the results and uh, given the recent countless instances of businesses and companies um, allowing their employees to work from home, we can also expect potential shifts in people's perceptions towards their residential location choice and therefore suggest home workability also as a key factor to be considered in future residential location uh, search, searches and researches. The potential uh, residential relocation trends together with the shift of preferences towards working from home also suggests the importance of uh, updating the uh, current policy evaluation tools relying on the models of either of these two components of travel behavior. Such policy evaluation tools include uh, the activity-based models, such as the model that uh, our team has been uh, working on for a while, uh, for a long time actually, uh, the agent-based dynamic activity planning and traveling uh, and travel scheduling uh, framework, uh, or uh, in short, ADAPT. Um, these are uh, highly flexible, um, policy evaluation tools and uh, it's critical to keep them um, as accurate as they need to be. So with this, I conclude uh, my, uh, in, uh, my presentation. Thank you for your attention and um, for further information, you can uh, contact um, my advisor, Professor Mohammadian, um, here uh, through this email or his personal web page on the uh, UIC, uh, which is shown here. Uh, and uh, um, on the code here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ali, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, we have some very interesting discussion in the chat box now. So if our speakers are available now, uh, please, um, try to answer some of these questions or comments in the chat box. We're also going to discuss these questions during our Q&A session. Okay, so uh, the last speaker of today's uh, session two will be me. Uh, I'm Kara Wang, Associate Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And today I'm going to talk about um, our research on impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on travel and teleactivities using survey data collected from the U.S. All right. So although we know pandemic has caused significant behavior changes in a very short period of time, Many changes actually started way before pandemic. Uh, one important trend in the past decade is the rise of online activities and home deliveries. Uh, we see traveler flows, communication flows, and freight flows, they have co coexisted for a while. But now we want to know how the pandemic has changed their relationship and whether or not such changes will continue in the future. So with these questions in mind, we uh, implemented two rounds of surveys in the US. Uh, these surveys were implemented through Amazon and Turk. So every respondent uh, is compensated 
uh, once their responses have passed our quality check. And the first round of data collection was conducted in May and the second in June. Um, so these two uh, waves of data collection have led to 1,163 observations. Uh, we also checked the data line by line uh, for validity. And after cleaning, 938 observations remain. And at this point, we are revising and updating our uh, survey questionnaire. And we are ready to implement the next wave of data collection. So the purpose of the data collection was for us to keep tracking the uh, changing behavior of the residents in the US and then also try to have more observations in the underrepresented groups. I also want to mention that uh, the two waves of survey that we have already implemented, the first round was distributed randomly and the second round was implemented in multiple stages. Uh, we purposely did this so that we can target at the more underrepresented groups. And overall, the resulted sample, size, sample is pretty representative of the population distribution. Um, but we also compared the distribution with the population distribution and created weights. Um, so all the following analysis are based on the weighted sample. Let me first start from an overview of the travel patterns that we found from the um, surveys. So one question we asked the respondents was, uh, how many times do you visit the following destinations in a month? So by uh, the wording of that question, you can tell that rather than trip frequency, we probably should really uh, define this as the tour frequency. It's uh, the number of visits per month, uh, but we just call it trip uh, to be consistent with uh, most regular people's understanding. Uh, so people indicate the number of trips they uh, make every month before pandemic and during pandemic, and then the number of trips they expect uh, that they were they are going to make after pandemic. For example, the first line work, the blue bar is before pandemic. The average is 13.4 per month, and the orange one is during pandemic 5.4, and then the gray one is after pandemic 12.3. And then we also calculated the changes um, during pandemic as compared to the before condition. We also calculated the changes. Uh, after pandemic, as people expect, compared to the before condition. So for work, for working trips, the changes will be uh, during pandemic, uh, the working trip frequency reduced by 60%. And then after pandemic, people expect their working trip frequency will have uh, still 8.2% uh, of decrease as compared to the before condition. So overall, we see uh, when we uh, add up all the trips to different destinations, we see the overall people's travel frequency during pandemic uh, has decreased by 66.8%. And then after pandemic, people still expect about 5.5% reduction. So almost go back to normal condition or before condition, but uh, with some slight decrease. And another way that I'd like to look at this data is to put all these numbers onto this chart. So on this chart, we have two dimensions. The horizontal axis will indicate the changes during pandemic as compared to the before condition. So the changes of travel frequency as compared to the before condition. As we can see, the numbers range from negative 100% to negative 30%. So that is for all types of travel. We see a overboard, across the board, a reduction during pandemic. And the left, uh, side will, will be the uh, types of activities that experience more reduction. The vertical axis is changes after pandemic as compared to the before condition. So these values range between negative 30% to positive 30%. So going up, it will be positive numbers or increase. Going down, it's negative numbers or decrease. So that is depending on the types of activities, the travel frequency after pandemic, some will decrease, some will increase. So then 
Remember last slide, I said overall travel frequency reduced by 66.8% during pandemic, and then is expected to reduce by still by 5.5% after pandemic. So in other words, here. This is the changes during pandemic 66.8 and after pandemic is 5.5% decrease. So this, these two gray bars indicate the average. And then we can plot the travel frequency by different types of activities here. Um, the first one is working trips. Uh, in addition to the location, another dimension of information is the size of the bubble. So for work, the location says the working trip will be reduced by 60% during pandemic as compared to before and reduced by 8.2% after pandemic as compared to before. In terms of size, uh, average working trip frequency is 13.4 before pandemic. So the size indicates the before pandemic frequency. So we use the same logic and then we plot all the working trip uh, all the um, trip frequency of different types of activities on this chart. And then we have some interesting findings. So in general, all these bubbles can be grouped into these four quadrants. This, this first one here, um, there is something in common. So these are trips to uh, work and then trips to convenience stores, trips to grocery stores. So these uh, bubbles, they have um, the horizontal axis, they are on the right side, meaning they have only experienced moderate reduction during pandemic. And they're also on the negative side of the vertical dimension. So that means they're going to continue the reduction after pandemic. And um, so uh, the size of these bubbles are relatively large. That means people still have um, great needs for the physical activities of these types. Now, this group, this one, they are on the left lower corner, meaning during pandemic, these activities have experienced significant reduction. And then after pan pan pandemic, we can continue to uh, expect that there will be some reduction after pandemic. And then their size is small. So overall, uh, physical activities or travel needs for these activities are relatively small. Um, so there are flexible needs for the physical travel. And then this group. So this group is on the left, meaning a uh, significant reduction during pandemic, and then upper corner, meaning we can expect some rebounds after pandemic. So these are the types of activities that um, once everything settles, people want to get back to normal or they want still want more physical activities. So people have strong needs for physical activities. The teleactivities or online activities are not enough to meet people's needs. These are, you can see, uh, trips to airports for entertainment activities, for recreational activities, to retail stores, and to friends. So those types of discretional activities or um, leisure and social activities. And the last one is this corner here. So this one, in terms of during pandemic change, it's very moderate. Uh, people's trip to medical facilities cannot be reduced much, even though it's during pandemic, it's not safe to visit those uh, facilities, people still need to go. And then it's also on the upper corner, meaning after pandemic, people also expect a strong rebounds. And so overall, we can uh, conclude that trips to medical facilities are not very elastic. Actually, people have very strong needs for physical travel or physical activities, and teleactivities are not enough to meet people's needs uh, for medical service. So after the overview of the travel activities, let me move on to the overview of teleactivities. First, starting from working. Of all the respondents, and we focus on the people who are employed, and out of people who are employed, 75% of people say they expect their employers to allow work from home after pandemic. And then out of people who are employed, 65% say they want to work from home after pandemic, regardless of uh, their employer, employer's uh, decisions. 
So overall intersection of these two groups lead to 53% of all employed uh, sample saying that believing that they are going to work from home to some extent. So for these 53% of the sample, this is the distribution of the work from home frequency that they indicated. Uh, the first bar is for before pandemic, the second for during, and the third for after. And from the bottom uh, to the top are always working from home and then work from home for at least three days per week and then one to two days per week and then more than once per month but less than one per week. So the orange one is I never work from home. So if we only focus on or sum up the percentages for people who claim they work at least one day from uh, per week from home, you see before pandemic, this percentage is 32.9%, during pandemic, 63.3%, and after is 475 So obviously during pandemic, there is a huge increase in terms of percentage of people who can work from home. And then after pandemic, people are going sort of back to the before condition. Uh, another uh, part of information that we can observe from here is during pandemic, people, when people work from home, most of them work full time from home. But after pandemic, although the percentage of work from home is still high, a lot of them only work from home uh, for part of the time. Okay, we also asked how many hours per week do you spend on the following activities online? Uh, online entertainment, online social, online education or tele-education, telemedicine, and then the other online business services. Similarly, we also compared the changes bef uh, of during pandemic compared to the before condition and after pandemic compared to the before condition. And then we also put it on a similar chart, still horizontal line for changes during pandemic in terms of percentage. Vertical is for changes after pandemic during um, in terms of percentage. And uh, the gray bars are the uh, average. So obviously there are three groups in terms of teleactivities. This group, telemedicine and teleeducation, they are on the upper corner, right upper corner. So that means these group of teleactivities have increased, uh, dramatic increase both during and after pandemic. So obviously these are new behavior largely adopted during pandemic and then the effects will continue, but although it will diminish a little bit after pandemic. Okay. And then the middle group here, online social. So uh, in terms of size, the size is bigger than teleeducation and telemedicine. So that means people have strong need for such activities. And um, the increase during pandemic is moderate. So that means this is new behavior for some, but not all people during pandemic. And then the effects also will continue, but diminish after pandemic. And the last one, online entertainment and online service. So the increase during and after pandemic are both minimal. Um, but the size of the bubbles are big. So people have a high demand for online entertainment and online business service, but these type of teleactivities have already been widely adopted before pandemic. So the impacts of pandemic are limited on these types of activities. Now, after the uh, these standard questions, we also asked people, um, any activities that you would like to do remotely that you cannot currently do? So we use this, uh, um, uh, work cloud to show the most frequent identified keywords. Um, job and work, um, we can see from here. So some people cannot work from home and they want to have the opportunity of work from home. And then followed by that would be shopping and friends. Again, people have high needs for social and leisure activities. And then all the other words, um, I can say it's distributed everywhere. We see sports, concerts, we see movies, and we also see MLB. Okay. And then we also want to put the travel and teleactivity side by side to see what's the relationship between the physical activities and the online activities. Do they have sort of the substitution effect or complementation or induction? So first, working side by side. Le left side is the working trips before, during, and after pandemic. Okay. The right side is percentage of workers who claim they can work from home for at least one day per week before, during, and after pandemic. What we can see from here is during pandemic, 
the working trip has a 60% reduction or 59.1% reduction. And the percentage of workers work from home has a 30% increase. So working trip and remote working may substitute each other. And then after pandemic, working trips will be less frequent after pandemic, but only slightly by 10%. And then we're going to see um, still a 17% increase will, uh, of work from home percentage will remain. So that means people will continue to work from home, but again, most of them probably will just work part of the time after pandemic. For social activities, same thing, left side for travel activities, right side for online activities, online social activities by hours. So if we do the side by side comparison, we can see the reduction in social trips can be somewhat compensated by online social activities during pandemic. The interesting thing is we see both sides experience, will experience increase after pandemic. So that means people's social needs may be increased or at least they believe so. And then after pandemic, people increase both physical and online social activities. And then in terms of entertainment, we can also do this sort of side by side comparison. And similarly, we find increase of online entertainment hours is not that much, so less than a decrease of entertainment trips. So people's needs for entertainment are suppressed. And then not surprisingly, after pandemic, we see people will try to go back to their before condition. So people's entertainment needs are quite stable and pandemic will not cause any long-term changes to people's needs or uh, people's needs for entertainment activities. Uh, uh, all the previous speakers also discussed the impacts of different social economic factors on people's activities during pandemic and after pandemic. We did similar analysis. We analyzed the impacts of factors ranging from individual factors or household characteristics, regional characteristics, and transportation uh, conditions. Uh, limited by time, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, some interesting research that we're currently conducting is we're trying to link the respondent uh, location uh, information. So our respondent all give share their uh, zip code information. We're trying to link this to the local pandemic statistics and we want to see uh, how the pandemic condition will influence people's behavior. Okay, I just want to show one, the impact of commuting time. So if we do, again, the side-by-side -side comparison, left is working trip, the right side is remote working percentage for commuters work from home for at least one day from uh, per week. Blue line, the before condition, we can see before pandemic, working trip frequency are almost the same, regardless of how long people need to commute. And during, we see people travel longer, tend to reduce more trips and are more likely to work from home. So this, uh, difference has been uh, enlarged. And then after pandemic, the after condition is telling from the, the trend, the after condition is similar to the before condition, and but with universal reduction in terms of travel and a universal re increase in terms of percentage of work from home. So the main takeaway is commuting time has slight to moderate effect on people's choice between commuting and remote working. During pandemic, this difference is amplified. In long term, however, the effect of pandemic will diminish and the difference caused by commuting time remains low to moderate. So final conclusions. Uh, there are needs for physical versus teleactivities. The needs for physical and uh, teleactivities differ by the nature of activities. And then travel needs for discretional activities are stable, even with wider adoption of teleactivities. And uh, um, because after pandemic, we see more people are going to work from home part of the time. So there could be opportunity to foster staggered working days uh, with this increasing work from home rate to try to reduce the congestion. And then finally, changes in physical and teleactivities also depend on many social uh, demographic features. And then our policy measures need to consider all these factors. And then I also want to acknowledge the support uh, of the following uh, centers, our site, uh, VREF, and then the, our VREF uh, COE for Sustainable Urban Freight and System. With that, I'm going to end uh, my presentation. And then now we are going to take questions from uh, our audience. Okay, thank you. 
All right, so since I'm also the moderator, I need to figure out what I should do now. So first thing, I guess I will stop sharing. Okay, figure out how to do that. Okay, and we have some questions here. I will start from first uh, questions to our individual speakers. Um, so the first one, Yan Tao forwarded me a question from Pratik Bensal that was sent, I believe, to uh, Kai. And then he asked, I am assuming authors used choice experiments to obtain VDTS estimates. Does not the delivery time choice is more of a semi compensatory choice with cutoffs? Are authors accounting for attribute cutoffs in the estimation as well as in the experiment? Uh, it is SP experiments, you're right. Uh, with regards to the cutoffs, we didn't allow the, the participants not to choose. So they couldn't say, we will not buy anything, which would give us an indication of a cutoff or an unacceptable length of the, of the delivery time. Uh, so in that spirit, we haven't really looked at the cutoff conditions where things are just unacceptable. Okay, thank you, Kai. And then the next question uh, from Richard Young uh, to, I believe, Ali, he has a question on the, um, uh, let me see, on the path analysis regarding how new telecommuter uh, will perceive, uh, will change the productivity and then consequently the work from, probability of work from home. Uh, his question is, it seems that lines two and three seem to contradict each other. I, I'm not sure if you remember that slide, Ali. So you have two lines, both indicate telecommuters, but they have opposite effects. So, Ali. Uh, yes. Um... The line two is uh, the indirect effect on productivity through the convenience of working from home as perceived by the uh, workers. So this indirect effect is, is a uh, positive effect uh, indicating that uh, those who are experiencing working from home for the first time uh, are more likely to consider their new uh, working environment as being convenient um, um, which makes sense uh, given the convenience of homes in general. Um, so this indirect effect is a positive effect in this sense, but but there is also a there is also an indirect effect. Sorry, there is also a direct effect um, uh, through not through convenience, but uh, directly to the productivity. This is a negative effect, meaning that uh, those who are tel uh, experiencing telecommuting from for the first time, these workers are generally having a, a lower level of uh, productivity. This also makes sense given the probability of the uh, probability of experience playing a role here. Those who are experiencing the productivity, uh, experiencing telecommuting for the first time are less likely to have uh, skills of uh, working from home, to have their home environment prepared for working from home and etc. So um, these two effects, uh, the indirect effect and the direct effect, in my opinion, they both make sense. But um, we do need to have a, a overall effect also, which I, uh, for the sake of um, time saving, I uh, couldn't uh, cover. But the, uh, the overall effect is also negative, according to our analysis, um, indicating that um, those who have been experiencing working from home for the first time are generally less likely to have uh, productive uh, experiences during the pandemic as, as, or better to say, as productive as uh, the old tele telecommuters or better to say, continuing telecommuters. 
Okay, thank you, Ali. Mm -hmm. And then I also have a question from Hani to me. <laughs> so, wouldn't it be more interesting to look at a change in conditional work trip frequency given the person continue to work, go to work, that is, essential worker, instead of taking the average uh, over all users? Uh, the distribution is clearly bimodal. Uh, for essential workers, non-essential workers. I think this, this is a great question. And then I think I should clarify that when I show the overview uh, of the travel patterns, the average numbers are for the entire sample. But when I do the side-by-side -side comparison for working trip frequency and the percentage of work from home, it's only for the employed people. So only the workers. And then uh, indeed, the essential versus non-essential workers, they have very different trend. I actually, due to the time constraint, I hide, I earlier, I hide this, uh, this slide, but I have it here, this one. So this is the working to versus percentage of work from home for essential versus non-essential workers. So we can see the essential workers generally make more working trips than non-essential uh, even before the pandemic, and then the reduction is uh, moderate. So essential workers make only 36%, 0.4% less of trips, but non-essential workers, they have a dramatic decrease during pandemic. And then after pandemic, we can still see this trend continues. And then essential workers cannot reduce working trips as much as basically non-essential workers. Exactly, and I think it's important to, to distinguish between, between the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah so that's I agree. What I was missing, I guess, with this slide, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And then, um, See next one. Uh, okay. Oh, I have a question from Pat also to me. Did the work from home include overtime work from home? That is check <laughs> checking email after normal work hours, or was it required to be instead of the conventional commute? No, we didn't consider the uh, overtime work from home is as long as people feel they are working at that hour is considered working. And then I do agree that during pandemic, uh, we have a lot of overtime work from home, and it's probably something we should consider in the follow-up studies. Um, I think uh, we have another question for you. Mm -hmm. It's from Sky Guo that um, she wonders, um, it is surprised to see there is 12.6% increase in airport delivery visits before and after the pandemic. I think it's mm. the first bar chart. Like, you have yes. Any explanation? explanation? Yeah. Yeah, um, I actually, I don't feel surprised at all. I don't know how other speakers feel. The 12.6% increase uh, that people expect after pandemic as compared to the before pandemic. Um, my, um, my understanding is first, we are asking for people's expectation or their desire. So people do not really have as, Hani also mentioned in his presentation, at this point, people's stated preference has limited value. So there is a lot of uncertainty on what actually they will do after pandemic. If we're just talking about their expectation or desire, I think this is totally understandable. People have suppressed their needs or for the leisure types of activities for the long distance travel. And then it's being suppressed for months and then they want to do it. They are trying to envision in the beautiful future when the pandemic is no longer a problem, they want to travel more. So I think this is understandable. But when you, uh, at, when you look at the numbers in the Swiss PPS track, you don't see any increase in activities being undertaken. Now clearly we're not yet completely out of the pandemic, but mm. there wasn't really a pent up demand which materialized miraculously. Mm -hmm. But I also think, Cara, there's a there's a, a question whether there is a true expectation about uh, the future behavior. The other thing is uh, about the measurement tool, because the way some people, some respondents might interpret uh, the, uh, the, the the question or report to their intention, it might be actually compared to their current behavior during the pandemic, and so it's pretty expectable that somebody will have uh, an increase to 
cons- compared to the current behavior in long distance travel and trips to airports, uh, where like you know if you are measuring like you know trips compared to what was the behavior before the pandemic, it might be very different. Uh, most likely, like you know the, the the total might be in line with what was before or slightly below. But if many respondents interpret the question as compared to now. And sometimes, especially in a survey, some respondents might actually read in, in a rush the question and answer. There might be actually a measurement issue more than a true uh, finding in, in terms of the expected behavior. Related to that, Cara, how much did you pay your Mechanical Turk respondents? A, this uh, survey is about 20 minutes long, and then each uh, will receive $5. Yeah, that's not too bad. Yeah. And uh, let's see if we have more questions here. Um, and then this question is to Ali. How did you compute the sample size and how the results with the sample size could be validated? Um, we, um, as I mentioned, the, um, the Overall uh, data, it contains 915 sample uh, observations. But the sample that we prepared for this particular study out of that uh, overall sample is, it contains only 213 individuals. These are the individuals who have been working during the pandemic, they have not lost their jobs. And also they have been uh, working from home as I mentioned, over 50% of our sample were indicated to us that they have not been working from home even during the pandemic, which also uh, makes sense um, according to the Brookings Institution, the overall statistic that they have for the US in general, which is also 50%. Um, So uh, cutting all these uh, observations that were not relevant to our study, the uh, final sample was um, um, around 200, oh, not around, uh, exactly 213 observations. Okay, thank you, Ali. Mm-hmm. Um, so we are now this uh, 131 East time zone, or we are at the time that we should end this uh, session. Uh, Carlos, I also want to have your input. Uh, should in this case, should we extend the session a little bit? Well, if we can, if if there are more questions, if you want to actually have a discussion, we have till twelve forty-five for for the next thirty minutes. Uh, okay. The next session starts. We have the room. We have the actually just uh, Zoom session, so we can continue, or just if we're done, we can actually just have people to stretch and just ready for that. But again, this is an online um, conference, so people can. Get in, get out, you know, use a bathroom break, stretch anytime they want. So nobody can, nobody watches them. <laughs> okay. So I guess then I will take the advantage to uh, extend this session a little bit by asking uh, one or two more questions that I really want to ask. Number one is, um, I see a lot of our presentations talk about the survey, the data we collected, and the importance of collecting more data after pandemic. I, but I also want to ask, in addition to data collection, uh, how will our research framework change? So the methodological uh, aspect and theories, do you see any changes or new needs for that track? And this is to all our speakers. If I may, I think that clearly this talk discussion about shopping and e-commerce has made it clear that transport professionals need to spend much more attention to the income constraint. Uh, as David Hencher has pointed out, all the costs we incur at some point become onerous. And clearly the analysis on the low income households in the US makes it clear that very quickly small changes make life unaffordable to households. I think we need to put that much more strongly into our discussion and also be much more careful about capturing both travel as well as expenditure at the same time. 
Uh, I will uh, add to what Kai said. Uh, I think there are clearly some uh, uh, some assumptions and some findings uh, from the theory from the past. Uh, they are questioned today. Uh, I will mention two, for example. Uh, one was uh, the relationship between uh, e-shopping and physical uh, uh, trips. Uh, a lot of the research before the pandemic has shown that uh, even if the amount of money and the volume of sales increase substantially uh, online, the contribution of e-shopping to reducing physical travel was not that much. Now, if this is a systematic change, this could question the finding because especially if there is a permanent change in the land use and the retail structure, we might actually have our being presence of something that changes uh, uh, more in the future. Uh, another uh, finding from the past uh, was related to uh, telecommuting. Uh, already 20, 30 years ago, there were great expectations about telecommuting to save uh, uh, the world, reduce traffic congestion, uh, reduce like, you know, the dependence, uh, reliance on car, and all the environmental issues of transportation, and we all know how it ended up. Uh, TDM strategies that were focused on uh, telecommuting didn't really to bring to the, the results that we expected, and uh, telecommuting only uh, represented a limited uh, portion of trips uh, and not a substantial reduction in travel. Now, are we in presence of, of uh, a huge reduction, a huge change, a shift uh, in the way the society is organized? And that is not a uh, thing that uh, our uh, research community should uh, analyze. And then I, I think there are big policy implications. Uh, I'm skipping the methodologies because probably many of the methodologies we used in the past, we can still use them today. But uh, there are big policy implications and things that are becoming even more important. One of these is on equity. Clearly, the pandemic is exacerbating some trends in society with the increasing gap between social classes and with some members of our society struggling many more than others. And I don't want to repeat myself, but many times we call our sample representatives. I really insist that we need to be careful about that because even if we do our best to match social demographics of the population, even if we weight the results to represent the distribution in the population, still a lot of these studies, especially based on online surveys, are not truly representative of the population simply because we don't include at all certain members of the society those that don't have access to the internet, those that are struggling the most. And so in many cases, we really don't include some people, like those that are uh, more likely to use uh, food banks, those that are really losing their home, that simply are not answering our survey. They don't even have an internet connection in many cases. And we need to think about that because when we turn our results for research and policy, it's uh, an important point, I think. Yeah. If I may add, um, I see actually you asked Kara about our methodologies, and I see four fundamental gaps, I would say, if not uh, flaws in how we're approaching things uh, in some ways, uh, or the way that we have traditionally approached uh, these problems in the behavioral community. One is what I, uh, I guess the strong point that I made, it's about the supply side. In all of these problems, it is not simply the employee who's deciding. I mean, in telecommuting, long time ago, framework for telecommuting is there's an employee, there's an employer. You know, you have to have a pro program on offer and then empl employees will choose. And of course, employee preferences can influence what employers do, but it's a two-way process. Looking at what people say they will do, not considering what they can do is extremely, I mean, is, is, a, is a, I think a major um, limitation in that regard. Same with e-commerce. You know, we may want certain things, uh, but but we have to see how the cost of that is going to work out. Whether there's a business model for somebody to provide it, etc., etc., etc. And I think in virtually every area of teleactivity, uh, there is a supply side that is critical. Whether it's e-gaming, whether it's e-sports, whether it's telehealth, whether it's you know, in all of these arenas, the supply side is at least as important as the demand side, as the behavior side. And looking at one without the other is, is missing a key part of the equation. The second one, I think, is what we are measuring as the so-called our dependent variable. You know, our, our, our revealed preference uh, in many of these areas should be what you spend. Either it's the money that you spend, expenditures on e-commerce, or it's the time that you spend on various activities. 
frequency is not as important, I think, as looking at time, you know, the, the time that you commit. That's what's, that, you know, these are the most reliable, I think, um, expenditure variables uh, and the, the, where the preferences are revealed is through the money you spend, the time that you spend. Um, the third element, I think, in as we are looking at all of these activities, looking at it independently of the online engagement, that is information search, is missing a key dimension for us behaviorally. Uh, it's not where I shop, it's where I get the information to shop. Uh, it's, uh, as I'm working, um, it is not the fact that I'm necessarily sit sitting, you know, behind the, the screen. You know, we, we did a lot of remote work before. We did it remotely from our office. You know, we, we wrote papers, we submitted them online to a journal. That too was remote work. So what is important to understand where things will go is the information engagement, the information interaction with the activity, uh, and, you know, itself. So, so uh, you know, the, the search, the information search, the uh, um, information engagement process is very important to this. And the fourth element goes to the constraints. Uh, the, the constraints um, that, uh, that, that, that Kai alluded to with, with income and, clear, and the very quick framework that, I, that, that Nielsen had formulated for how people are reacting sort of longer term post COVID, the separation by income constraint versus those who have discretionary income is striking. It's really, really important. Uh, and I think Giovanni in his work also showed the whole sort of unemployment, losing your salary, et cetera, as being very critical elements of the response um, that will probably have um, a kind of a longer um, um, impact there as well. So um, fifth, I think there is a behavioral motivation here element that is, critical. Uh, there is a human nature kind of thing. And I think your survey, Cara, tried to illustrate some of that, that people want more entertainment, want that, and so on. But I, we've tended to approach this in a somewhat superficial way, or, you know, again, when, when we ask the questions, we're not fully probing. Uh, and I think uh, marketing folks have tried to understand this better than us travel behavior people. And I think we need to learn from that, uh, you know, from that side, because behavior under pandemic is not normal, is not sort of normal behavior. It is stressful behavior. It is, it has many other dimensions psychologically that we're not fully accounting for. And I think will help us understand what might happen after. So that's my, 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 my five points. Okay, thank you, Hani. To follow up with your, uh, your points, I see in the chat box, uh, one comment and question. Honey, important point about understanding supply side. Is anyone in the transportation research space collecting data about employer plans for future telework options? Anyone has started working on the supplier side analysis? I've seen it in broader industry uh, sort of side. I mean, I mean, there's various companies that are tracking that kind of information. Uh, I'm, I do not know, um, know of a survey of employers at this point that a transportation person has done, but there's certainly others uh, in other areas that are, that are very closely looking at that. But at this point, it's all very up in the air because you have announcements, you have then translations into actions. Okay, some consultants have said, okay, everybody can work from home, but there hasn't been really any discussions of the salary implications of how the home offices are funded and on and on. There's plenty of questions which are all around this working from home, which haven't been sorted out. And certainly in, in Europe, there's lots of questions around labor rights and union representation. So it hasn't really been detailed in any form. From what I know in Northern California, the San Francisco um, Bay Area Council of Economic Activity, so they are serving the important employers that are in the San Francisco Bay Area, which includes some of the largest tech industries and a lot of other companies, uh, about their expectations about uh, teleworking policies and also expectations about uh, uh, use of office space, because that will have a huge implication for real estate also in terms of like, you know, amount of space of per worker but, that is needed. But do you believe that Google after their, or Apple after they have built themselves these palaces will let them stand, em stand empty? No, but I also believe that when they hire new people, 
they might actually not grow the office space at the same proportionally to the number of employers because they might actually use space a little bit more in a more optimal way, especially in very high expensive places like Zurich or San Francisco. The other possibility could be for companies that have multi-site locations that might optimize better location in terms of the distribution of their workforce in multiple spaces uh, if there is more encouragement to telework. But I agree with you, they will not completely uh, give up the physical office space. Okay. There's been surveys Sorry. that real estate companies have been doing as well uh, related, related to that, but it's all, as Guy said, it's very speculative at this point, and it ignores a lot of fact, factors that will soon come uh, hitting at, 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 at these companies when they start seeing worker productivity go down, when they see there's no mentoring, when they see all sorts of uh, things, uh, you know, innovation decreasing, etc. Okay, sorry, limit by time. I think we'll have to end our session here. I really enjoyed today's session and I hope you too. And I want to thank all the speakers today here again. And then also I want to thank all the audience for uh, your attention. And then with that, I think uh, our host will take over to move on to the next section. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Well, Sybil, you are in charge. All right. Wonderful. Um, so see, the chat box is already completely full, right? Because we're not refreshing the chat box, uh, which means that it's going to be difficult for me to navigate it. But it's it's wonderful to have everyone here. Uh, I kind of feel bad because the, the, so many people are attending. They're not. They don't get a single break. You no know, tiny break to be able to uh, you know take a break or something. But uh, but we'll move on. And not only are we going to move on to conference, we're going to move on post COVID. Um, so now the COVID is over. Um, the title of the the session is uh, simply post COVID nineteen pandemic, and we have three uh, presentations for you right now. So we had four scheduled. Unfortunately, one of the speakers. Uh, works in the national lab and did not get approval from the Department of the of Energy. Um, that said, we have three amazing presentations. Um, similar to the other sessions, we're going to go for 20-minute talks, 10-minute presentations. Uh, sorry, let me, correct, let me correct, correct that. We have four presentations. We used to have five. Now we are down to four. Oh, sorry. No, so, yeah, indeed. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, the, the, the agenda was updated uh, too quickly. And I just, I just you know, quickly looked at it. Um, and we're going to start right now with, with Joe. I know Joe is there. I could see Joe before. Uh, Joe Chow. Um, so Joe is going to tell us about the impact of COVID-19 uh, behavioral inertia on reopening strategies for New York City transit. So it's going to be, it's going to be you know, a, a lot of fun uh, to hear. And I know Joe knows, knows a lot about it. Uh, let me first introduce Joe a little bit. So Joe is a uh, professor and the deputy director of C2 Smart at uh, New York University. Uh, he's also in the Department of Civil Engineering, Civil and, and Urban Engineering with various applications at the Center for Urban Science and Progress and the Rudin Center. Uh, his research interest lies in emerging mobility services and travel behavior informatics. And he chairs the TRB Joint Subcommittee on Wood Choice and uh, Spatial Temporal Behavior. And he's also the cluster chair for the Transportation Science and Logistics Society at Infor. So Joe has tons of experience. And I'm sure you know, you're know you all with me and you're all dying to hear more about his thoughts about post-COVID. So Joe, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Sybil. <clears throat> uh, so uh, thanks for having me uh, to give a talk today. Um, so this is uh, some work that we've been doing here at uh, NYU at C2Smart uh, University Transportation Center. Um, since the uh, outbreak of COVID, as many of you know, uh, New York City has been uh, the, uh, an epicenter uh, in, in the US. And so we, uh, we've allocated some resources uh, over time to uh, do a couple of things related to, to COVID-19, uh, trying to understand and monitor uh, the, uh, the uh, travel, travel patterns uh, over time, uh, where we have built uh, together a dashboard to look, at, uh, look into this. Uh, we've uh, restarted we conducting a survey as well. Uh, uh, and it's interesting to see the prior sessions where uh, people have been looking at some of the uh, uh, surveys and data collected from that. So uh, we would love to uh, uh, follow up with some of those speakers later on. Uh, and uh, on my end, uh, we've also been uh, looking at conducting a modeling exercise, um, but primarily, uh, so we developed this uh, uh, citywide uh, multi-agent simulation, uh, MATSIM, as many of you are familiar with, uh, for New York City, uh, just prior to uh, 
uh, the outbreak of COVID. And so we thought it would be a very good opportunity to uh, just apply it to uh, as a quick response type of uh, uh, um, modeling exercise to uh, uh, just get some insights on, uh, uh, on the COVID situation, on how people are traveling during COVID, and to try to see if we can extrapolate some of that behavior uh, to the uh, 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 to, to the reopening scenarios, right? So, so kind of the I call it uh, behavioral inertia, but uh, uh, earlier Hani mentioned uh, uh, stickiness, right? Uh, so I think that that's that's kind of the terminology we're dealing with here. Uh, so trying to understand how that is uh, uh, impacting uh, the these uh, the city, so that um, where there's a lot of uh, policies being considered right now, things like congestion pricing, uh, uh, micro mobility approvals. Um, uh, for operations in New York uh, and, and so, so forth uh, that can have major changes in consequence uh, because of post-COVID. Right, so this is a joint work uh, with uh, my colleagues at Cito Smart. Uh, in fact, the lead author is uh, Ding Wong, uh, uh, Khan Asbe's uh, PhD student. Uh, so she can probably provide some more answers to this uh, uh, afterwards. Uh. Right, uh, so the motivation here, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, New York City has become this national epicenter. Uh, there is this, um, uh, since since uh, mid March uh, to uh, uh, to uh, shut down New York City, uh, stay at home orders to uh, social distance and flatten the curve, uh, and uh, there's uh, it's only recently that uh, uh, New York's been uh, reopened uh, up to uh, phase four, uh, uh, and uh, even now though uh, there there's still uh, various limitations on on uh, uh, what uh, we can uh, do. So uh, given all of this. Uh, We've, we've been seeing uh, anecdotal evidence uh, and, and some evidence from data as well that uh, transit ridership remains pretty low uh, despite uh, studies uh, indicating uh, there isn't substantial evidence uh, uh, that transit operations uh, are really uh, super spreaders uh, for uh, COVID. Uh, so uh, because of that behavioral inertia that uh, during COVID uh, outbreak and the stay at home orders uh, uh, that people are really sticking to uh, that a mode shift. Uh, we want to uh, first look at what that effect of uh, that um, uh, COVID uh, outbreak had on the mode choice behavior uh, for New York City um, and understanding how much that uh, behavior, if it stayed on during the opening as kind of like a worst case scenario, uh, how much worse would uh, traffic congestion get um, and uh, uh, potentially uh, looking at various uh, transit operating uh, 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 strategies, uh, one of which we, we looked at a 50% capacity reduction, uh, which is uh, what many cities have been implementing, uh, how that would, uh, uh, that, that combined effect with the behavioral inertia would affect travel, uh, not just for uh, road travel, but for transit, for uh, active uh, travel modes uh, and micro mobility and so forth. Um, so the the basis for this uh, work was that we had developed uh, this uh, multi-agent simulation. Uh, we'll call it Matsum NYC. Okay, so uh, we developed this uh, Matsum NYC, and we wanted to recalibrate um, some of the alternative-specific constants uh, in the mode choice portion of the the model, uh, so that uh, the output uh, of the Matsum would fit what we were seeing in COVID. Uh, so that subsequent uh, recalibrated model, we'll, we'll call that Matsum NYC COVID. Okay, um, and so using that maximum NYC COVID, we want to look at uh, some worst case scenarios, like if uh, if it's reopened 100% and everyone does go back to uh, re uh, commuting, which uh, given some of the evidence that we're seeing now and uh, some of the discussions earlier as well, uh, it's probably not likely the case. Uh, there will still be some uh, some portion of people that will be working from home, um, but uh, it, it'll be interesting to at least uh, understand potentially what are the bounds on uh, the, the impacts on traffic uh, and on transit uh, use. Right. Um, so this uh, Matsum NYC model that we developed, uh, it's the outcome of uh, this uh, two-year project we, de uh, we did uh, for uh, C2Smart, where we developed this uh, citywide model. Um, the, the reason we chose to use Matsum, uh, it captured um, uh, a, a certain traffic dynamics as well as uh, activity uh, scheduling, at least as, as far as uh, some uh, sensitivity to departure times. Uh, and we thought that that was very suited for evaluating mobility as a service ecosystems and related policies. Uh, and there are uh, studies uh, that uh, support that uh, point, uh, as you can see uh, in, in the examples, uh, many of which coming up from uh, Kai Exhausen's group. Right. Um, 
So for the NATSM NYC, uh, it's it consists of a this calibrated synthetic population and a calibrated day-to-day -day simulator. Um, we uh, when we uh, initially calibrated it, it was for 2016 uh, year uh, where we had uh, a data from uh, a New York City uh, DOT as well as uh, some other data sources. Um, for the COVID case, uh, we did update our schedule uh, for pre-COVID to January uh, 2020, and then uh, during COVID, we used the GTFS data from Transit for, um, uh, I think it was uh, end of March uh, 2020. Um, and our population consists of the, the core New York City area, so it's not the whole region that, uh, for example, uh, the metropolitan area for New York uh, considers, uh, like Westchester, Long Island, and so forth. Uh, instead, we just focus on the 8.3 plus million uh, residents uh, in uh, New York, separated uh, by segments to Manhattan and non-Manhattan, with uh, gateways for non-resident trips. Um, we, we conducted our simulations with 100-day runs uh, and uh, using a 4% population sample. Uh, so uh, it, it's a, a, a trade-off of, uh, uh, of the samples for uh, computational uh, uh, efficiency. Um, <clears throat> so this this model that I'm showing you here is is one of the parts of the uh, the mode choice model that we uh, calibrated for the synthetic population to to generate the modes that they that they chose for the trips, um, and we then uh, convert it into an equivalent version uh, of a, a score functions for Matsum's uh, uh, simulation. Um, the uh, so uh, even though it's a prior study, uh, uh, because we're making modifications to this, I wanted to at least share uh, this slide uh, so you can kind of see some of the numbers. Um, so uh, this is a tour-based nested logic mode choice model uh, where we consider driving tours versus non-driving tours. And given a non-driving tour, there's uh, various uh, uh, non-driving uh, modes that people can choose from. Uh, and we uh, calibrated initially using a 2010-2011 regional household travel survey from uh, uh, NIMTIC regional uh, the, um, uh, MPO, uh, and then we appended that with additional uh, alternatives, uh, city bike and for hire vehicles, uh, TNCs and so, so forth, using uh, uh, trip data uh, from 2016. All right. <clears throat> um, and in, in those cases, we also incorpor incorporated uh, smartphone models uh, to uh, predict smartphone ownership and use that as an attribute in those uh, uh, alternatives. Uh, and uh, we estimated it for Manhattan and non-Manhattan uh, uh, travelers. Uh, and this is just some of the numbers from the Manhattan uh, segment. Um, we did validate this uh, with, uh, uh, with the New York City uh, uh, data. So uh, looking at like New York uh, City DOT's uh, citywide mobility survey, uh, comparing to that, uh, we saw that it was uh, better than uh, using just a trip-based model or comparing it to 2011 uh, data. And uh, we also compared to our, our ridership uh, within the, the various transit stations and uh, picking a, a several uh, major uh, stations from New York City to compare against uh, with an average difference of about 8%, uh, and also various uh, 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 road links uh, to uh, uh, sample to uh, evaluate uh, simulated volumes and counts uh, and with a median uh, difference of about 29%, which is a little bit higher. Um, uh, okay. so, um, <clears throat> so based on that model, we then uh, took that and uh, made modifications to the uh, alternative specific constants for a couple of the modes, uh, driving, transit, walk, and uh, I think bike as well. Um, so how did we go about doing that? Uh, so first, uh, we uh, uh, took uh, a work from home uh, proportion rates. Uh, so uh, this, these are non, actually non-work from home proportions um, uh, that were obtained from uh, uh, Dingo and uh, uh, Neiman. Um, as based on breakdown of different uh, uh, industries. Uh, so according to those industries, uh, we integrated that into the, um, the, uh, the synthetic population and updated that so that uh, uh, certain proportions of uh, the population based on the industry of the worker, uh, they would either work from home or not work from home. Um, <clears throat> so that's looking at the COVID column. Uh, the other columns refer to the reopening phases. Um, we then uh, also made use of data from the MTA in terms of uh, a subway uh, a bus ridership, as well as uh, 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 secondary data sources like Apple Mobility Reports uh, to see how uh, the amount of travel uh, by those various modes uh, reduced uh, during that period. Uh, and so using those numbers, uh, we then uh, recalibrated uh, the mode uh, utility scores uh, so that the outcome of the Matson simulation 
would uh, try to match these numbers as best as possible. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is just a, a, a illustration of the, uh, the iterations in the, in the uh, calibration uh, process uh, using SPSA uh, uh, to uh, we're, as 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 a quick response modeling effort, uh, we uh, we uh, capped ourselves at uh, the 0.1 uh, absolute difference, uh, and uh, these were some of the values and uh, percentage point uh, differences uh, between uh, for subway, car, and walk. Um, so car, there's a substantially more higher difference uh, in, in the uh, numbers. Um, and we're able to make comparisons then uh, looking at a number of uh, out-of-home workers by uh, zone of residence uh, during pre-COVID as well as uh, COVID uh, scenario. Um, and uh, uh, as, as an outcome of the estimation, uh, you can see the uh, alternate specific constants were modified uh, in, in the following manner. Uh, so uh, here we just note that these were the ones that we had uh, some data to modify. So, so, they, uh, so the mode choice is still considering more modes than this, but uh, we had only data for this, so we were modifying only these, assuming the others were uh, scaling proportionately. Uh, so transit, driving, walking, biking, and you can see that transit drops, uh, whereas the other three increase, which seems to uh, fit what uh, others were observing as well in their studies uh, and the data collected. Um, just uh, three key points here. So uh, one, one is that transit mode share suffered uh, uh, during uh, this uh, COVID scenario, um, which is very evident, right? But uh, the, the rates at which it uh, changed uh, also differed uh, between Manhattan versus non-Manhattan, uh, primarily uh, because uh, non-Manhattan had more uh, uh, people working uh, uh, outside of home, right? So essential workers and so forth. Uh, driving, walking, biking, all, all increased usage, but uh, you can see that comparing Manhattan versus non-Manhattan, driving increased more in non-Manhattan than in Manhattan. Right. Um, uh, then we uh, also uh, uh, compared uh, these uh, numbers to uh, uh, the uh, transit uh, data, uh, uh, transit uh, 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 ridership uh, or uh, uh, inbound data to the various uh, uh, major uh, stations uh, just to uh, validate the model. Uh, so, so these are some of the numbers that we were uh, seeing from the sample. Uh, which uh, there were, there are some uh, high high variations, but uh, uh, on average uh, it was a pretty good fit. Um, and this is just an illustration of uh, uh, the speeds that we can output from the model. All right. Um, so the reopening scenarios, that's the, uh, the, the major part of this uh, discussion for this uh, session. session right? So um, New York City reopened uh, according to four phases, uh, um, and uh, we're currently uh, in the fourth uh, phase reopening. Um, but even with this fourth phase, uh, they've been implementing transit operational restrictions uh, to limit capacity and impose uh, social distancing. Um, uh, so. In, in these scenarios, we assume everyone who can commute uh, would uh, switch back to uh, to commuting, uh, which, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that's that's probably a more conservative uh, uh, assumption. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but we want to see what that impact would be on traffic. Uh, and we also defined two groups of scenarios to examine uh, for each of the four phases. Uh, one was uh, the first one is assuming there is no transit capacity restriction, uh, but still. Uh, in, uh, the travelers are behaving according to how they behave during COVID uh, because of that uh, stickiness or inertia. Uh, inertia. Uh, and the second scenario set being that uh, we have this uh, capacity reduction on the transit lines, uh, which we can model in MatSim, uh, and seeing how that would impact the travel patterns. Um, so uh, this is a, a comparison of uh, the four phases relative to uh, the uh, pre-COVID numbers. Uh, so for example, uh, when you look at the transit, that's 73%, uh, it, re it reflects the scenario one, uh, where we assume at full, uh, phase four is operating at full capacity and uh, uh, transit would uh, uh, gain back up to 73% of pre-COVID numbers. And you can see that car rides uh, uh, would uh, go up uh, 42%. Um, <clears throat> The taxi FHV modes uh, remain stunted, uh, whereas the uh, act active travel modes, uh, they recover to about uh, uh, pre-COVID numbers uh, under this simulation. Um, the uh, interesting thing though, is when we now apply the 50% capacity reduction uh, to, to, the, uh, to the scenario, uh, the numbers uh, change uh, quite a lot. So well, in some, some of the cases. So in uh, transit, it doesn't reduce that much. Uh, so it goes down from 73% uh, to 64%. Uh, 
Um, uh, so I think um, that that reflects that uh, the, the behavior has has already had a major impact on on the trends of usage, uh, and the capacity uh, does not make that much of a change. Uh, the road, uh, the the driving, uh, uh, the car mode uh, does also doesn't increase that much more. It, it increased from 142 to 143 percent. Uh, primarily, um, uh, it seems that um, much of the supply is already oversaturated, and so uh, the people that were switching from transit, uh, uh, they were uh, they end up make, uh, making use of uh, other modes. Right. So you can see, for example, the micro mobility modes, bike, city bike. Uh, they increase drastically, right? So uh, uh, city bike, for example, goes up to from 92% in the uh, scenario set one to 184%. Um, so, so what does that imply, right? Um, there, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, 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 implications in terms of uh, uh, micro mobility use as well as uh, uh, man managing of the traffic. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, touch upon that some more in the next slide. But uh, in, in this slide, uh, basically, we see that uh, we can, uh, using the maximum output, we can uh, capture time of day differences. And uh, earlier, Kai uh, mentioned that, that change in speed uh, in, uh, in one of his talks. Uh, um, uh, to, uh, the, to the, uh, during the opening, and uh, you can also see uh, some of that uh, citywide as well as uh, uh, within Manhattan uh, for, for the speeds. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so let me conclude with uh, some of these uh, policy implications. Uh, so the transit reduction uh, uh, has a minor impact on the mode share on top of the behavioral inertia that we see uh, that we're seeing already. Uh, this suggests that the road is already highly saturated. Uh, diverted tri trips would likely move to other modes. Um, so in the case of New York City, uh, it's important to, uh, because right now they're, cons they're considering uh, congestion uh, management po uh, policies like cordon based pricing. Uh, so uh, that will become more consequential under COVID reopening. Uh, so they need to take more care with that. Um, and we also see micro mobility uh, gaining significantly, which uh, suggests there needs to uh, be more investment and consideration of uh, that supply option uh, in New York. Uh, so uh, uh, shortly after, uh, 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 I think one, some of the initial reopening, uh, uh, they uh, they did authorize some of the uh, um, uh, e-scooter -e uh, usage uh, in New York. So uh, that's uh, hopeful to see. Although at the same time, we saw also that um, uh, uh, Revel, uh, which is the uh, moped company operating in New York, uh, in primarily the outer boroughs, uh, had to shut down because of fatalities. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it's important to consider to keep keep uh, uh, micro mobility options uh, in mind as we uh, re uh, recover. Uh, and uh, for transit to return and auto traffic to reduce back, the city would really need to introduce a campaign to raise awareness. I think one of the comments uh, uh, earlier uh, in the chat box uh, they talked about uh, how to. Uh, consider that um, uh, uh, whether or not we need to uh, really educate the public, uh, and that that is something that uh, needs to be considered. Okay, so uh, just to conclude, uh, these are our next steps. These these are tools that uh, are we're making available to uh, policymakers. Uh, we're continually collecting more data and updating and refining the model. Uh, so there are assumptions in in, in the modeling, uh, for example, like uh, dealing with. Uh, Unemployed, uh, we, we really uh, um, didn't take that too much into account, and um, non-resident uh, travel as much. Um, uh, we're also uh, collaborating with Cornell right now to look at trade-offs uh, in uh, uh, considering COVID exposure missions as well. Uh, and these are some useful links that you can uh, refer to. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Joe. You're at 19 minutes and 40 seconds. Okay. That's uh, just about perfect. Wonderful. Um, if you have any questions for Joe, please uh, put them in the chat box. And I can start with one, um, which is, so when we talk about so the behavioral inertia and stickiness, really in the longer term, you know, which one are the, are the biggest ones um, that you think that, that you think are going to happen and, and that both that you think and both that what the model is showing? Um, to, what are your thoughts? Biggest, biggest, you know, stickiness. Behaviors. I mean, there's there's this aversion right now to uh, using shared use modes. Uh, I think that's one of the major biggest uh, concerns, right? Because uh, there's also uh, uh, studies looking into that, and uh, and also um, the, the transit agencies. Uh, it's it's top of their concern to to make sure that those operations uh, uh, are. Uh, you know, are not uh, act, actually acting as super spreaders. Uh, so, so I think there's there's this uh, uh, 
you know, this reality that there isn't uh, that conclusive evidence that uh, transit operations uh, are uh, contributing to spreading, uh, and yet people are really worried about that. Uh, so I think uh, that's one thing that we need to try to uh, uh, inform the public a little bit more. Um, so. All right, all right. Um, and then Kara is asking, are Uber, Lyft, and DD going to go out of business soon then? Uh, no, I, I, I think uh, not at all. I think uh, it's all about these businesses adapting their operations. Right? So Uber right now, I think that Uber Eats is uh, uh, doing phenomenal. Uh, and uh, it's a matter of uh, adjusting their business models uh, to accommodate. Um, all right, all right. And, and then the other one, I guess, is you're talking about micromobility and those are the modes like biking and walking. And uh, they're probably going to pick up, they're probably going to get a higher uh, mode share. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're seeing that already. Uh, so um, our center has been releasing monthly uh, working papers uh, and uh, the, the most recent one I think talks about uh, some of the data we're seeing in terms of uh, actually bus ridership starting to increase back and uh, the yeah definitely the uh, micro mobility modes are really uh, being used uh, much more uh, even uh, above uh, pre-COVID. So, so it is making sense in, in, in terms of that, even though uh, there are, you know, if, if we're relative to the model, um, but uh, definitely there are ways to improve that. Right. And then uh, Kara actually has another question, uh, which is about Uber Eats. Is it gonna generate the same revenues that Uber provided? Uh, Uber had to lay off a lot of people. Um, and I'm also hearing a lot about, you know, with. Uh, all the, the freight, um, I don't know, the goods movements, so Uber Eats movement. So do you think there's going to be so much activity that uh, is going to pick up the revenue? Yeah, no, I, I definitely there's, there's going to be changes uh, industry-wide, uh, right? So uh, there'll be uh, consolidation and uh, companies, uh, uh, new, new entries and, and so forth. Um, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's also about being able to adapt. And, and some of the businesses, uh, like the businesses that we thought would, have uh, collapsed uh, from the uh, when COVID started. Uh, it was surprising that uh, they they were able to uh, adjust uh, so well and uh, respond quickly to to be able to uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, failing to to, uh, to thrive as well. But yeah, definitely there's a lot of layoffs because there there has to be change uh, in those cases. Um, another question from Toh here. Uh, what is the potential of using Google mobility data? Pros and cons of Google micro mobility data versus Apple data. I know you've used Apple data, by the way, and, and I was told that this is just the searches, right? These are not the actual trips. Um, yes, yes. These, these are, uh, I believe, yeah, just the searches. So there, there, are, uh, there are potential biases. Uh, and uh, between Apple and Google, yeah, there, there's, uh, I, I think um, with the Apple data, it was, um, it was uh, some something that we were able to access uh, uh, right away in the beginning, uh, so we made use of that. Uh, but we'll take a look at the Google uh, mobility data as well. I think, uh, especially with the um, crowding information that Google has uh, for their uh, destinations and points of interest, it would be interesting to see if that kind of data is uh, made available to really help uh, manage the uh, social distancing in the future. Um, yeah. So that's the other question, right? Pros and cons do you think about uh, having access to that kind of data? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if you have any cons in mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, the cons, uh, I mean, so, so, so more classic arguments is uh, about the privacy of uh, some of these uh, uh, data collections, right? So uh, even with the contact tracing uh, 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 strategies, uh, that, that there's uh, pe some people respond with uh, the need to consider the privacy aspect. But, but I think that's, that's something that given the situation uh, you have to deal with those. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I, I have, you know, I, I, you spend a lot of time talking about validation um, in the talk, which I think is, is great. And, and you've clearly put a lot of work into it. And you know that no matter what it is, it's going to be wrong. Um, and so hopefully you can keep track of how wrong it is and see, you know, if there's yeah. any things we could have done in the future to try to predict, you know, type of behavior related to, to black swans like, like, like we have here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to keep, uh, keep monitoring. So, thank you. Oh, so just one last question from Deborah, and I know she's from uh, New York City originally, so she's really interested. Um, <laughs> so do you have any NYC specific info on long-term work from home? Um, oh, NYC specific info? Um, I'm 
I don't have too much, but uh, at least from the uh, education side now, they're considering uh, a school reopening, and at least for NYU, we're, we're starting back, um, like uh, going back to campus uh, in the fall. So it seems like uh, there's uh, there's uh, more of a um, push to uh, to move out of the working home now. But but just anecdotally talking to the other people in New York City, uh, it's still. Uh, it's something that, uh, you know, different people have different preferences. So. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. I can tell you, I'm in France right now. I'm coming back to the U.S. next yeah. week. And um, everything is reopening here. Uh, people do wear masks. They don't seem to complain too much about yeah. them. Um, but everything is reopening. And I think, so uh, the university classes are going to be mainly online, but, but schools are going to be reopening, uh, mainly for parents to be able to go to work. Um, so that's what's happening. Yeah. Perfect. But it's, it's perfect time now. We're at 15 after the hour. We can move on to our next session. Uh, Anurag is, is right here. That's wonderful. And we're actually going to cross uh, the entire United States to go from New York City to, to LA. Uh, so that's great. So Anurag, uh, Anurag is a principal at Cambridge Systematics, and he leads their data analytics practice. He's based in LA. And over the past three years, he has led the development and deployment of Locus. And that's a location-based data product within transit operators in LA, Denver, Boston, uh, to design demand-driven uh, demand bus systems. Uh, so today's presentation focuses on the work being carried out in LA to help Metro respond to the pandemic in a thoughtful and equitable fashion. So I'm reading what, uh, what uh, Anurag uh, wrote me. So I'm looking forward to knowing more what, what's a thoughtful and equitable um, solution. Thank you, Anurag. The floor is yours. The virtual Thanks, floor is yours. Thank you. I will say that the West Coast is the best coast, so I will lead with that, uh, so the heckling can begin. Uh, and with, with, with that in uh, mind, so at this session, the way you said it, Sybil, talks about post-pandemic, but again, the work that we are doing still talks about where we are today and how we use it as time goes forward. So it's sort of a, it's, it's an operational analysis, so it's, it's continuous in that sense. So it slightly uh, takes away from your original theme, but I think in the spirit, it, it just sh does show how the transit agency here is thinking about recovering from the pandemic. Uh, before I go, I do want to acknowledge my co-authors, some of whom are on the call, uh, my colleagues at Cambridge Systematics, Pragun Vinayak, Amit Mondal, and Mihalis Zintarakis. They've done a lot of the great work that is presented here and our partners at Metro, Conan Chung, who leads the practice area there and his, his colleague, Joe Fulgiarini. Uh, and uh, again, if there are, if you have good comments, I'll take them. If you have tough questions, you can blame my team members who are not there. Uh, so just a bit of background for the study, uh, again, laying the context for what happened in LA County. Mid-March was when the stay-at-home orders were issued. And immediately, as it has happened across the country and across the world, both uh, people stopped traveling and transit usage dropped quite precipitously. And in response, Metro actually shut down the service or moved it to a Sunday only service, right? So it's a pretty big difference from a regular weekday service to a Sunday service. And it was instantaneous. Uh, it, it was right at the time because nobody had any better information on what to do. Uh, and agencies are both worried about what's happening today, but what is likely to happen in the future in terms of sales revenues, and fare box revenues that drive operations. Uh, but as they started bringing back service, they wanted to be more thoughtful about what they do. And so this is where the work that we are doing becomes more relevant, uh, which is we're helping them use a lot of new data sets and existing data sets in a more thoughtful and consistent fashion to help rebuild the system back. And so we are using a lot of sensor driven data because that's the only data that's available on a weekly basis. And these are sensors from cell phones. That's the Locus product but also Metro's own data set, which is their APC information to drive this analysis. And again, there's, a, there's been a lot of information that's made available at the sensor level at a county, county level, but there are huge differences when you look at different neighborhoods based on, especially in a large county like LA. So again, our analysis was focused both con continuous data uh, analysis, but also at small levels of geography. Uh, just a quick background of the data that uh, we, 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 we covered, and I'll show some of these as we go through the presentation. Uh, on the left are the two location-based service data sets. One is called a travel tracker, which just shows the changes in travel behavior on a week-to-week -week basis by residents of Los Angeles County, and it's done at a pretty granular level. And we get key metrics like time of day of travel, the, the miles traveled, and how far away are people traveling from home, and also at the reverse, at the work end, right, or the non-home end, trips that are being made to a destination, how far away are people coming from? 
that's important for transit because transit is not does not do a great job and a lot of trips are short trips and that's what's happening today so what joe mentioned in his first presentation yes there is a worry about shared rides and people not wanting to get in uh, transit but at the same time there is also a behavioral element which is people are making a lot of short trips around their home which is again not conducive to transit so keeping track of both is pretty relevant then we also have information about uh, the number of visits happening at all major stores across the county and this is a good indicator of the kind of travel that people are doing right and we see trends march and uh, april was the was when everybody was going to all the grocery stores and apparently buying 100 pounds of toilet roll i don't know why that was relevant but that's what we did but you can sort of see those trends and then you can see that later on in time the kind of shopping that happened was different right and so we have the ability to track this again both by the the type of store and the location of the store and then on the right are metro's own data sets where we're helping them process and analyze one is their apc data set which shows the activities the boardings and the lighting activity at a bus stop level by route and this is great to measure actually the change that's happening yes ridership is up down by 50% but is it uniform across the region or are there some parts doing better than others because again there are essential workers low income neighborhoods or people who just generally rely on transit for one reason or another and then supplemented by customer service which again uh, to sibel's team starts looking into the future what would it take for people to get back to transit right is it is it just the service or is it cleanliness is it ensuring social distancing and all of that information so these are in general the broad uh, databases that we are looking at here is what the travel tracker looks like and uh, i think i i have a couple of minutes to show you actually what the dashboard looks like so the panel on the left right you can choose the home locations and you can choose the uh, the small hexagon bins and you can say uh, sh tell me uh, show me all the devices that live in that area and then at the top panel you can see the visits that were made in the reference week which for us is sorry was uh mid january and then we have travel which is made in the most recent week or any week there off right so it's sort of a reference point and we show the trends from that and we also have measures of the average visits and then the average distance travel and the the panels in the middle show this is the one the central panel shows january travel and the panel on the right shows travel from the most recent week and then at the bottom we also have travel by different times of day and again as you can see when i look at results from early april right so i'm comparing january to early uh, mid april when the pandemic fear was highest you can see that a, uh, a lot of trips uh, the vmt is down across the board but it's down the most in early am and by the way in la if you want to get your job at any reasonable time you have to leave early am right so a lot of travel which was commute related st tends to start happening there especially people living further out and heading into downtown or the ports or the west part of uh, los angeles and you can see that the big dip in the vmt during that period it's not quite as bad uh, uh, the difference in the other time periods but the amp peak is the biggest impact and that has to do with uh, with the work patterns and here's what the the dashboard looks like uh, in real time right so you can you can select on the panel at the left you can either select by hovering over the bin and selecting the zones themselves or you can pick and choose the different zones by which uh, metro operates its bus service so these are the service council areas or you can actually go down to different towns and neighborhoods and so i selected a few towns here pasadena where i live uh, as well as the neighborhoods around it so you can select it this way as well and then you can also select by the corridors which is a specific bus corridors that metro is very interested in and this again is where the equitable thing comes in we are not looking at it overall we are looking at routes where metro has always had good service low income neighborhoods and we can pick and choose those areas uh, select those areas and this is the first part of it right and you, as you select these numbers keep getting updated i'm not going to try it now because it's a massive database and has some latency it takes about 15 seconds and then at the back end so, so the first one shows i select a home location and it shows the travel patterns the back end of this dashboard says now show me the non home right and we have selected downtown here and it tells me well the people or the devices that showed up in downtown in january came from these home locations right so it's pretty widespread not just downtown but everywhere around but as you can see in april it sort of condensed a lot more so the people that are traveling to downtown live in and around that so again it reinforces the fact that the kind of trips that were being made were being made in the vicinity of where people live and so that's again uh it, it has a huge impact on transit behavior and that's something that metro wanted to keep track of then the second dashboard uh is 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 simpler in a way which is we take all of these cell phone movements we assign them to stores 
uh, major stores that are uh, in the region, mostly national brands. And we track how the behavior has changed over time, right? The, the number of devices that show up, we call it traffic footfall within the stores. And we have seven broad categories, retail, dining, travel, uh, financial services, entertainment, automotive dealerships, because that's competitive for transit. And we like to keep track of that to see if things are going up or down. Uh, and you can see the trends happening over time. The big dip, by the way, so this is when the pandemic, uh, the stay-at-home orders were issued, but and it, it craters across the board for all industry types. The big dip is, is the Easter holiday, and that's when shops were closed, right? So it actually shows that impact of things being shut down. And then soon after, things pick up a little bit because of uh, the stimulus checks actually arriving and people having money now to do some shopping. And then it sort of uh, stabilizes to a new normalcy until mid-June when everyone's still worried, and uh, sorry, early June when everyone is taking the, uh, the stay-at-home seriously. And then we see the slow reopening and things trending upwards uh, up to July. And then we've had a second round of uh, uh, infections in LA or the infections have kept going up. And so you see a gradual slowing down in July. So again, the trends that we see in reality, what's happening is reflected in this, in, in this data set. The value of this is to show which kinds of industry are coming back and which kinds of, it's not that people who visit this are going to use transit, but it's the workers that work at some of these locations that are transit users. So understanding where these people still are showing up, where there is still activity, where there are still jobs is the way Metro is using this. And again, this dashboard is, 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 is far simpler and it looks something like this. I can again choose the stores inside it. I can hover over and it shows me the activity at the individual stores. So it gets to pretty granular and detailed level. I can again choose the same areas that I'm interested in. And I can look at the specific industries as well to see what's happening. And not only can I do that, but I can actually dive a little deeper and say the things that I'm interested in are a specific brand or a specific sub-market. I thought it would load up a little faster, but uh, you, you can s sort of dive very quickly into things that you're really interested in and say, okay, I only want to look at 7-Eleven. Tell me what's happening at 7-Eleven across the county, right? And it shows you that it held steady pretty good uh, 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 across the board. And if I choose California Pizza Kitchen, my hunch is they didn't do as well. You can see that they have they have strange spikes in the middle when uh, when things opened up, but it's gone back down again when things are shutting down. So again, this is this is pretty granular. It helps Metro get to very point specific or neighborhood specific activity to see what's going on. But the two going hand in hand have helped them understand what's happening in the region. Uh, and then when we look at regional trends, right, uh, we we see uh, we saw again what I mentioned. We saw four key uh, phases. There was the panic and prepare where people were just didn't know what to do and there was a change in activity and then a big drop starting from uh, sort of late March until uh, mid-April. And then there was the quarantine period. Everybody was quiet, stayed at home until June. And then we started seeing people getting a little uh, nervous about staying at home all the time or antsy. And you, you see that trend going up. And then again, we have the cautionary slowdown happening in early July. So these are the broad trends that we see in traffic footfall. Then we look at the travel tracker. Uh, again, I want to mention that we have not expanded the data. These are not weighted. These are just things we are delivering on a weekly basis. So it's quick statistics and, and the relative measures are what are important. And what you can see is the, uh, the, the drop in travel distances per device went down quite a bit more, right? So it's 50% in, in mid-April compared to just about a 20, 25% drop in average trip making. So people were still making trips but they're making trips within their neighborhood. So they're not making the long trips that are conducive to transit. And even as we go into late July, we're about 10 to 15% down on total trip making, but we're still considerably uh, a third of a person, a uh, third uh, shot in total travel distance. So again, these are important things to keep track of. Uh, and then the APC data, we talk about transit ridership uh, and we, we were measuring this. The, the weekend, on the weekday, we're still down about 50% on buses. On the weekend, it's not as bad, it's 37%. And then when you look at it by different time of day, you can see that the biggest drops are actually in the AM and the PM peak, over 50%, but not as bad in the early AM, the midday or late evening when you have more essential workers working, people who don't have a choice and use transit for all their purposes, right? So there has been a flight from people who have had flexibility to work from home, uh, the commute workers, and you see that in the AM peak periods, 
and also in the fact that the, the weekday has had a larger drop off than the weekend, which has held more steady, which tends to be people who are used transit for all their trips. And that's at the broad level, right? And these are statistics which have been produced in many regions. But when we start going to the sub-regional levels, uh, things look different from area to area. So this is the downtown area, right? Uh, the residents that live there, the, 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 the panel on the left shows how many fewer trips they're making, right? It's, it's down only 5%. That means they're still making the same trips that they were making. But when you look at uh, the ridership that happens in that region, it's down 40%. So it's, it shows that, again, the, the shorter trips dominate. Uh, people are not taking transit, uh, uh, which is important. And downtown is the biggest market for transit. So understanding what's happening there is relevant. And people are also not showing up as much in the shopping areas downtown, primarily because some of these stores have closed, right? Because a lot of the downtown commerce is driven by workers. And so the once the work from home uh, was introduced, you don't see as much traffic at some of these stores as you used to before. Then if you go to a different a part of town, which is lower income, which is more residential, Again, you see similar trends in terms of travel patterns, the uh, resident visits. It looks similar. The ridership is down much the same way as well. But it, if you look at the traffic footfall on some of the essential services and essential retail, we're not as far down as we were in downtown. So again, people are doing, doing trips and are going to the stores in these areas. And then if you go and choose uh, Malibu, which is one of the most, the wealthiest part of uh, LA County, uh, you can see that these people have a lot more flexibility, and so they're not traveling out as much, right? These residents are not traveling as much compared to the rest of the region. They also have weird travel patterns for the stores there. Doesn't It's inconsistent. They're not going to essential retail, but they're doing non-essential retail services. Uh, so some of these patterns are harder to explain what's happening, but you can see that the ridership is way down than it used to be before. Again, it's a smaller sliver of ridership to begin with, but it's down much more than some of the a working class neighborhoods uh, that we see. So again, it's not equal. And what this is helping Metro do is they're reallocating the services to areas where ridership is coming back faster. It's helping them move services to the off peak. Again, they're using a data driven decision making to say, well, look, uh, we used to have a peak driven service in the past, but that doesn't make sense anymore. We need to reallocate some services to the midday as well as to the weekend because our core customers are still riding and we want to provide them social distance uh, based services. So it's helping Metro make some of these decisions and have the data to back those decisions up. And ultimately it's helping support this phasing plan that Metro is doing. I mentioned early that they went to an enhanced, sorry, an enhanced Sunday service in early April. Uh, then phase one and two is where we are now. They're re-emerging and recreating some of the service that are adding more frequency in the midday and the off peak period. They're looking out for school students and universities if they open. Currently, they're not, but different areas are thinking differently. And then we have what will come later on in the year, which is how can they start adding back enhanced services. Uh, Metro will also have a better idea of what their budget implications are by the time this comes uh, online in uh, September to November, so in a couple of months. So they'll have more clarity on what to do. And then uh, all of this is leading to a new normal, which is what do we do in December and January when things are uh, sort of stabilized? Hopefully there'll be a vaccine or hopefully there'll be a better way to manage the infection uh, and the pandemic as it's going. And how can Metro drive, continue to drive services in a more systematic fashion rather than having to resort to quick changes based on data. So it's leading up to a more stabilized standardized system. So that's my presentation. Uh, I'll pause here, Sybil, uh, turn it back to you. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, you were uh, pretty quick. We're at uh, 16 minutes. Um, questions for Anurag, please post them in the chat box. I have one question already, and I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll read it. I just have one question now, which is, again, stickiness. So once we're in phase four, what do you expect? So uh, I'll give some background, Sybil. The, the reason, so before the pandemic hit, uh, uh, LA Metro was embar had embarked on the last two years on a study called the Next Gen Bus Study because they were losing riders, right, for a long time. So the cell phone driven data analysis was actually leading up from 2017 to say, well, we need to put services where there is where people are traveling. And LA has undergone a lot of change. And so this was part of that, that, that goal. And we had identified corridors that need to change. We had identified places where there was more demand and less demand and were reorganizing the system. So now, and we were with no pandemic, we would have launched that in fall of this year, right? So that's where we were. And now this has changed. So 
part of the goal is, well, we've invested a lot of time uh, and we have good rules in place of what drives the system. But now we don't know what the stickiness is and we don't know who's still going to make trips, right? So this, this six month period is actually a lesson to learn who is still riding and who is not riding. Uh, in the past, we used to use fare card data to say who are our regular customers, where do they live? But the last three months, most transit agencies have sort of shut down the fare card usage. They've let people board on from everywhere. So there is more safety for their drivers. And so we don't have that data set, right? All we have is the APC, which says, well, here is the boardings and the lightings, but it doesn't say anything about customers. Uh, so we're, we're shooting a little bit in the dark as everybody is, but we're sort of building this repository of data, which shows uh, the loads on buses, which shows the loads in different areas. It also shows uh, the travel times of different buses, right? How fast, how slow are they going, which is also an indicator of how fast the travel, general travel in that area is picking up compared to the rest. And all of those are giving us indicators of where we should put service, but then there's no, no idea yet about how many people will continue to use service and who will not. We are doing, or Metro is rather doing a series of surveys, which will sort of get at that question, still, but we haven't analyzed that data in any great detail just yet. And what does your gut feeling tell you? <laughs> I hope everybody comes back to transit and I hope everyone wears a mask and keeps people safe. I mean, I think transit is uh, losing transit because of this would be terrible, right? Or people uh, stepping away. So Metro is doing other things to make transit attractive. They're embarking on an ambitious bus lane program to keep, to take a lot of, uh, to keep the speeds high for Metro and buses, even after the traffic comes back. So they're doing other things to sort of show Metro is reliable. They're doing a lot of safety measures. So I hope it'll be successful, but in some ways, some of these larger cities would be interesting microcosms. New York, I don't think people will have a choice if the companies get people back. I think people will start taking transit. But LA is not like that. We have a very bad car culture here. And I hope that people don't use this time to get to stick to the car culture. So it'll be interesting though, to see what happens. All right. You know, one of my one of the great movies I like to um, watch when I think about infrastructure is Who Framed Roger Rabbit, right? Which happens in LA. So if if if, if the people in the attendance, if you have never watched Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it's an old movie, please watch it. Uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll love it as, as transportation uh, people. Uh, so I will read the question now. I do have a question from Satish, uh, which is uh, most of the geolocation data is noisy. Uh, there's a lot of noise in that. Uh, so what's the noisiness in this data? And is there any systematic bias that you found or noise effect that you found or, or something that you could um, see? Or how does the noise effect affect the, uh, the, um, the policy making? I mean, I, I don't know what Satish, what you mean by noise, but uh, again, the way we have... Uh, uh, analyze this database, right, is, is at a small level, and we've cleaned out records a priori where we think the data, those devices are giving us incomplete information or not very clear information. And when we look at these dashboards, we've also started filtering out uh, trips that are being made, less than two trips or three trips a day, right, because we don't want, as you say, a short, small percentage of trips going in some areas. And again, these filters can be played with. You can set the threshold at five, 10 trips, right, and you sort of say, this is where people want to tra travel to. Uh, and, and again, uh, what we do know from a noise perspective, right, or it's not necessarily a noise, what we do know is some, many people have lost jobs and some people have moved out of la, uh, large urban areas. So it's impossible right now to expand the data to actually reflect what's happening on the ground. So all we're relying on is the relative metrics. And again, we've benchmarked this with the APC data to say, well, areas where we see more bus travel happening in the corridor, are we seeing more travel in general happening in those areas, right? So we've done some of those checks to make sure things look reasonable. Uh, but again, there will always be noise in this data, but this is the best we can get right now in terms of something that's happening continuously. Wonderful, thank you very much. I'm still monitoring the questions. I don't have a few questions. I know I've been inc impressed by them, actually the amount of data that you have being able to monitor where people are, are going, right? Like all the 7-Elevens, um, I, I think that's been, that's been really, really impressive. Um, I've also been impressed with the finding that you, you do find that th there are fewer trips now, uh, but that, that's not really the big one. The big one is that the miles traveled, they've really gone down. And I wonder if that's gonna also, in terms of stickiness, maybe people don't wanna go to that big box store that's very far away, they go something, you know, somewhere closer and I wonder in the future if, if they'll realize, well, I don't have to drive 20 minutes to, to buy whatever I need to buy. I can go to the one that's closer, maybe only 10 minutes away. Maybe that's something else as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the big drop in the VMT is because of uh, is the travel, right? People who don't have to travel commute to work. I mean, in general, most of our shopping we tend to do nearby. Yeah, we go to some big box stores on the weekend or one day a week to make a big shopping thing. But most of the things tend to happen closer to home or work anyways. Well, I think the minute the commute comes back or employers force people to start coming back, then I think this VMT metrics will, will jump right back up, right? The question is how many employers will push people to come back and how many will not. Uh, I personally, I'm enjoying not going to work, right? And I actually also had to travel a lot for, for work as well. I'm enjoying not doing that. So my VMT will be down and it'll stay down until the end of 2021, but not everybody will have that luxury, not a choice. So it'll be interesting uh, again to see what happens. Perfect. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Anurag. Uh, I think we can move to the next session now. Um, and the next session is by Denise. Uh, title is the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on long distance air trips. So we're gonna move from transit to air, looking at Americans expectation. Uh, so Denise is originally from Brazil where she received her degree in civil engineering from the University of Sao Paulo with a special duty certificate in transportation engineering and a master's degree in transportation planning. Uh, during her degree, she received the full scholarship from the Science Without Borders to study for one year at the University of Illinois at Chicago, which is a great place, I'm told. Uh, that was in 2013. And right now, she's a fourth-year PhD student and a transportation research assistant at uh, ASU, Arizona State University. So, Denise, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you for participating on this session. Today, I will talk about impacts of the pandemic on long-distance air trips. But before I start, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge my co-authors and all those who contributed to this research, which was not a few people. Many people have contributed to, to this project. And I want to acknowledge in particular Dr. Queenie, Dr. Stalin, and Dr. Pindiala, who helped me with this presentation. At this point, we all have realized that the pandemic has required a lot of us to make big changes in our daily lives. So instead of flying to meet people, we are doing video conferencing like we're doing right now. In fact, a research from Gensler Institute um, identified that 65% of workers actually see this as, moment. Okay. as, I'm sorry about that. I had a, a little bit of a technology hiccup here. Okay, so as I was saying, 65% of workers view an increase in virtual meeting instead of traveling for business as a positive change. So this is very interesting. There's also information um, evidence that as much as 96% of air travelers are not traveling anymore. And there's also evidence that about 30% of the world's fleet is grounded. And you can see the information, the source for those information on the bottom of this slide. And this very interesting graph from Airlines for America shows us that there was a huge drop on air travelers late March, and it kept consistently down, mostly around the world. And even though there has been a a little of a picking up pattern early July, travel frequency and re a number of air passengers have a nowhere near close, nowhere close what it used to be in 2019. But I think what is in everybody's mind right now is, will some of these behaviors actually be long-term? And we are looking, um, in this presentation, we will be looking at what people said they expect to do when the virus no longer is a threat. So a little outline of what we'll be talking about right now. Um, I'll, far, I'll first talk about the survey and how we collected data, some initial results, and then I'll show a brief model estimation and conclude with key takeaways. First and foremost, if you want more information about this study, you can always go to covidfuture.org and you can find detailed information about all our wonderful team members, as well as more preliminary results. 
So the survey, uh, Dr. Salon covered a little bit of this earlier today, but we asked questions in many aspects on how, what people used to do before the pandemic, what they are doing now at the time of the survey, and what they expect to do later. And we asked about shopping and dining, for example, social interaction and networks, as well as transports, attitudes and transport, and that's what I will be talking about today. We had a mixed recruitment and it's nationwide. We invited people directly through email and social media. So a convenience sample was part of the sample. We also had media coverage would help pick up our response rate and our sample size. We also did a random address-based email deployment as well as online panels. So we have respondents from all different sources. The survey was implemented in Qualtrics and it takes about 15 to 30 minutes to respond. It, we started collecting data in April 13th and we are currently still accepting responses. But for the purposes of this presentation, I'll show data only until August 3rd, so last week. This project has also been awarded with an NSF funding, and we are very proud of that. But we are planning on doing a panel data collection, so we will be collecting another wave of responses. And to do so, we are partnering with researchers at University of Illinois at Chicago. So some initial results, you can see that we have information from most of the, uh, the entire country, but we do have an overrepresentation of Arizonans, which is not a bad thing. And accounting for the fact that our sample may not um, represent the national population as well as we would like, we weighted the data to match national distributions of age, gender, and education. So first interesting graph, we have a sunkey plot here. Uh, we are looking at the frequency of personal trips by air on the left and how much those people actually expect to travel once COVID no longer is a threat. So you can see that even though 64% of the sample expect to keep their travel frequency about the same, a huge chunk of that is from people who were not travelers to begin with. But if you look on those to travel at least once or twice a year, you see a consistent pattern of people expecting big decreases on their travel. So even though there is some people who expect to actually travel more, the expected change pattern is towards decreasing their travel frequency, even when the virus no longer is a threat. When we look at business air trips, uh, we have a larger percentage of people who do not travel by air for business purposes. But when we look at those who actually travel at least once a year for business purposes, we see a very similar trend and people expecting to decrease their frequency for air travel. And here is looking only at those who are travelers. So about half of the respondents expect to keep their trips at the same level. However, around 40% of them expect to travel less. And that was a very interesting thing to see. And as we were very interesting on why people expect such changes, we asked those who said they want to decrease their personal travel, why they plan to do so. And the most cited reason was surprisingly I will not feel safe or comfortable sharing closed space with strangers. And that's even when COVID-19 no longer is a threat. And to me, this suggests that the new habits and um, the ways of living imposed by the pandemic might influence future travel behavior. The second most cited reason for a decrease in personal travel as people anticipating taking long distance trips by car. And 27% unfortunately said that their financial circumstances change and they can no longer travel in the same way that they used to. When we look at the reasons for increasing personal travel, the most cited reason was that after being cooked up at home for so long, people want to travel more than they used 
to do before. And also almost half of people who said that they want to increase their personal trips, they said they want to do so because they might need to take trips that were canceled because of the virus. And I guess we can understand that. When we look at business trips, the reasons for decreasing in business trips is way more, di more diverse than the reasons for decreasing personal trips. But interestingly enough, uh, the two most cited reasons are that those who I meet have realized that video calls are a good way to meet. And I realized that conducting my meetings by conference is a satisfactory solution. So this suggests that once again, some of those changes might be long-term. When um, reasons for increase in business travel, a lot of people said that they would have to take trips that were canceled. And also 38% of those who said they want to increase in their business trips, they said that their job responsibilities have changed and that would take them, that would require them to increase their business trips. We did a brief model estimation to try to understand better what are the factors driving those changes. To do so, we separated a sample of only those who travel for personal purposes at least once a year. And that brought us down for about 4,600 respondents. And here I'm showing the results of a multinomial logistic regression. Uh, my, our dependent variable was expected change in personal travel. And the base category is to keep air travel about the same it was before the pandemic. Um, I won't go into every single coefficient, but there are a few things that I want to highlight in this slide. And the first one of them is those who reported that they want to continue the new ways of living after COVID, they have a positive coefficient on traveling less. So those who were enjoying the changes that 2020 has brought into their lives, they also expect to travel less by air. So another important takeaway of this slide is workers expect lower changes, smaller changes into their air frequency. So um, their likelihood of being into about the same air frequency is actually higher. And students expect to travel more. Um, and very important on the two last rows on this table, we can see that those who reported an increase income during the pandemic, they also expect to travel more for personal purposes. And those who, ex who had an income decrease during the pandemic expect to travel less. Uh, to better understand changes in business trips, we did a very similar approach with those respondents who reported to travel at least once a year for business, for work. And that's almost 2,000 respondents. Same model approach. And now that our dependent variable is expected change in business travel instead of personal travel, as we saw on the yellow slide. And again, there is a strong relation of changing in personal travel, which is a more personal decision, um, but those who expect to travel less by personal, for, for personal purposes, I also expect to travel less by work reasons. And that's um, very interesting. Those who are concerned with a severe reaction from the virus, um, they expect bigger changes, both into tra towards travel, traveling less and traveling more. And again, income changes make a huge difference on expected change in air traveling frequency. Those who reported an income increase expect to travel more, and those who, expect, who had an income decrease expect to travel less. Some brief takeaways from this presentation is that travelers expect to change their air traveling frequency around 40%, both on personal trips and on trips for business. 
And also those who enjoyed the changes that were brought during the pandemic, they're also more likely to travel by air less than they did before the pandemic. And those who expected, um, expected change in air travel followed changes of income. And that means those who had an income increase expect to travel more by air. And those who expect, those who had income decreases expect to travel less by air. And that happened both on personal trips and on business trips. Once again, you can learn more at covidfuture.org. And thank you for participating in this session. And thank you for all the other team members that contributed to this project. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, that, was, that was spot on, right? Talking about um, stickiness and what's going to, you know, you were spot on with, with all the data that you showed in, in the modeling. And, and you know, I, I keep thinking about transit now. Before transit, you know, it's, it's really being affected. But we hope it's going to go back up at some point with air travel. Who knows if it's going to go back up, right? I know I'm traveling significantly less now, um, <laughs> and I'm enjoying it very much. Uh, so I'll definitely do way more teleconference, you know, what we're doing now. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. Any, any, so w while you, while you, you know, talk a little bit, please send me your questions by, by chat. Of course. But please, um, yeah, yeah, please. I mean, based on stickiness, I don't know about you. Do you plan to travel less or, or, or more? I don't know. I think I'll keep my travel about the same. I'm with most of the population. <laughs> but as, as a student, you're probably also with the one with the lower income population. True, but students <laughs> also reported to expect to travel more by personal purposes, according to my model. And I think I might be, I possibly be on that category as well. Who knows? Uh, I think only time uh, will tell. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Um, so, and let me, I want to, I know there, no one is asking a question, but, and you know, I'm part of the project that you're working on. Um, so what other, so if we go, if we expand a little bit from air travel and based on what you've heard before with transit, is there anything else that you have in mind in terms of stickiness, you know, anything you expect that wouldn't be happening, whether it's mostly on the Arizona side or nationwide side? Again, I think transit is facing a huge challenge and the two presentations are good examples of that. But it's hard to tell. Things are changing so fast. And it's, it's hard to predict how we are going to change our own travel. So let alone predict what's going to happen nationwide. It's, it's very challenging. Yeah, that's, that's actually a great comment. You know, we're, we're making all those models trying to see what's going to happen. And we can't even predict our own behavior, um, how we're going to behave next year at some point when, when this is all going to be over. Uh, there is one, not a question, or it is a question, but uh, from Kara, which is great work. Where's the paper? Is it online? Can we access it? Can we have a look I at the results? I don't have a paper yet, unfortunately, but soon, I guess. All right, wonderful. Uh, so, so thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, if, if you want to know more, visit covidfuture.org uh, very often. And that's where you get yes. all the papers and that's where you, you, you'll even get the data, right? All the data that, that you used for your analysis, all of that is going to be shared publicly, uh, absolutely Hopefully for free. Soon. Yeah, I think we're Hopefully expecting soon. early September as the data release date. That's our expectation. But keep checking the website. There are more preliminary results there. And it's always a great place to learn about our project. Absolutely. And if, and we're actually working on the second wave now. So if there's any, so take the survey and if there's any data, any questions that you think we're missing, please email us and let us know and we might add it. Yes. Perfect. All suggestions are very welcome. So thank you very much, Denise. Uh, now we'll move on uh, for our last uh, presentation of the session. Um, we're going to move now from Arizona to, um, to the Midwest. And we have Satish with us, Satish and, and Takahiro, who are going to tell us where the presentation is the relationship between social contact reduction and COVID-19 spread using mobility data, evidence from US and Japan. 
Um, the, so Satish is a professor in the Lyle Schools of Civil Engineering at Purdue University and his research interest is in network modeling, smart and autonomous mobility, disaster resilience and logistic systems. And uh, Taka, yep. Sorry, I thought someone was talking and Taka is with us as well. Uh, is a PhD candidate uh, with uh, Satish and his research interest is in disaster resilience, big data analytics and urban computing. Um, Satish, Taka, go for it. Well, thank you, Sibyl. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, all of you. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here and share some of our work on this uh, COVID-19 uh, spread and relationship with transportation. So this is a work, joint work with uh, my PhD student, Takahiro, who's, who's also going to make a presentation with me, and Rajat and other students. So we have a lot of ongoing work on this. We are using mobility data, uh, particularly cell phone data and other geolocation data to understand the changes in travel patterns. But we are also interested in computing inequalities that are there in cities, um, especially on the income side in terms of spatial temporal inequalities, uh, mode level inequalities and so on. Um, and we are also interested in looking at the relationship between some of the epidemiological measures and some of the travel related metrics that we see and look at the associations between these things. So this presentation particularly talks about the mobility and then the relationships with respect to the disease spread and tries to answer this fundamental question of how these mobility restrictions right, impact the visits to different POI types and its relationship to the disease spread. And as we know, all many of these countries have been imposing strict lockdowns. So here you can see the type of lockdowns which are there across different countries. And we see a significant increase in the number of COVID-19 cases across these different countries. Uh, and what every country has done is they've imposed strict lockdowns to contain the spread of this. And the question we are interested is, uh, how much of a lockdown is sufficient to kind of reduce the spread? And maybe beyond a certain level of mobility restrictions, uh, you don't get enough benefit. So the marginal benefit is not very high. Uh, and so how can you balance the economic recovery with these mobility restrictions? So that's one of the fundamental questions uh, we try to answer in this particular research. So the type of data, so in the morning session, we saw uh, very good presentations on using survey data, survey of travelers on the e-commerce side, and then trying to see how travel patterns have changed. So this talk takes a different approach. So we want to kind of use this uh, large scale mobility data of people from mobile phone data uh, and various uh, uh, apps that people use to kind of share their location information. And the advantage is you have a lot of size of this data. So for example, in Tokyo, the case study that we are going to show, we have about two or three million people data, right, for a very long period of time. And you also have this information over uh, very long time periods. The sample size is very high for this kind of a data. You also have a lot of information uh, in terms of the geolocations. Uh, you also know their POI visits and so on. And the key, of course, one drawback is you don't have demographic information of these people, but when you aggregate it at the census tract level, you can kind of infer some of these uh, uh, variables which are needed for the analysis. Previous studies have used this mobile phone data for various types of questions. Um, and one a typical question we, we get every time when we make this kind of a presentation using this data is, is there any bias in either social demographic characteristics or technology divide that could result in maybe leaving out some people who don't use this technology? And it is true that there is some level of uh, uh, overrepresentation of some groups, right? So depending upon their accessibility to technology, and certain use of these age groups, primarily beyond 65 years, you see lesser representation, right? And so studies in Africa have seen that uh, there might be some underrepresentation of groups, but in the developed world, usually this data is very representative, especially when you make inferences at the CBG level. Next slide. So, um, we, uh, the first part of this presentation, we'll, we'll talk about primarily looking at the data from Japan 
And Japan is a very unique uh, case because there have not been strict lockdowns in uh, Tokyo. Uh, there have only been some non-compulsory measures that were put in place. So Japan actually had um, the first case uh, sometime in late January, right? And then there'll be a lot of incidents after that. There've been re requests for remote work in late uh, February, then public school closures in early March. The Olympics was postponed sometime in late March. And then the state of emergency was there in early April, right? So, and you can see some other uh, events uh, in Asia which have impacted uh, some of the measures that Tokyo has taken. So, but the other thing about uh, Tokyo is they've actually had a smaller number of uh, deaths per infections and a smaller number of patients, um, despite the proximity that is there to uh, Asia. And we want to understand through this mobility analytics if some of the reasons of why we see these kind of trends. So uh, we used the collaboration with Yahoo Japan. So Yahoo Japan is used widely by many people in, uh, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, so uh, using their data, we actually have looked at the geolocation information, which tells us where people are located at any given point in time. And here you can see the uh, trip densities uh, across three time points, one in Jan late January, then in late March and mid April. And you can see that some of these major metro stations, uh, Akihabara, Tokyo Station, and so on, you can see that there's been a, a significant change in terms of the number of travelers from these stations, almost by 50% uh, by late March, and then by about 80% reduction by mid-April. So the questions are, how did this contact patterns, this, this contact patterns between various kinds of people change and if so, how is this related to the transmissibility of this COVID-19? So we are going to use some of these epidemiological measures like RT, right? So to measure these infection rates, and we're going to try to correlate these reductions in mobility with the changes in the RT values that are there in Tokyo. So this here, we see the uh, changes in travel distance with date, right? So you can see that over time, the, there's been about 40% reduction in terms of the total distance that has been people have traveled from early January to about uh, early April, right? So this is aggregated across all of the different CBGs in Tokyo. And you can also see the, uh, the stay at home rates and the stay at home rates is how many percentage of people actually stay at, uh, stay at home, right? Within a three kilometer radius. And you can see that that has increased by almost 50% over this, uh, uh, the first uh, four month time period. So people's behavior has changed. So we can look at how much of stickiness is there in terms of this behavior over time. Uh, one measure which we can kind of compute is the social contact index, which measures the relative amount of uh, co-location between various kinds of people uh, and compare this with the pre-COVID social contacts that are there, right? So it's a relative measure between how much of contacts are there today versus what those contacts are uh, before COVID. And here you can see that this measures, when you look at this measure at the aggregate level, you can see that this has actually decreased by about 60% uh, before the state of emergency was issued. And it has decreased by almost 80% uh, after the state of emergency has been issued, right? So there's been significant changes uh, even without these lockdown uh, measures in place uh, within Tokyo, right? So this kind of shows the effectiveness of some of these policies and that people are actually self-policing um, themselves. So here you can see the income inequality that is there in terms of this uh, social contact reduction. That means all income groups don't necessarily reduce the mobility in the same way. Uh, one question of interest to us is, how does, how does this mobility restrictions vary between higher income groups, middle income groups, and lower income groups? And also with respect to the, the, the census blocks that people live in, are there variabilities, are there heterogeneities that we actually see in terms of this mobility restrictions, right? And here, what you could see, you can see on this left side, the income groups, right? So you can see that the higher income groups are in the center of Tokyo, uh, in Minato and Chiyoda. And then the, some of the lower income groups are in the outside parts of uh, 
there's Tokyo. And here on the right side, you can see the reductions in the daily contact. So one key finding here is that where lower income groups were not able to reduce uh, their social contacts as much as higher income groups, right? So in fact, lower income groups uh, can only reduce by about 40, 30 to 40 percent, whereas higher income groups reduce by almost 80 uh, percent in terms of their social contacts. And with this, uh, we also can look at the relationship between the social contacts and the RT values. So here we actually compute the relationship between the RT, which is the number of infections that are there from an infected person. And you can see the social contact reductions. So here you see that beyond this uh, contact reduction of about uh, 0.34, there's not a significant marginal difference in terms of this RT. So RT is got from the real world epidemiological data in terms of the number of infections that are happening on a daily basis, right? So here, what you see is uh, beyond a certain reduction in terms of this mobility, you don't get a significant um, uh, benefit in terms of this reduction in infection. So what is, what, what is the key finding here? That means severe mobility restrictions actually do not help us to reduce these infections beyond a certain point. So what is that sweet spot of mobility restrictions where we could balance between opening the economy versus reducing these infections? And this kind of provides a clue into that kind of uh, analysis. Of course, we don't really consider the uh, other types of uh, behavioral changes that are in place, like people washing hands, wearing masks, and so on. So when we have those kind of informations from survey data, that would help us to complement this and provide more insight into this. So with this, I will, um, uh, I will ask Taka to kind of uh, continue this presentation uh, on social contact uh, re reductions and then some of the data that we have from the US. Okay, thank you, Professor. Hi, I'm Taka, a PhD candidate at uh, Purdue. So I'll uh, explain what social contacts of uh, around 0 0.34 means. Uh, it's, it's better for us to understand uh, what this in a value actually means rather than uh, the 0 0.34 value. Um, so you can see here the relative visits on April 3rd uh, by various POI types, uh, po point of interest types, uh, businesses, shopping, parks, uh, stations, and also Haneda Airport, which is the uh, main airport of Tokyo. So around the 0.34 social contacts, uh, which is around 34% of the usual uh, amount of contacts people have, um, that corresponds to around 60% visit number of visits to these different types of POIs. So converting those social contact values into actual counts of people uh, visiting these locations um, could inform uh, policy making uh, much easier. And this also just suggests that the state of emergency, which is imposed in uh, April 7th, uh, induced some excessive uh, social contact reduction in Tokyo. So uh, looking at this further, uh, we've looked at this data uh, since April as well. So uh, we'll have more insights um, in the second wave uh, for Japan uh, in the upcoming um, months. So with this, I'll move on to the analysis we did uh, in the US. Um, in the US, we, did, <clears throat> we weren't uh, able to um, use data on the individual level. So location data in Japan, there were individual mobility uh, data uh, for individual users. But here we use the location data provided by SafeGraph, uh, which is a company who aggregates data uh, and counts the daily number of visits to each POI point of interest. And <clears throat> it also has the social demographic information on who's visiting. Um, one uh, rather straightforward index uh, to look at would be the number of visits. So the number of visits to each POI. Um, when we look at uh, the number of visits to each POI, we see uh, obviously a large reduction in various POIs um, during March. It stays like that uh, until uh, end of uh, June. We see that hospitals and coffee shops uh, saw the smallest decrease where uh, schools and ho hotels uh, show the, uh, saw the sharpest decrease. But in addition to this, uh, vis uh, visits metrics, we can also compute a social distancing metric uh, using uh, both the number of people who visit each POI and also the area of each POI, uh, the actual area of each building. Um, so here, this is a simple metric that uses that calculates the distance between visitors at a POI, assuming that 
they're arranged in a square grid uh, over the entire floor area of that POI. Um, so it's the the met, uh, the units will be in uh, feet. So how much on average, uh, how much how, how much feet or how much distance are each individual uh, user uh, having e between each other uh, in these POIs? And when we look at this metric, we can compute this metric for various POIs as well. Uh, so you see here uh, daycare centers, fast food joints, fitness centers, gas stations, et cetera. Um, some striking uh, patterns we see, uh, in, especially in daycare centers and schools, we see this continuous high social distance uh, since uh, mid-March uh, up until uh, end of uh, July. Um, obviously, this is because schools uh, haven't reopened yet in many areas and also daycare centers as well. But on the other hand, we see uh, this gradual decrease in social distancing. So people, more people, more people coming into contact uh, with higher densities um, gradually in many other POIs. So we can use this information to really see <coughs> which POIs, uh, at which POIs people are getting into more contact and hopefully in the future in further work see uh, which POI should we shut down to prevent the spread of disease, the COVID-19. Similarly to the analysis in Japan, we look at the uh, correlations, uh, associations between mobility and effective reproduction number, RT. Um, here also, uh, similar to the analysis in Japan, the conclusion in Japan, uh, that RT generally decreases with decrease in mobility. So obviously <clears throat> with more social distancing, so more, more visits, uh, we're able to um, decrease or reduce the spread of uh, the disease. And again, similarly uh, to what we see in Japan, uh, we see a significant um, income inequality in how much uh, mobility are, how much mobility people are able to reduce uh, compared to pre-disaster, uh, pre-COVID, sorry, pre-COVID standards. And you see that higher income people in the dark green um, are able to reduce more compared to the less uh, in, um, lower income people. Um, and this, this holds for not just New York City, but for Chicago, Seattle uh, as well. So uh, this reflects the fact that uh, higher income people um, are able to work more from home uh, while uh, lower income people, uh, they have higher likelihood of having to commute to work um, even in this uh, emergency period. So, so looking at the, uh, the analysis from both the, uh, Japan and the US, uh, we see that mobile phone data analysis can inform policymakers on various things, um, including changes in the mobility patterns and also so social contact rates. And comparing the social contact rates with the actual uh, RT values, the uh, tr disease transmissibility values, um, show the significant correlation between uh, social contact reduction and the decrease in transmissibility. And also in both uh, the US and Japan, uh, income inequality was observed to be significant. Um, so uh, higher income people having less contacts uh, compared to pre-COVID uh, was very common uh, across these two different cities, uh, two different country, countries. So addressing this inequality issue uh, would be one of uh, Further, a further issue that we should uh, think about in the future. So for future works, um, linking mobility data analysis, what, what we showed today to evaluating, actually, you know, actually evaluating and saying, all well, this policy intervention was good, this was bad, this was uh, how much effect uh, each policy had uh, would be another item. Also, um, which POI should be closed uh, or uh, restrict? to reduce uh, RT efficient in an efficient manner? Uh, that'll be another uh, research question that we'll, we'll be interested in in the future. With that, uh, thank you so much and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much, wonderful. I know we're past the official time now, but I know we have a few minutes and the session just before us uh, lasted a bit longer. Um, and we do have you know, questions already for you. And uh, unsurprisingly, the questions are about Japan and how Japan did things probably better than the US, uh, partly thanks to some experience. So we were talking about uh, SARS-1, about MERS, um, so those other epidemics. 
uh, could Japan uh, take any lessons and did they could they apply those lessons earlier on? Do you, do you know Maybe anything can... about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm from Japan myself and I'm actually currently in Japan and um, uh, to be honest, I think uh, the mask wearing um, culture uh, is very different from the one in the US. Um, people are very used to wearing masks and if you walk in Tokyo, um, the mask percentage uh, I feel like is around 90%. Um, so I think that that is one factor that I think uh, helped reduce the chance of visibility. Also, you see here is that even before the state of emergency, which was uh, in April 7th, people started restricting themselves uh, from being in contact with, with each other. And you see, even in March, where when we didn't have any um, infections, um, I mean, we, didn't, we had some, but uh, they were very low. Um, we had 60% reduction of social contacts, even before the state of emergency. So this kind of um, uh, character, I guess, um, this behavioral change and also the uh, masking uh, culture, I think those, were two, those are two significant uh, factors that helped us keep this um, under and, control for you think a long time. Yeah. And, and you think that, that people, um, the, the behavior just emerged because people learned themselves from the previous epidemics? That might be the case. Um, that might be the case. Yeah, we had, you know, SARS, MERS, as you, as you mentioned uh, before. I think that's one, um, that's one factor. But I th also think that, um, yeah, we have, in, in our society, we have more peer pressure. Um, so, you know, if, if uh, you're not following the rules of, of society, then um, people look at you like, hey, I, so we, we do have this different kind of culture. <laughs> I think that's... So that's I, uh, I think it is the cultural norms that are there, uh -huh. not only Japan, but all of East Asia, um, where I think, I mean, different form of greeting people, they maintain a certain amount of distance, uh, uh -huh. they wear masks when, uh, when they're sick. So that's already there in those cultural norms and those cultural norms do, do, do certainly play a role in terms of some of the things that we're doing. And also as people actually uh, 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 self-policing themselves in terms of how they actually react to these things. So that's also something we see. So they don't wait for the state of emergency to be actually declared for some of these things to actually happen. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. I mean, I, and I think the question was about even if, this, if the government had implemented anything in particular. I know for example, in Taiwan, uh, right when the few cases started, I think in, in December in Wuhan, they started to check the temperature of everyone coming out of planes from Wuhan. So very early on, they started to apply some measures because they knew this could be big. Um, so nothing to do with the cultural aspect. Um, so I think that was the question, but that's fine. And, and, and there was another question which was really relevant, which is, um, do you think, I mean, I don't know if you could, and this one is from Fiona, but were you able to look at the distribution of the social contact indices too? Um, so if you know, t talks to us about the super spreaders, so instead of looking at averages, could you look at distributions? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a really uh, good point. Uh, we looked at the uh, mean values here, but I'm guessing, and I think uh, from previous wor uh, works in, in our lab uh, done by other um, members, I think, there's going to be this uh, long tail distribution um, in these um, degrees uh, of con social contact degrees. So, yes, I think uh, sp super spreaders is a problem in Japan as well. So, I think that's another. So we haven't looked at is it. That yet, uh, but, so, is that yeah. something? Is that something you could look at? Is that something? Yes, you yes, could yes measure? definitely. Yes. yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so yeah. Um, our sense is, I mean, based on our past work, I think you're going to see a few people who have a lot of contacts and a lot of people who have an average number of contacts, so which is what we are reporting in terms of the mean. So it'll be, it'll be very interesting to see who those few people are uh, who have a lot of contacts and then kind of see how their behavior is actually changing and where they're traveling uh, and what type of activities they're participating in. We could certainly do with that with the, in, in this analysis and that's something yeah, we should certainly think about. Wonderful, wonderful. I mean, there's there's a few more comments on, on the chat um, with similar findings in Texas, that's from Sky, similar findings in, in Texas in terms of social distancing privilege for the people with higher income. Um, so these are even universal patterns that we tend to be seeing. This is very, very interesting. 
I know we're at 23 past the hour. A lot of you probably are dying to go to the bathroom. You know, you just have seven minutes before the next session starts. I'm sorry, I'm all in the dark. It's, I don't know what time it is in Tokyo. It's 9.30 here in France. Um, so I, you can't see me too much. Uh, but I, I think it's time to close out the session. I'm going to give you a you know, big virtual clap to all the speakers um, today. Thank you very much. And, and let's keep the research going and let's try to make things come back to the new normal as smoothly and as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Sybil. And thanks, thanks, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So we're going to be starting actually in six minutes the next session. So thanks, everyone. Right. Um, I, so this is Debra. I think, wow, it's exactly time to kind of restart. Um, and hopefully with, uh, I see the, the number of participants is down for the moment, but hopefully a few more will, will come back. But still, there's, there's quite a few. Anyhow, um, I am pleased to be moderating the last session in this track for the day. Of course, there'll be more tomorrow. And let's see, I, I asked all of our presenters to share some, just kind of a, a bio with me. So, um, so I'll, I'll introduce folks. So this session is looking at disruptions. It's called COVID-19 disruptions. And so we'll be hearing from a bunch of different folks from, uh, from various places that have been doing their own data collection and analysis of existing data about how, you know, different ways that this has disrupted um, what we're doing. So anyhow, so without further ado, I'll give it over to Kevin, who is our first presenter, who's an associate professor in the Department of Geography at the McGill, um, at McGill University, in the Departments of Geography and in the School of Environment. And he has a number of co-authors all of whose names I can't necessarily pronounce, so I'm gonna leave it to you. So take it away, Kevin. Great, thanks, thanks a lot, Deborah. I'll try to get my, uh, get my screen. Are you seeing my screen now? It, it seems to be, yes. it looks like you're, yes? Yeah. yeah? Oh yeah, okay. I was thinking that was the Antel, <laughs> nice job. Okay, okay, so I do not know what happened, but I will start for real now. Thanks for your patience. So, um, so quickly, I, I'm Kevin Mana, as Deborah already said, I'm from McGill University and I'm presenting some work today. Um, I'm excited to share the sort of preliminary work that I've been working on with, with this team of researchers. And we've been looking at um, social interactions, uh, changes in travel, travel behavior um, through the lens of well-being, kind of understanding how this, this shutdown has impacted people um, in the last four months or so. And to give some sense of, of the background, um, as we're all well aware, uh, the re restrictions that went in place in February or March of this year you know, dramatically changed the way we were, um, you know, if and how and when we were getting out of the house and, and who and how we were interacting with other people, whether that was whether it was face to face or, or um, more virtually. And for most of us, you know, even the most introverted among us, or you know, uh, this the idea of, of physically present interactions was a key part of, of most of our lives you know, in, in the pre-COVID time period. And then again, anyone who's participating in today's sessions knows that we do have access to a lot of you know, modern communication technology that allows many people to, to still communicate and collaborate and, and, and interact with people um, without being face-to-face. -face. Um, but what we can see here in fact, I wanted to say quickly, so on this slide, what you're seeing are kind of, kind of the extremes of what some cities did to respond to this kind of the physical distancing and sort of stay at home orders that we had. So on, on the right picture, you see uh, a street in, in Montreal that was basically half closed down um, to car traffic in order to open up um, for pedestrians and cyclists. So what you kind of see on the right side of that street was only open for pedestrians and cyclists. And then you see these kind of signs, which I guess I imagine in most cities, you know, we're you know, basically telling you to walk on the grass and, and you know, make sure you're keeping your, your two meter distance. But then on the other side of the, of the extreme was on the left where a lot of things like public parks and, and swimming pools were closed and, and in fact still are um, to the fear of people being too close. So you see kind of a big you know, park, park close kind of sign. And a lot of what was motivating the research was this idea of that you know interacting, getting out of the house is is a really important part. Interacting with 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 neighbors, interacting with 
um, you know, strangers on the street, with with merchants at the shops you go to, is is a big part of, of our sort of social life and our you know and how we derive you know well being or happiness or those kind of things. And we wanted to understand how certain destinations and modes people used to get there were were or were not inducive to, to well being. And then probably the most important kind of motivating idea behind this was understanding, as a lot of folks have been talking about in other sessions today, was that we're well aware that the opportunity to, sh to shelter in place or to be able to practice physical distancing from other, from other people out in public is this, is this you know, complex interaction of features of the natural environment, of the built environment, and, and social environments, um, which are not at all evenly distributed through society. So we saw it in Montreal, um, tragically, as we saw in many places around the world, that the the you know the ability to be able to be out safely um, was definitely not distributed, you know, fairly or equitably by income or racial racial lines, where um, you know the the disease spread a lot faster in some of the racialized and poor neighborhoods in the in the in the city, for example. And so, what we wanted to do is is understand kind of you know the the team of, of researchers, both both individually and and together, have looked at various ways of thinking about social well-being um, as you know as a function of external intrinsic factors. And today, we're going to be focusing almost entirely on this idea of access um, and friends and family interactions and social activities. And we can think about it basically as well-being being, being um, an outcome of daily travel patterns in terms of the you know, mode and destination and the activities that happen, the interactions that happen. And you know, previous work has, has made strong connections between um, things like satisfaction, well-being related to mode people are using and, and different kinds of destinations like, like you know, public parks, large parks, um, as well as things people are usually more, more happy with things uh, like uh, active modes of transport. So we wanted to understand that in the context of this, of this COVID-19 lockdown. So in order to get at some of these questions, we launched a survey uh, on May 14th. And so it was, it went out as some of those other things I've seen today, you know, went out through social media, got some, some, we were interviewed on the radio to get some, some local um, interest in the survey. The results I'll be talking about today are just the, the Canada um, or the, the North American sample. Um, we also collected 688 um, surveys in China, where as luck would have it, our, our team is located in, in, the, in Canada, the US and, and China. Um, but today's analysis will, won't include the results from China, which are still being, uh, still being analyzed. The survey was of course voluntary. We, did, we didn't offer any, any incentives. And just to give some quick kind of descriptions, so it was um, an older survey than is, would re be representative of, of, the, of, the, of the country, of the world as a whole. Um, so, and it was about 70% uh, women and about four, the average age was 40 years old. As I've already mentioned, we're looking today at this, this mostly this Canada and US sample, and we hope to dig into the, the Chinese and other places later. And one of the first questions we were interested in is understanding um, because different cities or municipalities or states or, or provinces were all at different stages in terms of their, their sort of lockdown, one of the first things we wanted to understand was what the status of, of a participant was in terms of whether they could make trips as normal. And so as you can see, um, a, very, a tiny, less than 1% of respondents uh, were making trips at, as normal, 0.3%. You know, and the, you know, the vast majority of people were, um, were only able to uh, to make just essential trips, so that's people who are working in, in jobs that were deemed essential in, in healthcare and, and food service, for example. Um, and for most people, even if they were allowed to do trips, things like big social gatherings, um, you know, we had a limit of about five people that could um, be um, together at one time while still practicing physical distancing. And then similar in terms of situation for trips, so a, a very small percentage of people said they could they could make trips um, as as they wish, quote unquote, as they wish. And for most people, there was it, it was things like I can do some trips, I can only do essential trips, and then a tiny part of the people were were actually quarantined. So the trips over the last few days, I think it was actually trips in the last week, um, was about four four trips on average. Um, Per, per participants in, in our sample. So very much smaller than would be normal, obviously. Um, and so we also wanted to know about how people were interacting, whether it was face-to-face, -face, whether it was virtually, how people felt about those, those interactions. So we have lots of questions about to try to capture um, what was going on. 
And in this idea about sort of the missing trips, both of, we have questions about these things, what they miss with people, as, as well as the trips that they're, they're making. And which, which I go into a little bit here in terms of understanding, we have questions about 13 different destinations, which I'll get into in a second. Um, so where they go before, sort of in a normal situation, and then during the lockdown situation, as well as the mode both before and after, and questions about their satisfaction. And then I should, I should mention even more strongly than normal, this is, these are very preliminary results. I'm basically gonna be presenting a lot of descriptive statistics, and I'll hint at some of the regression analysis that we did at the end, and then sort of point towards the ongoing analysis where we're trying to dig more deeply, especially in terms of these, some of these sort of cross-cultural and cross-national cross -national, um, analysis that we're, that we're hoping to do. So, so first of all, um, looking at the frequency of different destinations. And so the, this dark blue color represents the, the never category. So in terms of, so for a lot of these different categories like work, um, people were never or nearly never. I mean, so that's you know, almost 80% of, of people were never or nearly never going to work, um, you know, going out to restaurants, um, meeting friends, and then you see some of the more slightly more common things that people were still going out for groceries, going out uh, to pharmacies, as well as people were, you know, a few times a week or most days going to sort of, you know, what we kind of green and blue space kind of, you know, destinations like waterfronts and, and civic parks and, and then large regional parks. But things like meeting friends and work were, were things that, you know, drastically dropped, where some of the other things that were more solo trips were, were still happening. And then kind of as a flip side to this, what we're looking at in terms of trips that people missed. So again, this was something that was motivating the work in terms of understanding kind of foregone trips, trips that weren't happening, um, sort of commute nostalgia type of questions. And what we can see here, um, you know, as we would expect, you know, it sort of fits the how we went into this, people missed seeing their friends a lot. So, so you know, you know but, uh, almost 80% of people responded that they missed seeing friends um, a, a lot category. Um, it's, it's virtually 100% to either a lot or, or somewhat. So things like going to see friends, other kind of sort of social activities like restaurants and, and, and coffee shops and things also you know, ranked pretty high on, on that scale. Where things like on the sort of far end of the scale, things like groceries and pharmacies, mostly because people were, were, were making those trips, so people didn't really miss these trips that, that, that actually were happening. And then beyond thinking about just missing the desti a particular destination or not, we wanted to figure out what exactly pe people missed. So we can, we can see here, again, so if we think about the, the sort of light blue color, yes, extremely yellow, yes, quite a bit, um, gray, yes, somewhat, we could see that people really miss physical contact with other people. You know, you know, you know, we've all gotten used to being, you know, two meters apart or or shaking hands with our elbows and these kind of things. So, so that physical contact is something that people are are missing, as well as chatting with colleagues. And then, you know, the most, you know, about ninety percent of of people, the vast majority of people, missed chatting with their friends, um, and as well as quite a few people missed chatting with their family. And I should clarify that that's family members who live in a different households. So we're not, we're not talking about family members in the same household, um, but family members who live elsewhere, people are missing those kind of, those physically present interactions. And then, so, so looking at commute mode before and after, so just basically want to focus on the first two lines where we see, um, so online, so in the before commute, uh, be the commute mode before COVID-19, you know, a, a very small amount of people, about you know, less than five percent of of the sample, was already engaged in regular, um, you know, telecommuting or online commuting, where that, unsurprisingly, went up to about twenty six percent during the COVID time period, and the the NA category is, is more sort of troubling in the sense of that that's people who you know didn't commute in any way before COVID, and so we're we're looking at basically, um, you know, un, unemployed or, or underemployed people which I guess, again, from seeing some, some stats earlier today, that sort of 50% figure seems to be consistent that there was you know, a, a large amount of people who simply weren't commuting at all um, or, or working at all during, during that time period. And then all of the other modes, whether they're active modes or, or public transport, transport or private vehicle, all, all dropped dramatically during, during that time period. And then we also wanted to look at, so here we're looking at face-to-face -face versus virtual trips. Uh, or virtual interactions, and then so family face F to F means face to face, and and so again that's 
family members in a different household. Again, and so we see that it's happening very rarely in person, but happening much more virtually, which is essentially what we're seeing here is that the, the three virtual categories um, are happening basically at, at least once per month, um, but in, in some cases, multiple times a day and, and most days for things like virtual trips, or virtual interactions with family and friends. And, and here we see, so this is changes in how people communicated. And so uh, the, the first, so we're talking on the telephone versus texting on the telephone are these, are these two categories. And basically what we can see, again, not surprising to anyone participating in, in something like this, you know, where our, our use of video has increased dramatically, where, you know, about 70% of people say it's increased a lot, um, but the vast majority of people are, are saying it, it has increased, um, either increased or increased a lot, or our use of um, communications. And then we also wanted to know more trip specific levels. So we asked questions about the last um, three trips, essentially. And so understanding how people, um, you know, who you saw, who, are you, who, are you, who you were with, um, what kinds of interactions you, you had. Um, and, you know, even for some people, even in a, in a quote unquote normal situation, it might be stressful to see people on the street. But, but under COVID, um, you know, it led to a lot of, um, you know, not you know these kind of new ways to navigate sidewalks you know understanding who would sort of step off you know you know potentially being adding stress and not knowing people were, would, would want to interact or whether they're wearing a mask I and mean, so it led to all these sort of new ways of, of thinking here and so we asked questions about what kind of interactions happened on the, on the trip and so you can see here these are non mutually exclusive categories. So to basically talk about, you know, maybe you maybe you did chat to someone and, and only waved to someone else. Um, but you can see that most trips didn't have any interaction, or or if, if they did, it was it was quite quite brief. And then in terms of um, some of these preliminary regression type models we ran, so we re ran an ordered logic model on a seven port Likert scale, uh, Likert scale, and and so looking at things like mode, which somewhat unexpectedly didn't have any statistical significance, but things like there was a positive association with life satisfaction and traveling to large parks and sort of nature destinations as well as meeting friends. So as expected, some of those more sort of social type of things and or natural type of things, where it was a negative finding for eating at a restaurant. Um, also saw this idea of the sort of missing trip. So, so we see that, um, you know, people missed those, those types of trips as, as we've already mentioned. And then in terms of life satisfaction and measures of social interaction. And so we see a positive relationship between virtual interaction with family, face-to-face -face and, and local friends. Um, but that didn't impact sort of satisfaction with social interaction during COVID. And we see that satisfaction with, um, with social interactions, as I explained about 10% of, of life satisfaction and, and satisfaction with the substitution of these, of these kind of, you know, different kind of communication technologies um, for face-to-face -face interactions explain about 9% of the variance in, in the life satisfaction. Um, so we can see that people did miss, um, you know, miss seeing family, friends, and, and, um, and, and colleagues. And so, you know, in, in conclusion, the more you miss those types of interactions, the lower your life satisfaction. And so this brought up a couple things in terms of, so this idea of nature destinations were associated with um, with more well-being and and this kind of this kind of Japanese concept of, of forest bathing in terms of understanding you know, how to you know, re reduce stress by being outside in nature and as I brought up in one of the first slides this this is kind of we're trying to, to look at this through the lens of of understanding who has access to these you know kind of things you know access to parks is is linked here in Canada as, as well as most places in the world is is often linked to higher housing prices and unaffordability uh, as well as you know, being able to access a regional park, you know, then depends on some kind of, of private vehicle. Um, you know, partly because public transport often doesn't go there, or especially under COVID-19, is is less frequent, or you know, people were were scared for better or worse to to use those modes. So there's there's definitely a, an issue of of who can access those kinds of definite destinations. And the kind of things we're still trying to explore then are getting more in terms of what what people's expectations are in terms of um, you know sort of introverted versus extroverted or um, you know what what some people are kind of looking for when they leave the house in terms of their their sort of thresholds or or the expectations for social interaction when they're outside the home. And and some of the 
ongoing analysis, which we hope to, to have soon, are also looking at, as we have an address or postal code or zip code for all participants, um, where some of the next steps are looking more at these kind of objective built to natural features, understanding you know, where people felt um, you know, happier or had, more, had, had more higher levels of well-being um, under, under this, this sort of lockdown and see what that means for either for future lockdowns, depending on how, or, and or depending on how long this, this, this continues to go. And, and because we have somewhat large samples in at least three countries, um, part of what we want to do is also look at these differences across these, these countries and understand what, um, you know, what might be different in terms of you know, these you know, Canada, the U.S., and China, which in, in some ways um, have some you know, cultural and other differences too. And then this idea of, of these equity issues in, in terms of who has access to neighborhoods which, which foster well-being and, and comfort and, and, and safety as well. Um, so with that, I'll say thanks for listening. Sorry for the beginning of all that. And I'm happy to discuss or answer any questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kevin. That was really, really interesting. It's something that I think a lot of us have been trying to think about a bit is what or understand or wrap our heads around, you know, how is this impacting our, I don't know, well, sense of well-being, uh, life satisfaction and all that. I'm going to say there's a couple questions in the chat, but I am going to ask that you respond to them um, virtually, like, you know, type them because we don't, I just don't want to lose track of time. So let's move on to the next presenter and we can hopefully have a little bit of time for actual uh, discussion later. Um, so with no further ado, the next presenter whose name I have to say I I'm not sure I can pronounce, but Dr. Sefer Gator is a research scientist in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Assistant Director of the Maryland Transportation Institute. Um, Dr. Gator has been studying mobile device location data applications for the past couple of years, and um, we're looking forward to hearing what he has to say. So, uh, Dr. Gator, hopefully you're there and are able to share your screen. Excellent. Hi everyone. Thanks Deborah for the introduction and I think you did a good job on the pronunciation. So thanks, <laughs> thanks for being here. Let me just uh, do presentation mode here so that you can see the full screen. Uh, today I want to talk about a platform that we created for tracking the effect of COVID on mobility, social distancing, and economic impact. And we use mobile device location data for this effort. Um, Dr. Lei Zhang is uh, the director of our center and he couldn't be here, but I'm gonna present the entire slide deck on behalf of him and our institute. So uh, a brief introduction to Maryland Transportation Institute. We, are, we, have, we have a lot of expertise in mobile device location data, and we are, we are a home to the uh, largest transportation data center in the U.S., serving more than 12,000 government and corporate users in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. So we, we have been working on mobile device location data for the past few years. We have a big data pool that has multimodal travel um, information. In this figure, you can see that we can zoom in into different areas and see how multimodal travel trends uh, can be observed in different regions. Here we zoom into the Baltimore area and zoom into the Inner Harbor area to see the patterns of movements by driving rail, bus, walk, and bike. So due to the expertise and the, data, and the big data sets that we had, we realized that we can be of value to the community and produce a platform that can visualize different aspects of the impact that COVID-19 has on us, both with display on our mobility and also on the economy, on uh, vulnerable uh, population groups. So it started as a, an as a data for public good initiative in our institute, but later we got a sponsor, we got fundings from uh, Federal Highway Administration and a couple of research grants from National Science Foundation. The platform got a very good media coverage, was covered on Washington Post, New York Times, CNN, NBC, ABC a couple of times. So, uh, you can check the platform on data.covid.umd.edu. I think the link was on the first slide. It's also in, in a later sl slide as well. So 
um, I briefly introduced the methodology on how we process the data and produce the metrics on the platform. So we receive anonymized location data from uh, various companies that produce these sort of data. We first clean the data and fuse the data sets from different data providers. As the first step after data cleaning and, uh, and uh, data fusion, we run trip identification because this mobile device location data doesn't come in trip format. We have uh, anonymized device ID, latitude, longitude information, but, it, but it's continuously recorded and we don't know which locations form a trip together. So we should identify the trips. Then again, we don't have the context of trip in terms of travel mode, trip purpose, social demographic of the traveler. What we do at this step is that is we have a set of machine learning and the statistical algorithms that impute trip purpose, travel mode, and traveler social demographics. Then we would have a nationwide trip roster that includes all trips that are observed in our, in our sample. Even though we have data set about like about 150 million monthly active users in the United States, we still do not capture the entire population. So what we need to do is to weight the data and extrapolate so that all metrics on our platform can uh, represent population level movements. So we do a multi-level weighting and then we integrate the mobility data that is obtained at this step with data sets from COVID cases that we receive from uh, John Hopkins uh, website. And we also integrate the data with population data uh, and social demographic data from census in order to produce the metrics uh, on our platform. And the methodology was first developed as a part of Federal Highway Exploratory Advanced Research Project that we did over the past few years. And eventually we, produ we produce uh, metrics that are, that are available on the platform. So here you can see one example of these metrics. Here we are showing percentage of workers working from home by a state. And as we expect, the number of workers working from home uh, first went up uh, after the pandemic, but then later on it went down a little bit. Some of the findings that we had we can see one of the interesting findings that was kind of surprising to us in the beginning, in the earlier days, was related to a concept we called social distancing inertia. So right after the national uh, state of emergency was issued, we saw a sudden uh, increase in social distancing related metrics, whether percentage of people staying home or trip rates or miles traveled per person. So we saw a huge increase uh, right after the state of emergency. But even though the cases were skyrocketing after that, we saw a plateau, plateau effect after about two weeks, which was kind of interesting for us. We called that social distancing inertia. Uh, uh, so in summary, even though the cases were still rising and rising, we were seeing a plateau on almost all of the social distancing uh, related metrics. Here we can see another effect that we observed, we called uh, social distancing fatigue, which was even though again, the cases were rising and that things were getting worse, we were seeing that people, after about a month or a month and a half, we were seeing that people are not practicing social distancing as much as they were doing before. So we, uh, apparently people are getting either tired from staying at home or the signals that they were getting, they were getting from the media was persuading them to practice social distancing less. So here you can see obviously red uh, squares in the beginning because there were, it is pre-pandemic, then things got, got blue, but again, after a few weeks, then things got red and worse. Uh, but here I, I talked about the metrics that we had on the platform, but we thought how can we help the decision makers and uh, give them in, uh, useful information so that they can digest the information and see how they are doing in comparison with the thresholds that are available out there, whether by the gating criteria that were issued by the White House or uh, the threshold that for uh, information that were being given by the World Health Organization. Uh, so we created another uh, tool called uh, SERA, which stands for Society and Economy Reopening Assessment. So in, that, in this tool, which is a part of our platform, we show, sorry, we show different uh, decision makers, whether at county or state levels, how their state or county is 
doing with respect to the thresholds that are out there and also how they are compared with other counties and states so that they can see if they're doing better than their counterparts or if they're doing better than the thresholds that are out there and criteria that are out there and they could they could be they could see how they ranked with respect to others in this sara tool we have information about mobility but we also include information about health uh, public health and social and vulnerable uh, population groups and all these aspects are considered in our uh, reopening assessment tools now some of the other applications that are uh, that we did uh, after the platform that are using similar data, uh, we worked on reopening decision support, traffic and travel behavior monitoring, mass travel analysis, point of interest, uh, trend, visit trends, epidemic modeling, hotspot, moni hotspot monitoring, uh, and outbreak prediction, community level contact tracing, uh, monitoring external trips and imported cases, economic and job impact tracking, and um, monitoring economic recovery. So I briefly touched upon some of these aspects as time permits, and then I'm gonna finish this presentation. Uh, so next, here is, this is just one of the applications we are doing for BTS, Bureau of Transportation Statistics. We are producing uh, information about weekly uh, trip rates in different trip distance bins so you can hear in this slide you can see the comparison between 2019 and 2020 and as expected 2020 uh, was showing a little bit higher trip rates but after the pandemic it went down and it uh, it shows how things are different this year with respect to the previous year and you can check this data in detail at bts.gov slash daily travel another application uh, we are doing for our campus is with respect to the uh, studying the densification of the campus in this year in comparison to, with the previous year and it, you can see that during july the campus the campus visits was, uh, was about 20 percent of what the level it was last year and it's gradually increasing uh, during the late july another application we studied visits to grocery stores by point of interest studies so you can see the, we compared the arrival time and dwell time for visits to grocery stores. We can see that before pandemic, the visits were mainly toward the afternoon peak part of the day where people are done with their job work. But now during the pandemic days, the, we, we saw a peak spreading effect and people were visiting grocery stores more spread throughout the day. A number of visits were lower, but the dwell times were a little bit higher. As expected, people were going to grocery stores a little bit less frequently, but they were staying at the grocery stores for a little bit longer duration. Another application that we studied was on the effect of reopening. So in this specific case, we studied Georgia, and because uh, they were the first state to widely reopen, and we saw, we saw interesting, we had interesting observations. We saw that percentage of staying uh, home went down by 32% right after the reopening. So just compa comparing the day of re reopening with the uh, one day before, we saw 32% decrease in person staying at home. Similar observations uh, were made in other metrics such as distance traveled went up by 19%, number of non-work trips went up by 24% and out of state trips uh, went up by 13% and it all showed a significant eff effect of reopening on different aspects of uh, mobility just right after the reopening even when we look at one day after reopening. Another application that we study is, is in terms of imported cases. So we realized that uh, travels are causing a lot of these new cases. So we had a, we had a hypothesis about the effect of travel and new cases. So we modeled imported cases using travels between counties and also cases, number of ca active cases at origin counties. And we showed a significant correlation between this modeled imported cases metric and also new cases at each county, which shows the huge effect of travels 
on um, COVID cases. Another aspect we are doing for a couple of counties uh, in Maryland, we are studying uh, out of county trips for them. We are present, we are uh, visualizing the hot spots for out of county trips in terms of trip origin and also in terms of trip destination so that they can see where are the places that they need to pay more attention in terms of uh, trips from out of county and trips that may bring new COVID uh, cases with themselves. Uh, Baltimore County also asked us to study visits to 6,000 point of interest locations that they were interested in. So we studied all the visits to these point of interest by time so that they could see which ones are being visited at the pre-pandemic capacity and which ones are uh, more likely to be new uh, hotspots for cases. So this is just a summary at like POI type level. You can see how different visits to different POI types went down after the pandemic, but gradually increased after a few weeks. So just an example of the type of applications that you can do with this sort of mobile device location data and point of interest data. Uh, last, uh, last but not, but not least, uh, this is uh, another study that we did with respect to uh, community level contact tracing. So there was this outbreak at one of the nursing homes in our area called Pleasant View Nursing Home. We studied the pattern of visits to this nursing home to see if there is any correlation between the visits to the nursing home and the confirmed cases. And we saw a peak of visits about two weeks before the first confirmed case at the nursing home. And we studied all the trip destinations for places uh, for trips from the nursing home so that we can have a sense on where are the likely points for new outbreak in the future? So that's it on my presentation. I would be happy to answer questions if there are any. Wow, thank you so much. That is, that, that was, that, your work is just pretty incredible. I've, I'd seen your dashboard before, but I didn't, hadn't seen obviously all of those use cases. And it's really fantastic to see all the different applications that you're able to implement and just inform people about uh, in various levels of government um, and, and everyone uh, to try to help help the situation. So that's really great. Are there any, um, let me look in the chat. I don't see anything right now in the chat. Does anyone have any? Yeah, Kara says, excellent work. Yeah, I mean, it's really incredible. Um, well, what do you think, I guess, since no one else has a question right now, and we do have a, a few minutes, what, um, what do you think is kind of the most exciting and impactful case that you are, that, that, that you've been looking at uh, with these data? I, I know there's just so many different directions you can go with it, but I'm curious what you think. Mm -hmm. So one of, a couple of interesting observations we had, like it, it deferred during the time. So first, the first interesting observation we had was about that inertia concept that I told you. Like you were seeing that everything is getting worse and worse, but apparently uh, all the metrics with, related to social distancing were being reached a, a plateau. And that was really interesting for us. We were expecting things to get better and better with respect, in, with respect to social distancing, but things were getting saturated very quickly which showed that some part of the population really are not have, do, do have a big uh, inertia towards social distancing. Another aspect that was surprising to us uh, monitoring the metrics were about the fatigue effect that we saw uh, around May. So again, things were getting worse. We were not seeing any sign of positive things in the news, but suddenly we were, for the first time, we were seeing that the metrics after the plateau and saturation are suddenly getting even worse. So maybe pe people got tired of staying home or there were some signals from the reopening signals from the news. Like you were hearing that different states want to reopen. Georgia was the first and then followed by other states. So people were really reacting to the news and even though cases were getting higher and higher, people started practicing less. Then another interesting aspect was with respect to the correlation between travels and cases. So as I showed you, 
we, whether we look into a single uh, outbreak, such as the one at the, Mount, at the Pleasant View nursing home, or whether we, we study cases at county level, we see a huge and significant correlation between travels from out of county and imported cases and the new uh, active cases. So these, these were like interesting observations that we had. Um, and uh, I think some of, some of these, are, these studies are available online on archive. We have like five or six papers with respect to different aspects that are presented today. So if you search my name or our director's name, you can find uh, different aspects of our studies online on archive or med archive. Awesome. So um, Cara has a, a question about the data. If you look in the, in the chat, you'll see, it says, you know, what it, where, where, how, how expensive is all that data? Can, how can others potentially get access to that data? What's, what's, uh, what's the answer to that? Yes, so uh, the, the, one of the benefits that we had in, for being one of the early teams that studied this uh, data was that we were collecting this data for other applications, for our other projects, the projects that we were, we were doing for USDOT, and uh, we were collecting this data anyway. So we thought that now we have the data, we have the expertise, why don't we use it uh, for, to help the public and help the decision makers? I would, and, but the good thing uh, with this COVID uh, outbreak was that many of the data providers realized the importance of their data and realized that they can really be of help to the community. So for instance, SafeGraph, I heard a presentation about their data today. They gave data for free aggregate data. Cubic was another co company that initiated a data for public good they just gave data for free to those who were interested in studying uh, the aspect. Uber Media was another company that just gave some aggregate level data for free. So I would say for the specific case of COVID, there are a lot of companies that as a part of their data for public good programs, they gave data for interested researchers. And I saw a lot of names here that I've, I've previously seen in these initiatives by data providers. So I think the transportation community is using these data sets to large extent. Uh, but like generally the data is, uh, would, be, would be costly. Uh, but for the universities, I, I assume we, we can always get a good discount for, uh, for the research projects. So there are two other really good questions. I am concerned about time though. If you could do a great job of just responding to that and responding to everyone so we can all see your answers in the chat, that would be fantastic. Thank you sure. so much. You're um, so moving along. Um, actually, the, the next, let's see, the next um, I, is Khan uh, Ospe on? I'm here. Awesome. So <laughs> I think you, you are the next presenter. So if you, could, um, if you could share your screen and just introduce yourself, that yeah. would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. We see a picture of you, in, at least I do, in kind of big form. So I'm clicking screen. The Share the screen, share. I think it's shared now. Yeah, now right, it's doing good. it. Okay, good. So I'm trying to, uh, okay. So that's, um, so that's uh, my presentation. My name is Khan Azbe and I'm a professor at um, NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Uh, and these are my um, co-collaborators. Uh, uh, my students, my ex-students, um, so Fan and uh, Jingying, um, they're my current students. Abdullah is my, um, uh, you know, past PhD student working for a company now. Hong is a, uh, Hong Yang uh, is a professor, and Kim Yu Ma is his student. So here I'm going to talk um, mainly about. Uh, so it's, I mean, you heard uh, many of these uh, presentations. Uh, great presentations, surveys, and data. So this is along the same lines, but a little bit more um, focusing on 
a unique uh, problem uh, with some uh, introduction to what we are doing in response to COVID-19. So being um, in New York City, uh, one of the first places, um, uh, probably the, after Seattle is the second uh, big city in the US that was hit by uh, COVID, uh, we uh, thought of working on um, you know, collecting data, understanding what's happening uh, from the mobility perspective. Um, and, and basically we were also uh, thinking of understanding social distancing uh, and how we can capture that. Um, because in New York, unlike many places, uh, there is a, um, uh, a large pedestrian uh, population. Uh, it has the largest, um, uh, you know, subway system uh, in the country. So there's a lot of interaction. So we really would like to understand uh, what um, the social distancing do, how it can be um, enforced. And if you see on the right side, um, people actually, um, you know, reduce their transit usage. Um, uh, they reduce their walking also, but not as much uh, because in New York, actually, you have to walk um, in to do many things, uh, but also they increase driving, so people started to drive. So we just wanted to understand uh, uh, some of these things, uh, but with a focus on uh, social distancing. So this is, again, one of these uh, uh, several efforts that uh, the transportation community uh, is making. Uh, so we built a data dashboard uh, for our center. Uh, C2Smart is a UTC center, uh, and we have uh, partners in the University of Washington, Seattle, University of Texas, El Paso, and Rutgers University. Um, so we, uh, like any other researcher, uh, data hungry, and we, we wanted to get uh, all the data we could get. Here the idea was to have uh, open source data uh, that we could find, put our hands on, uh, and, and uh, also the data that we generate that we can share with other researchers. Uh, I don't wanna name names, but um, uh, you know sometimes we're really optimistic about getting data. Uh, from other um, companies and uh, also commercial places, but it's not that easy. Uh, sometimes even if you're willing to pay for it, it's not easy because they have uh, many agreements and so on. So we wanted to make this data um, that we can find in New York, in Seattle, uh, and so on available and also um, uh, easy for people to, to look at it and access. Um, so this is uh, basically the interactive uh, dashboard. You can go and uh, download the data, look at the data, especially if you understand things in Seattle and New York. Uh, New York luckily has a lot, of, a lot more publicly available data than the cities at least that we are dealing with. Um, and, and we are making a lot of that available in this unified um, uh, dashboard. Okay, uh, so these are the type of uh, data that we're looking at. And we're looking at tra transit ridership, which is quite important for uh, New York City. Uh, we're looking at the speeds. Uh, we're looking at the camera uh, violations, uh, vehicular volumes, crashes, bike counts. Uh, and the social distancing data is data that, that I'm gonna talk more about, uh, is what, what, what we're generating uh, using um, some of the work that some of my very smart students are doing. Uh, we also have access to wave motion data uh, from a very limited number of stations in New York City. Uh, and now actually we are also um, uh, working on getting more wave motion data from the New Jersey side. Uh, New Jersey has around 80 wave motion stations all over the um, network and our uh, Rutgers partner uh, has been working on that. But on the New York side, we have now uh, two locations where we get wave motion data. This is basically truck data, and it gives us an idea uh, about um, the freight uh, and, and also the, the, the truck, vo truck volumes, also truck weights, uh, so that we understand how many empty trucks are there, how many fully loaded trucks are there, and so on, uh, and, 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 and like. So, uh, so for um, the whole data, uh, uh, you know, system can be uh, kind of uh, imagined like this. I mean, we have real time and offline, uh, both data acquisition. Uh, we have a server that we're running, uh, and then we are basically creating a data uh, a warehouse, uh, and then we uh, basically get the data um, uh, processed if it's needed to be processed. Uh, we are also getting um, 
some analytics running on top of it for mobility and uh, sociability uh, uh, metrics. Uh, and then we are also letting people use this data uh, for research and experimental uh, uh, simulations. Uh, and, and again, all of the data we have in the dashboard is publicly available and can be downloaded. Uh, so one of the challenges in all these uh, data sets that we're dealing with is uh, the social distancing data. Uh, so these are some uh, pictures. Uh, uh, the, the one on the right bottom uh, is that uh, at the top of the uh, pandemic, people went to see uh, the, uh, the hospital ship that came to New York City. Uh, and, and as you see, there's no social distancing. Uh, and even when the pandemic was at its, its height, uh, people were out uh, because they had, as I said, they had to walk places, they had to uh, uh, go to uh, shop and they have to walk. So it's it just um, important to understand uh, when the government um, asks people not to get too close and then to not to um, interact too much with each other, how that does that work? Um, here we are uh, focusing on the surface street. Uh, the same kind of thing can be done inside the subway or train station uh, or even uh, inside the uh, 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 train car. Uh, so basically, we are uh, we, we uh, decided to use a, a video processing algorithm, which is based on deep learning. Uh, so we are basically detecting uh, different kind of uh, objects. In this case, pedestrians, cars, trucks, and cyclists. Uh, we are uh, uh, projecting the distance. It's kind of an approximation, and then we are generating some social distancing metrics. Um, so this is uh, basically uh, the framework for the uh, social uh, distancing work. Uh, so one of the innovative parts of this work is that we are tapping into New York City traffic cameras. New York City has around 600 cameras. Uh, there's no way for us to tap into all 600 cameras, so we chose 100 of them. Um, interestingly, we looked at other cities, but uh, most of the cities have their traffic cameras uh, on freeways. Uh, obviously, there are no few people on, on freeways, so it was not very useful. Uh, so, uh, but New York, um, uh, most of the cameras are on, uh, on, on um, you know, arterials, on streets where people walk, so you can really get very useful information. Uh, I think for Seattle, one of our partner, partners, I think one, we have one or two cameras uh, that we identified. Uh, so we get this data uh, uh, publicly available traffic video camera stored uh, in our uh, um, uh, server. Uh, and then we uh, use the uh, post-processing and, and um, you know, um, the deep uh, neural network uh, to identify objects. And then we uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, determine the pedestrian density, uh, social distancing patterns, and so on. Uh, so these are like how the cameras basically uh, look like they're all different. They have challenges. Uh, some places the view is not as good as other places. Uh, so some places uh, there's obstruction because there are trees uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, one of the good things about uh, uh, what we have been doing now, the, there's not much traffic. So there's not much obstruction of the sidewalks, for example, during the normal times, uh, there are trucks, there are uh, big vehicles parked on the side. So you might not be able to see all the pedestrians, for example, because we're interested in pedestrians and so on. Uh, so in this case, actually the, the view is, is much better. But as I said, every camera is different. Uh, the vintage point is different, uh, the height is different. So uh, this is quite challenging to get this information directly from traffic cameras. Uh, I know some of our colleagues uh, uh, wanted to get this kind of data uh, information and they actually were funded by NSF, for example, uh, to ask uh, students with cameras to go out and record or uh, you know uh, have like a variable cameras, but it's very limited. In this case, we can uh, really record 24 uh, seven. Of course, at night, you can only get the headlights, but at least we can get many, many hours of traffic where we can uh, really see everything that's going on. Um, in winter, the days will be shorter, so it will be darker. Uh, but, but compared to having real people uh, going out and uh, video recording uh, and then exposing themselves to also uh, COVID and so on, uh, this is much more uh, practical. 
So this is the overall framework. Uh, I'm not gonna go over this, but the main part is uh, basically the, the post-processing part. Uh, and then we try, so that's one of the things, I mean, for us transportation engineers, uh, this is uh, very interesting. I've been working on uh, image recognition uh, for, for safety projects uh, dating back like 10 years ago. Uh, and, and, you know, last four or five years, uh, I'm the field of image recognition, um, you know, grew so much and, and, and there's so much uh, more capability to do that uh, without having to be a, 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 an electrical engineer uh, and so on. So there's a lot of tools that you could do that. Uh, so we tried different tools. So the graph that you see on the, on the right side is basically how we decide different um, methods like YOLO tree, retina net, mask, RCNN, and there's many of them work better. Uh, and then, and then when, uh, and they all are different for different types of cameras, different kind of uh, images. And then we've been uh, able to test them uh, for some of the cameras. As I said, we are uh, recording hundred cameras, uh, and uh, until now we've been able to really work very close with eleven, where the most interesting locations in New York City. But the idea is to basically do all hundred uh, one when we have time. So let me just uh, move. So I'm one of the uh, uh, contributions that we have here because the cameras are high up and the people are small compared to the, to the overall environment. Uh, we can do an approximation of the people's height in terms of pixel, number of pixels. So, so this way we can put, uh, we don't have to really identify each person separately. Uh, we can put them in a, in a cube of interest uh, that is a simple, uh, the same size. And if they fit in that cube, then, then we know that it's a person. Uh, and then we do this kind of approximation to basically uh, capture people uh, and, and different other objects. So for different objects, we have different kind of cubes, basically. Uh, so this is um, uh, some preliminary results. Uh, so on the left top side, you see uh, uh, the uh, temporal distribution of pedestrians at only one location. So beginning of COVID, it was very low, the, the, the lowest uh, um, uh, graph. And then uh, the green one, the, the, the black one, uh, the highest one is the normal time. Uh, the green one is, is more recent, uh, around June. So you see that uh, the number of people, pedestrians out in the street is becoming more and more. If you look at the, the one next one, the box plot, uh, you see that the, uh, uh, the average uh, number of pedestrians are, are um, different actually. There's some locations where there are a lot more uh, pedestrians than compared to others. Uh, for example, if you go to other boroughs like Queens and Bronx, uh, there, there's less people walking. When you come to Manhattan, you see more people. And if you look at these bubbles, basically, uh, it's a little bit difficult to explain this. So basically the, the size of the bubble, the size of um, the number of uh, social in, uh, um, uh, people uh, being too close, basically. Uh, and then we have different thresholds, like 12 feet, 6 feet, and uh, 3 feet. Uh, and then the numbers inside the bubble is uh, the number of uh, infections uh, that are detected during that time. So basically, uh, there's no, obviously you cannot do a correlation between uh, the, the uh, social distancing that we, uh, violations that we detect versus um, number of uh, cases for the same time because there's a time lag. Uh, but one way of look at this is that uh, you see the small bubbles and then you see high number of infections. So people, uh, and this is my interpretation, I mean, there's much, much more that can be done with this. Uh, when there's more infections, that means there's more uh, uh, danger. Uh, people tend to have less uh, violations of uh, social distancing, and you go uh, like a bigger bubbles, uh, you have uh, uh, more violations, uh, but you have less cases, so people become uh, less careful. So this is just one way of looking at this. Uh, there are obviously the other reasons because of government and uh, different phases of opening and so on. So, but that's uh, the beauty of that. We have the data, and then you can look at this data uh, uh, different ways. Uh, another way of looking at this data, basically, uh, again, we can uh, do the hotspots for uh, social distance violation or number of pedestrians. And then here you see uh, most of them occur on the sidewalks close to the traffic signals, uh, not so much on uh, the, the crossings. Uh, but you can actually do that for different intersections, different times, and you can see where the violations uh, are occurring. Uh, 
uh, this is a, a video of how the, the, the uh, software, uh, the, the program that we develop works. Basically, you can continuously track uh, every object and then calculate the distance between uh, these objects. Uh, so if you want, uh, uh, like a traffic engineer like me, uh, you can actually uh, do something to reduce the, the congestion or, or reduce the number of social distancing violations, uh, even in real time, if you want to do that. But uh, real time obviously is too ambitious. Uh, the uh, more uh, attractive thing would be, for example, you learn about social distancing violations today, and then tomorrow you can improve your enforcement or uh, you can improve your uh, social media messaging and tell people, look uh, at these locations, be careful because there's a lot of uh, uh, social uh, uh, distancing violations. Again, uh, imagine you can also do that in a uh, subway station, tra train station, or even a train car. Uh, so this is, uh, oh, I think, almost my last slide. Uh, so, but of course, it's not perfect because we are using uh, training sets that are genetic training sets. So we had two undergraduate students uh, working whole summer uh, developing uh, some kind of a um, kind of a manual um, a tool uh, for us to go and look what is the prediction and what actually is observed, really, and then basically label objects. Uh, test our uh, deep learning algorithm and then see how we can improve that. So this is basically something that we have developed in-house and we're going to continue to do that uh, with undergraduate students from computer science uh, and actually we saw that we can really improve uh, the detection rates and the accuracy of detection uh, by just improving our labeled data set and, and label. All right, so with that I'm going to stop and see if there are any uh, questions. Wow, thank you. That is so cool um, to see that that you can, yeah, I mean, I'm actually interested, not, I've been doing some research, not COVID related, but about pedestrians and pedestrian safety and pedestrian kind of counting. And, and I, I have never seen anything quite, quite like that. That is really neat. Um, we are getting low on time. So let's see, there are a couple of questions in the chat, but I'm gonna ask you, as I've done for a couple other presenters, to try to answer them, respond to everyone so we can all see your answers, but if you could respond to them in the chat, that would be great, because I'm concerned about having enough time for our last two presenters, which I think we already don't quite have enough time. We're gonna be going over. Sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry for talking too much. <laughs> so your stuff is, I mean, all this stuff is so fascinating. So. Um, uh, yeah, so if you could do that, that would be great. And I'll introduce the next presenter. Um, so the next presenter is Ming Li, who is a postdoctoral associate for in, in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Florida International University. Um, also, very interestingly, is a medical doctor and looking for a hospital resident position in internal medicine. And so Ming is going to be talking to us I think somewhat about how health and, and transport kind of interact. So Ming, can you take it away? Okay. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Can you all see my uh, slides? COVID-19 distance yeah. learning? Yeah, we can. Yeah. So uh, I just recently graduated from medical school last year. So if it were up to me, I would rather be uh, taking care of patients in the hospital. But uh, but that's not up to me. So now I'm doing something which is the second best, which is looking at COVID-19 data. Uh, so I'll talk about what we found uh, in a survey that was conducted in South Florida in approximately May. So we tried to find out how people commute to walk to school and also shopping. All right. And not only look at what has changed during the pandemic, also what's the implication for the future. By that, I mean, we asked the respondent, uh, based on their experience now, how would they do to change uh, what they were doing uh, in the future? Okay. Uh, so this is, a, as I mentioned, this is an online survey that we did in May. 
and and it was administered to the Kochi, uh, you know, this online survey uh, website, and we target adults, uh, eighteen years or older, in South Florida, in the three biggest county with the highest population of all Florida, which is Miami, Broward County, and Palm Beach County, and uh, we we implemented the survey based on the uh, American Community Survey uh, population breakdown in terms of gender, age, income, ethnicity. Uh, I'll have a table to show you the breakdown uh, next. And then we, uh, as I mentioned, we did this in two weeks in, in, in May. Uh, this is, survey was done just right before the state of Florida uh, reopened. So what we captured were, uh, were, were, were all purely pandemic situation where travel were banned and all the restriction order was still on. Okay. And we ended up getting 1,028 valid samples. And as I mentioned, we look at respondents commute to work, to school, and also shopping behavior. We look at, we also ask them what they prefer doing based on their experience now. Okay, so this is a table that's showing the population breakdown uh, compared to the national, the state of Florida, and the three counties that, that is in our sample, Miami-Dade County, Broward County, and Palm Beach County, and then uh, Southeast Florida is uh, is a combination of these three counties. So the last column is our survey uh, proportion of all the different population group. So you can see that uh, we did the best we could to match our uh, proportion of our sample with the population proportion in South Florida. Okay, so that's how we sample. Then uh, for the online learning uh, questions, we basically have two parts. One is we ask the student themselves, and these are 18 years and older. So they are either in college, pursuing a college degree or associate degree, uh, or they were people who take in online classes for other purposes. Okay, so the first part is about this 18 plus adult uh, distance learning experience. The second part is about parents' experience regarding their children's online learning experience. So the first part, on uh, 18 plus older students, we have 241 full-time students, 122 part-time students, and so it's almost two to one, okay? And then the first question we asked them, uh, before COVID pandemic, have you ever taken online classes as a student? And, uh, and we see this are the breakdown that we get. And we also see that uh, the millennials and the Generation S, so millennials, those that are aged about 22 to 30 something, and then generation Z is one generation below. So these two generations are those that currently uh, either pursuing a degree or, or register in a, in a degree program. So these two generations are, are uh, many of them already engaged in online classes. Okay, so that's what we found. Uh, next question we asked them, how were your classes affected by COVID-19? Okay, and, uh, and I was teaching a class at the time myself. So I remember it was in March, uh, the university I work for here in Miami, uh, closed the campus and all, every single class offer at the time went online. Okay, so uh, so you can see that's what the response we get. All my class will move online, or uh, for those that 
or not available as online uh, modality uh, or cancel. So this is what we uh, what we observe and what the respondent told us. All right, and then the third question is regarding how do they compare their online learning experience with the class they were which is the traditional delivery in class delivery. Uh, how do they compare uh, the online experience with the traditional in class delivery? So those uh, bars in blue rated uh, online experience are better, and this is obviously a minority, only about 17%. Uh, in light green, so are rated online experience about the same as traditional. So the, the longest bars are those that rate the online experience as worse than the traditional class. And then I can myself, I should, uh, I should see where this response came from. In March, when all instructors were all of a sudden uh, notified that they had to deliver everything online, uh, not only the student won't prepare, even the instructors won't prepare. So obviously a lot of technology for remote learning, uh, the instructor was still learning how to incorporate that in the online classroom. So, so no wonder we can see this is what the respondent told us. Uh, this first experiment won't as uh, won't as favorable according to their opinion, okay? And then we try to look at what kind of people would favor or disfavor online classes. And then we happen to see, interestingly, those that has a current education status of less than high school and with a doctoral degree happen to be those that uh, favor the online delivery. Those that are actually engaged in the degree program as associates, some college or high school graduate. These are the students who had in degree program, they're used to the classroom delivery, but suddenly thrust into learning everything online. So they display the most, uh, they, they disfavor the most and also look at income. Income actually reflect the same uh, pattern as education. Those with low to medium income are those that currently engage in degree program. So those are the ones that are not satisfied with online class. Then we ask them to compare, how do they compare their productivity now than before. And uh, this pattern reflected similar to their comparison with in-class uh, in class delivery. So a uh, majority thought that they, they didn't produce as much as they would like. And for the same reason, uh, not only the student won't prepare, the instructors will not honestly prepare. Then we ask them, what are the reasons that negatively impacted your productivity and uh, during the online learning sessions? And then uh, uh, the, the highest proportion of, of uh, people answer that there are more distractions at home. And, uh, uh, I, I believe this is a similar situation across the U.S. Uh, college class went online during the pandemic, but high school and elementary school were mostly canceled. So parents suddenly have their kids at home 24 hours a day, and uh, they, they, they just had to uh, take care of their kids and try to learn at the same time. So this is the biggest reason or biggest negative factors affecting uh, students' learning. 
And then also, Tzifichotzi uh, Chaminichi's professor, Tzifichotzi Chaminichi was all a student, also a big reason. Okay. And what favor, fat, favorite factors uh, affecting their productivity? And uh, people indicated uh, it's more comfortable at home, more flexibility in scheduling. Also, there's no commute involved. All right. Uh, as for the future outlook for online learning, uh, so, uh, to summarize this figure, uh, we actually see uh, the probably going, uh, if, if this respondent do what they tell us they would do, then we can expect in the future there will be some increase in student taking online classes than before the pandemic. Of course, it will not be match the, the pandemic level, which is uh, exclusive online classes. But uh, according to the respondent, they told us there will be an increase. More people indicate they, they will increase more than before the pandemic. Okay. Next, we look at children's online education. So the people who answer these questions are the parents. So, and then most of this, because the the formal school, like high school class, uh, elementary school class, were all canceled. No problem. Do you want any eyes? Um, okay, just one more. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so most of this class were, were, uh, were extracurriculum activity some after-school classes that parents arrange the children to attend. And uh, so we, you can think of soccer practice. And uh, so, uh, so not different from the adult classes. And uh, children, okay. Uh, so uh, I was just saying that children's activity is different from adults is that uh, children's activity, many of those involved groups such as soccer practice or cancel. So uh, so that's what we see. And uh, so then parents at that time had had a decision to make. Uh, do I want to, now the activity has been moved online, do I want to continue to keep my children in 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 this activity, or do I remove them? And then so we see that thirty eight percent chose to to keep their kids assigned in, and 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 then uh, there are other parents has other thoughts. All right, and uh, the reason why uh, some parents remove their uh, children, uh, the biggest reason obviously is that those activities were not suited for online uh, delivery. And uh, so, me, sorry to interrupt, but we're really kind of over time. Are you almost done? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so this is probably most important. So, we see that the factor that determine the favorability of parents' children online activities. Do the children get a quality uh, education from the activity? How do they produce? How much do they produce? And how effective is the TV? And then the cost and convenience or other factors. All right, so I can just summarize all that we have found. Uh, the exclusive online delivery uh, is actually not preferred by college students and those that actually engage in degree program. Okay, but somehow after this disruption, we can actually see perhaps a small amount of increase based on the respondents' uh, preference indicated after the survey. 
and similar pattern observed for children's learning activity. And then uh, parents care about the quality, productivity, effectiveness of the online classes. And we can also expect some online learning activity increase for children. So the impact of this interpretation is that somehow we might see a small amount of decrease in terms of commute for school uh, from adults and also for children's activity. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry about the disruption during the presentation. Thanks so much, Ming. Um, really appreciate your work. This is the first presentation we've had on mm -hmm. online learning, which is something that I think a lot of us are particularly interested in since a lot of us are involved in education. Mm -hmm. But in the interest of time, I know, so a couple of things. One, we're going to have to go over, unfortunately. Hopefully, um, we'll be able to end, you know, at about, well, uh, I'm, for me, it'll be like 2.10 or 2.15 or so. Um, rather than two o'clock, so a few minutes past the hour. So without further ado, Ming, if there are any, right now there aren't any questions in the chat for you that I can see, but if there, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat for Ming so we can all see them and he can respond, um, you know, by typing. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our last presenter, Dr. Taha Rashidi, who I am very much looking forward to this presentation on housing preferences and travel behavior, so impacts of COVID on those things. So Taha, please take it away. Good morning, everyone. It's very early morning in Sydney. Uh, my name is Taha Rashidi, and I want to present the results of the survey that we conducted uh, this year during the lockdown in Sydney area. And this is a joint work by myself and my colleague Ali Ardashiri. In, in Australia, like many other cities around the world, uh, we experienced some major impacts in the lifestyle of people due to, due to some lockdowns that happened were introduced by the government in, starting in March 2020. And uh, we've had some major changes in the lifestyle of people. As a result, we started this, uh, uh, studying uh, the impact of the lockdown on the behavior and preferences of people specifically with regard to their home location and the type of dwelling that they are residing in. So the aim of the survey and this is study and the modeling followed this survey was to measure the uh, changes in preferences of people. The survey that we conducted uh, happened in June, uh, mid-June 2020, and we studied, in, we included around 1,000 individuals distributed around Australia in major, uh, major metropolitan areas, specifically Sydney, New South Wales, and also Melbourne in Victoria, as well as Brisbane in Queensland. The distribution of this uh, sample was uh, to some extent reflecting, uh, representing the population with some exceptions, specifically younger male uh, adults and also uh, female adults between 25 to 34 years old. Uh, and we see that uh, it was closely following the pattern, the distribution of age distribution of people in the population with some exceptions specifically for uh, mid-age uh, cohorts. And we had good represent, uh, representation of uh, heads of households in the survey. And also, we had uh, a good sample of households having seniors in them who might be concerned about their dwelling preferences. So th these two figures show the differences between preferences of people before and after COVID. The left, uh, the left figure shows uh, the preferences of uh, the dwelling types people uh, were uh, residing in before COVID and the preferences of people uh, for the type that they like to live in after during lockdown and also after COVID. Uh, the first takeaway message from this 
this uh, from this uh, comparing the preference of people with the actual uh, residents of them is that generally people uh, have a slightly less preference with regard to houses and a good in uh, uh, a good preference and uh, preference with regard to units and apartments, specifically uh, reduction in the number of uh, small units and an increase, uh, a major increase in preference to reside in smaller houses. And the trade-off here is that uh, people prefer less number of uh, uh, prefer to uh, less number of people prefer to be in uh, huge houses, and at the same time, uh, more people uh, revealed uh, preference and uh, likelihood of residing in uh, larger apartments. In the survey, in the current situation that we studied, uh, studied. Uh, this sample, uh, only 10% of people had limited access to private open space and the majority of people were uh, more or less satisfied with the current situation that they had. But as I said, uh, the main trade-off was people who were residing in larger houses and those people were, uh, had uh, showed, ref uh, revealed some preference to move to larger apartments. And in, this, in, uh, in another part of the survey, we ask people how much uh, COVID restrictions, uh, the restrictions that were present, uh, proposed by the government have affected their daily activities. And as you can see, the majority of people reported that their shopping uh, for essential and non-essential uh, goods uh, have been affected and going outside, recreational activity and other types of activities uh, that uh, were uh, happening mainly outside were significantly affected by the restrictions that uh, were, Im uh, were uh, imposed during the lockdown. Outdoor activities and activities required people to go outside uh, were also significantly affected where 76% of people uh, had outdoor activities at least once a week. So uh, people, uh, people uh, said uh, during COVID, uh, only 3.6% of people said that they never left their home and 63% of people reported that they had some out, uh, outdoor activities at least once a week. And the restrictions uh, also affected the uh, affected the uh, social contacts of people like uh, socializing, non-essential shops and good businesses and closure of uh, non-essential shops and businesses also affected uh, people's uh, lifestyle. And uh, in, this, in, in another part of the survey, what we did, we wanted to study the, study the uh, employment status of people. So pre-COVID, people reported uh, that 30% of people had full-time employment and the majority of people were working uh, at offices and only one-tenth, uh, only 10% of people reported that they were ho working from home and although they had good flexible schedules, but the majority of people were working from, uh, were not working from home. After the uh, after the restrictions were introduced and COVID started to uh, distribute uh, distribute in Australia, thirty percent of people said that their status was affected, their employment status was was affected, whether they lost their job or a reduction in salary and so on. Sixty percent of people they said that uh, they reported that their job condition has changed in some way. For example, they lost some flexibility or uh, they became more flexible, their workload was uh, affected and so on. And at the same time, we also ask people to character, uh, characterize themselves, whether they fall into essential workers, for example, uh, healthcare workers, uh, people working in transport system, police officers. We defined because New South Wales, and uh, specifically uh, New South Wales, uh, but in general, Australia, they uh, provided definition of essential uh, workers, and we provided those definitions, and we ask people whether 
they categorize themselves uh, into these uh, into these uh, types of jobs, and almost forty percent of people cat categorize themselves uh, into the. Uh, so we had a very high representative of people who were still active, and their job was uh, kind of essential. And uh, it was interesting that one third of people they said that they keep working the same way that they're working in, during uh, during the lockdown. And in another part of the survey, we asked people whether uh, about their travel behavior and their preferences with regard to mobility options that they had. Specifically, it was interesting to uh, in interesting to see that people became very sensitive about the hygiene on public transport, and about 50% of people that were uh, interviewed. They reported that uh, they have decreased number of times that they even use their own car. Shopping activities uh, were also uh, studied in the in the survey, and specifically, uh, what we've observed was that 17% of people increase uh, their frequent shopping uh, activity routines. Uh, sorry, they increase in less frequent shopping shopping activity routine. So they go, they do shopping less frequently. In other in other words, uh, three point six percent increase their uh, online shopping uh, activities. And at the same time, people have started because they are less frequently uh, shopping. They start to stocking some items. And in the word chart here, the uh, word map here, you see that the uh, the type of products that people are stocking are limited to cans uh, like flour, sanitizer, paper towel, and uh, toilet paper, and also the type of uh, food that they can store. And uh, in general, almost 26% 20, of people reported that their basket has changed, a shopping basket. In another part of uh, the survey, when we wanted to develop more understanding about other aspects of lifestyle of people, we studied their uh, their active uh, uh, activities and exercise behavior of people. In general, when we look at the uh, percentage of people who were uh, doing exercises at home, we see that it's uh, there is a major uh, major increase in number of uh, in the percentage of people who are uh, who are uh, doing exercise at home, and at the same time a major decline in doing exercise or uh, exercising in uh, at out uh, indoor facilities and same more or less same pattern is also observed with regard to outdoor activities with an exception that people who are still doing exercise for more than two hours and for a long period of time the uh, number of those types uh, uh, number of those types of people ha has increased in, uh, as we as we uh, as we see in the results of these 1000 Australians activity engagements is also affected by uh, covid and generally what we uh, what we observed in our survey was that uh, recreational activities discretionary activities were significantly affected and at the same time we see that the schooling and childcare has not been uh, significantly affected and work productivity at the same time has not been affected uh, because people uh, shifted their uh, the routine of their work activities possibly working from home and in another part of the survey we studied this uh, satisfaction of people general satisfaction of people with different aspects of life and as you can see generally people reported that they're still happy and satisfied with their lifestyle 7.3 was the rating that we got from these 1,000 individuals. But it's very interesting to note that 
people are not that much satisfied when we when it comes to the neighborhood they're living in their health condition feeling part of the society due to uh, social distancing possibly the safety that people uh, uh, feel during COVID and their financial situation was significantly affected and their satisfaction was affected by the situation and the restrictions that were imposed during COVID However, at the same time, people were more or less happy with the country that they're living in. Their relationship uh, seems to be also still not as much affected, although we have 20% 20, uh, 20 of the respondents uh, reporting that they had some concerns and dissatisfied with the with their uh, relationship that they had within their household and even the state and city that they're living in, they're more or less satisfied with, uh, with those types of situations. At the last part of the survey, what we did, we designed a discrete choice uh, experiment. And so far, I just provided some descriptive analysis of, of some, uh, some lifestyle related attributes of people with some focus on mobility and uh, residential and housing preferences of people. But in this part, we wanted to further quantify the types of uh, governments, uh, government uh, restrictions that might be proposed to people to see whether uh, what uh, which one might be more effective and which one might be more uh, acceptable by people so we designed the uh, experiment by having eight uh, uh, two two unlabeled alternatives eight attributes each of which having one to four levels one is for the risk of getting COVID, which is a continuous variable that varies from zero to one thousand work flexibility the type of employment they were even uh, offered if they can volunteer and work in healthcare in the healthcare system shopping restrictions because shopping was uh, based on what uh, we also uh, already discussed in the survey you've seen that shopping was a major uh, activity that was affected by COVID exercise as I also discussed it was significantly affected by COVID travel restrictions and socializing uh, flexibilities and income reduction in their income using this reduction in income we were able to estimate some willingness to pay and willingness to accept values so this table shows us uh, first of all uh, the first column gives us the score of different uh, regulations that might be uh, proposed by the by governments so as you see, the most critical one was found to be uh, employment and uh, the, the top score belongs to, uh, belongs to uh, people considering working from office, the flexibility about their uh, work location. And uh, the way you can interpret the finding is that we, people are willing to pay around ten thousand dollars, nine thousand dollars Australian dollar actually, to be able to work from office. And please uh, keep in mind that the way that income is estimated is based on the revealed income by people. And it was categorical variable. We used the median of the interval that was uh, reported by people. And uh, it's also important to note that everything is based on reduction in their income. So people are willing to pay uh, $10,000 or $9,300 uh, to work from home, and they are willing to pay $2,000 less to work from home. And having flexible, uh, flexible hours with regard to the start time, they are willing to pay uh, $2,700 and flexibility with regard to exercise, uh, work location flexibility, no travel restriction. We found different levels of willingness to pay uh, preferences for these activities. At the same time, 
people are willing to get paid to accept different regulations. So if their shopping activities are restricted, people are willing to get paid $1,400 to accept this limitation. To the extent, uh, to the extent that if their sh uh, exercise is limited to once per week, they need to get paid. Uh, they uh, they want to receive four thousand uh, dollars to accept this uh, regulation. And if they completely lose their job, on average, for all individuals included in this survey, uh, which is inclusive of people who had casual job, part-time job, or uh, low-level jobs, thirteen thousand dollars on average. Uh, they are uh, uh, they are asking to get paid to accept if they lose their job. So this, uh, I would say, uh, the scores that we've estimated they can be used to predict the uh, predict the willingness to accept or pay of people and the, uh, which uh, indicators with which regulations can can maximize the utility of people uh, to accept different policies that are uh, proposed by different governments and uh, and authorities so this is what I wanted to present thank you very uh, thank you very much and if you have any questions please email me at at rashidi at unsw.edu.au. Well, we'll end the session now since we're really at, at, at time. It's the end of the day or the beginning of the day or whatever. It's the end of a long set of presentations. And um, I just wanted to say that I wanted to thank all the presenters for a great set of sessions today. And uh, remind people that we're going to be starting again tomorrow morning with additional sessions, both the COVID-19 track as well as the two other tracks at the Bridging Transport Researchers Conference. And I hope that you will join us again tomorrow. Yep, tomorrow morning. Says, the first one is just a panel discussion at 9.30 Central, 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific time. So it's just very interesting panel discussion. So see you guys all tomorrow morning. Thank yes. you, Kudos. This was your baby. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Yeah. Have a wonderful next number of hours until we see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Yantel. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.